Section 1 of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 1. Obscurities in the History of His Life and Book. Ramuzio's Statements. With all the intrinsic interest of Marco Polo's book, it may perhaps be doubted if it would have continued to exercise such fascination on many minds through successive generations, were it not for the difficult questions which it suggests. It is a great book of puzzles, whilst our confidence in the man's veracity is such that we feel certain every puzzle has a solution. And such difficulties have not attached merely to the identification of places, the interpretation of outlandish terms, or the illustration of obscure customs, for strange entanglements have perplexed also the chief circumstances of the traveller's life and authorship. The time of the dictation of his book, and of the execution of his last will, have been almost the only undisputed epochs in his biography. The year of his birth has been contested, and the date of his death has not been recorded. The critical occasion of his capture by the Genoese, to which we seem to owe the happy fact that he did not go down mute to the tomb of his fathers, has been made the subject of chronological difficulties. There are, in the various texts of his story, variations hard to account for, the very tongue in which it was written down has furnished a question, solved only in our own age, and in a most unexpected manner. The first person who attempted to gather and string the facts of Marco Polo's personal history was his countryman, the celebrated John Baptist Ramuzio. His essay abounds in what we now know to be errors of detail, but prepared as it was when traditions of the traveller were still rife in Venice, a genuine thread runs through it which could never have been spun in later days, and its presentation seems to me an essential element in any full discourse upon the subject. Ramusio's preface to the book of Marco Polo, which opens the second volume of his famous collection of voyages and travels, and is addressed to his learned friend, Jerome Fracastoro, after referring to some of the most noted geographers of antiquity, proceeds, quote, Of all that I have named, Ptolemy, as the latest, possessed the greatest extent of knowledge. Thus, towards the north, his knowledge carries him beyond the Caspian, and he is aware of its being shut in all round like a lake, a fact which was unknown in the days of Strabo and Pliny, though the Romans were already lords of the world. But though his knowledge extends so far, a tract of fifteen degrees beyond that sea he can describe only as terra incognita, and towards the south he is fain to apply the same character to all beyond the equinoxial. In these unknown regions, as regards the south, the first to make discoveries have been the Portuguese captains of our own age. But as regards the north and northeast, the discoverer was the magnificent master Marco Polo, an honored nobleman of Venice, nearly three hundred years since, as may be read more fully in his own book. And in truth it makes one marvel to consider the immense extent of the journeys made, first by the father and uncle of the sad master Marco, when they proceeded continually towards the east-northeast, all the way to the court of the great Khan and the emperor of the Tartars, and afterwards again by the three of them, when on their return homeward they traversed the eastern and Indian seas. Nor is that all, for one marvels also how the aforesaid gentleman was able to give such an orderly description of all that he had seen, seeing that such an accomplishment was possessed by very few in his day, and he had had a large part of his nurture among those uncultivated Tartars, without any regular training in the art of composition. His book, indeed, owing to the endless errors and inaccuracies that had crept into it, 
had come for many years to be regarded as fabulous, and the opinion prevailed that the names of cities and provinces contained therein were all fictitious and imaginary, without any ground in fact, or were, I might rather say, mere dreams. Howbeit, during the last hundred years, persons acquainted with Persia have begun to recognize the existence of Cathay. The voyages of the Portuguese also towards the northeast, beyond the golden Chersonies, have brought to knowledge many cities and provinces of India, and many islands likewise, with those very names which our author applies to them, and again, on reaching the land of China, they have ascertained from the people of that region, as we are told by Senor John de Barros, a Portuguese gentleman in his geography, that Canton, one of the chief cities of that kingdom, is in thirty and two-thirds of a degree of latitude, with the coast running northeast and southwest, that after a distance of 275 leagues, the said coast turns towards the northwest, and that there are three provinces along the seaboard, Menji, Zentan, and Kinsai, the last of which is the principal city and the king's residence, standing in 46 degrees of latitude. And proceeding yet further, the coast attains to 50 degrees, Seeing then how many particulars are in our day becoming known of that part of the world concerning which Messer Marco has written, I have deemed it reasonable to publish his book with the aid of several copies written, as I judge, more than two hundred years ago, in a perfectly accurate form, and one vastly more faithful than that in which it has been heretofore read. And thus, the world shall not lose the fruit that may be gathered from so much diligence and industry expended upon so honorable a branch of knowledge. End quote. Ramusio, then, after a brief apologetic parallel of the marvels related by Polo with those related by the ancients and by the modern discoverers in the West, such as Columbus and Cortes, proceeds. Quote, and often, in my own mind, comparing the land explorations of these our Venetian gentlemen with the sea explorations of the aforesaid Signor Don Christopher, I have asked myself which of the two were really the more marvelous. And if patriotic prejudice delude me not, methinks good reason might be adduced for setting the land journey above the sea voyage. Consider only what a height of courage was needed to undertake and carry, through so difficult an enterprise, over a route of such desperate length and hardship, whereon it was sometimes necessary to carry food for the supply of men and beast, not for days only, but for months together. Columbus, on the other hand, going by sea, readily carried with him all necessary provision, and after a voyage of some thirty or forty days, was conveyed by the wind whither he desired to go, whilst the Venetians again took a whole year's time to pass all those great deserts and mighty rivers. Indeed, that the difficulty of traveling to Cathay was so much greater than that of reaching the New World, and the route so much longer and more perilous, may be gathered from the fact that, since those gentlemen twice made this journey, no one from Europe has dared to repeat it whereas in the very year following the discovery of the western Indies, many ships immediately retraced the voyage thither, and up to the present day continue to do so, habitually and in countless numbers. Indeed, those regions are now so well known and so thronged by commerce that the traffic between Italy, Spain, and England is not greater. End quote. Ramusio goes on to explain the light regarding the first part or prologue of Marco Polo's book that he had derived from a recent piece of luck which had made him partially acquainted with the geography of Abul Feda, and to make a running commentary on the whole of the preliminary narrative until the final return of the travelers to Venice. Quote, and when they got thither, the same fate befell them as befell Ulysses, who, when he returned after his twenty years' wanderings to his native Ithaca, was recognized by nobody. Thus also those three gentlemen, who had been so many years absent from their native city, were recognized by none of their kinsfolk, who were under the firm belief that they had all been dead for many a year past, as indeed had been reported. 
through the long duration and the hardships of their journeys, and through the many worries and anxieties that they had undergone, they were quite changed in aspect, and had got a certain indescribable smack of the Tartar, both in air and accent, having indeed all but forgotten their Venetian tongue. Their clothes, too, were coarse and shabby, and of a Tartar cut. They proceeded on their arrival to their house in this city, in the confine of St. John Chrysostom, where you may see it to this day. The house, which was in those days a very lofty and handsome palazzo, is now known by the name of the Corte del Milioni, for a reason that I will tell you presently. Going thither, they found it occupied by some of their relatives, and they had the greatest difficulty in making the latter understand who they should be. For these good people, seeing them to be in countenance so unlike what they used to be, and in dress so shabby, flatly refused to believe that they were those very gentlemen of the Ca Polo, whom they had been looking upon for ever so many years as among the dead. So these three gentlemen, this is a story I have often heard when I was a youngster from the illustrious master Gasparo Malpiero, a gentleman of very great age, and a senator of eminent virtue and integrity, whose house was on the canal of Santa Marina, exactly at the corner over the mouth of the Rio di San Giovanni Crisostomo, and just midway among the buildings of the aforesaid Corte del Milioni, and he said he had heard the story from his own father and grandfather, and from other old men among the neighbors. The three gentlemen, I say, devised a scheme by which they should at once bring about their recognition by their relatives, and secure the honorable notice of the whole city. And this was it. They invited a number of their kindred to an entertainment, which they took care to have prepared with great state and splendor in that house of theirs. And when the hour arrived for sitting down to table, they came forth of their chamber, all three clothed in crimson satin, fashioned in long robes reaching to the ground, such as people in those days wore within doors. And when water for the hands had been served, and the guests were set, they took off those robes and put on others of crimson damask, whilst the first suits were by their orders cut up and divided among the servants. Then, after partaking of some of the dishes, they went out again and came back in robes of crimson velvet, and when they had again taken their seats, the second suits were divided as before. When dinner was over, they did the like with the robes of velvet, after they had put on dresses of the ordinary fashion worn by the rest of the company. These proceedings caused much wonder and amazement among the guests. But when the cloth had been drawn, and all the servants had been ordered to retire from the dining hall, Messer Marco, as the youngest of the three, rose from table, and going into another chamber, brought forth the three shabby dresses of coarse stuff which they had worn when they first arrived. Straight away they took sharp knives, and began to rip up some of the seams and welts, and to take out of them jewels of the greatest value in vast quantities, such as rubies, sapphires, carbuncles, diamonds, and emeralds, which had all been stitched up in those dresses, in so artful a fashion that nobody could have suspected the fact. For when they took leave of the great Khan, they had changed all the wealth that he had bestowed upon them into the mass of rubies, emeralds, and other jewels, being well aware of the impossibility of carrying with them so great an amount in gold over a journey of such extreme length and difficulty. Now, this exhibition of such a huge treasure of jewels and precious stones, all tumbled out upon the table, threw the guests into fresh amazement, insomuch that they seemed quite bewildered and dumbfounded. And now they recognized that in spite of all former doubts, these were in truth those honored and worthy gentlemen of the Capolo that they claimed to be, and so all pay them the greatest honor and reverence. And when the story got wind in Venice, straightway the whole city, gentle and simple, flocked to the house to embrace them, and to make much of them, with every conceivable demonstration of affection and respect. On Master Mafio, who was the eldest, they confer the honors of an office that was of great dignity in those days, whilst the young men came daily to visit and converse with the ever-polite and gracious Messer Marco, 
and to ask him questions about Cathay and the great Khan, all which he answered with such kindly courtesy that every man felt himself in a manner his debtor. And as it happened that in the story which he was constantly called on to repeat of the magnificence of the great Khan, he would speak of his revenues as amounting to ten or fifteen millions of gold, and in like manner when recounting other instances of great wealth in those parts, would always make use of the term millions, so they gave him the nickname of Messer Marco Milioni, a thing which I have noted also in the public books of this republic, where mention is made of him. The court of his house, too, at San Giovanni Crisostomo, has always from that time been popularly known as the court of the Milioni. Not many months after the arrival of the travelers at Venice, News came that Lampadoria, captain of the Genoese fleet, had advanced with seventy galleys to the island of Cursola, upon which orders were issued by the prince of the most illustrious signore for the arming of ninety galleys with all the expedition possible, and Master Marco Polo, for his valor, was put in charge of one of these. So he, with the others, under the command of the most illustrious master Andrea Dandolo, procurator of St. Mark's as captain-general, a very brave and worthy gentleman, set out in search of the Genoese fleet. They fought on the September Feast of Our Lady, and, as is the common hazard of war, our fleet was beaten, and Polo was made prisoner. For, having pressed on in the vanguard of the attack, and fighting with high and worthy courage in defense of his country and his kindred, he did not receive due support, and being wounded, he was taken, along with Dandolo, and immediately put in irons and sent to Genoa. When his rare qualities and marvelous travels became known there, the whole city gathered to see him and to speak with him, and he was no longer entreated as a prisoner, but as a dear friend and honored gentleman. Indeed, they showed him such honor and affection, that at all hours of the day he was visited by the noblest gentlemen of the city, and was continually receiving presents of every useful kind. Master Marco, finding himself in this position, and witnessing the general eagerness to hear all about Cathay and the great Khan, which indeed compelled him daily to repeat his story till he was weary, was advised to put the matter in writing. So, having found means to get a letter written to his father here at Venice, in which he desired the latter to send the notes and memoranda which he had brought home with him, after the receipt of these, and assisted by a Genoese gentleman, who was a great friend of his, and who took great delight in learning about the various regions of the world, and used on that account to spend many hours daily in the prison with him, he wrote this present book to please him in the Latin tongue. To this day the Genoese, for the most part, write what they have to write in that language, for there is no possibility of expressing their natural dialect with the pen. Thus, then, it came to pass that the book was put forth at first by Messer Marco in Latin, but as many copies were taken as it was rendered into our vulgar tongue, all Italy becoming filled with it, so much was the story desired and run after. The captivity of Messer Marco greatly disturbed the minds of Messer Maffio and his father, Messer Niccolo. They had decided, while still on their travels, that Marco should marry, as soon as they should get to Venice. But now they found themselves in this unlucky pass, with so much wealth, and nobody to inherit it. Fearing that Marco's imprisonment might endure for many years, or worse still, he might not live to quit it, for many assured them that numbers of Venetian prisoners had been kept in Genoa a score of years before obtaining liberty. Seeing, too, no prospect of being able to ransom him, a thing which they had attempted often and by various channels. They took counsel together and came to the conclusion that Messer Niccolo, who, old as he was, was still hale and vigorous, should take to himself a new wife. This he did, and at the end of four years he found himself the father of three sons, Stefano, Maffio, and Giovanni. Not many years after, Messer Marco aforesaid, through the great favor that he had acquired in the eyes of the first gentleman of Genoa, and indeed of the whole city, was discharged from prison and set free. Returning home, he found that his father had in the meantime had those three other sons. Instead of taking this amiss, wise and discreet man that he was, he agreed also to take a wife of his own. 
He did so accordingly, but he never had any son, only two girls, one called Moreira and the other Fantina. When, at a later date, his father died, like a good and dutiful son, he caused to be erected for him a tomb, a very honorable kind for those days, being a great sarcophagus cut from the solid stone, which to this day may be seen under the portico before the church of San Lorenzo in this city, on the right hand as you enter, with an inscription denoting it to be the tomb of Messer Nicolo Polo of the Contrada of San Giovanni Crisostomo. The arms of his family consist of a bend with three birds on it, and the collars, according to certain books of old histories in which you see all the coats of the gentlemen of the city emblazoned, are the field azzurri, the band argent, and the three birds sable. These last are birds of that kind vulgarly termed pole, or as the Latins call them, gracoli. As regards the after duration of this noble and worthy family, I find that Messer Andrea Polo of San Felice had three sons, the first of whom was Messer Marco, the second Mafio, the third Niccolo. The two last were those who went to Constantinople first, and afterwards to Cathay, as has been seen. Messer Marco, the elder, being dead, the wife of Messer Niccolo, who had been left at home with child, gave birth to a son, to whom she gave the name of Marco, in memory of the deceased, and this is the author of our book. Of the brothers who were born from his father's second marriage, that is, Stephen, John, and Matthew, I do not find that any of them had children, except Matthew. He had five sons and one daughter called Maria, and she, after the death of her brothers without offspring, inherited in 1417 all the property of her father and her brothers. She was honorably married to Messer Azzo Trevisano of the parish of Santo Stasio in this city, and from her sprung the fortunate and honored stock of the illustrious Messer Domenico Trevisano, procurator of St. Mark's, and valorous captain-general of the sea forces of the Republic, whose virtue and singular good qualities are represented with augmentation in the person of the most illustrious prince, Sir Mark Antonio Trevisano, his son. Such has been the history of this noble family of the Capolo, which lasted, as we see, till the year of our redemption 1417, in which year died childless Marco Polo, the last of the five sons of Mafio, and so we came to an end. Such be the chances and changes of human affairs. End, quote. end of section 1of the book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 2. Sketch of the State of the East at the Time of the Journeys of the Polo Family The story of the travels of the Polo family opens in 1260. Christendom had recovered from the alarm into which it had been thrown some eighteen years before when the Tartar cataclysms had threatened to engulf it. The Tartars themselves were already becoming an object of curiosity rather than of fear, and soon became an object of hope, as a possible help against the old Mohammedan foe. The frail Latin throne in Constantinople was still standing, but tottering to its fall. The successors of the Crusaders still held the coast of Syria from Antioch to Jaffa, though a deadlier brood of enemies than they had yet encountered was now coming to maturity in the dynasty of the Mamelukes, which had one foot firmly planted in Cairo, the other in Damascus. The jealousies of the commercial republics of Italy were daily waxing greater. The position of Genoese trade on the coasts of the Aegean was greatly depressed, through the predominance which Venice had acquired there by her part in the expulsion of the Greek emperors, and which won for the Doge the lofty style of lord of three-eighths of the empire of Romania but Genoa was biding her time for an early revenge, and year by year her naval strength and skill were increasing. Both these republics held possessions and establishments in the ports of Syria, 
which were often the scene of sanguinary conflicts between their citizens. Alexandria was still largely frequented in the intervals of war as the great emporium of Indian wares, but the facilities afforded by the Mongol conquerors, who now held the whole tract from the Persian Gulf to the shores of the Caspian and of the Black Sea, or nearly so, were beginning to give a great advantage to the caravan routes which debouched at the ports of Cilician Armenia in the Mediterranean and at Trebizond on the Euxine. Tana, or Azov, had not as yet become the outlet of a similar traffic. The Venetians had apparently frequented to some extent the coast of the Crimea for local trade, but their rivals appear to have been in great measure excluded from this commerce, and the Genoese establishments, which so long flourished on that coast, are first heard of some years after a Greek dynasty was again in possession of Constantinople. In Asia and Eastern Europe, scarcely a dog might bark without Mongol leave, from the borders of Poland and the Gulf of Scanderon to the Amur and the Yellow Sea. The vast empire which Chinggis had conquered still owned a nominally supreme head in the great Khan, but practically it was splitting up into several great monarchies under the descendants of the four sons of Chinggis, Juji, Chaghatai, Okodai, and Tuli, and wars on a vast scale were already brewing between them. Hulaku, third son of Tuli, and brother of two great Khans, Manku and Kublai, had become practically independent as ruler of Persia, Babylonia, Mesopotamia, and Armenia, though he and his sons and his sons' sons continued to stamp the name of the great Khan upon their coins, and to use the Chinese seals of state which he bestowed upon them. The Seljukian sultans of Iconium, whose dominion bore the proud title of Rum, Rome, were now but the struggling bondsmen of the Yukans. The Armenian Haitan in his Cilician kingdom had pledged a more frank allegiance to the Tartar, the enemy of his Moslem enemies. Barca, son of Juji, the first ruling prince of the house of Chinghis to turn Mohammedan, reigned on the steppes of the Volga, where a standing camp, which eventually became a great city under the name of Sarai, had been established by his brother and predecessor Batu. The house of Chaghatai had settled upon the pastures of the Eli and the valley of the Jakartis and ruled the wealthy cities of Sogdiana. Kaidu, the grandson of Okodai, who had been the successor of Chinghis in the Khanship, refused to acknowledge the transfer of the supreme authority to the house of Tuli, and was through the long life of Kublai a thorn in his side, perpetually keeping his northwestern frontier in alarm. His immediate authority was exercised over some part of what we should now call eastern Turkestan and southern central Siberia, whilst his hordes of horsemen, force of character, and close neighborhood brought the Khans of Chaghatai under his influence, and they generally acted in concert with him. The chief throne of the Mongol Empire had just been ascended by Kublai, the most able of its occupants after the founder. Before the death of his brother and predecessor Manku, who died in 1259 before an obscure fortress of western China, it had been intended to remove the seat of government from Kara Koram on the northern verge of the Mongolian desert to the more populous regions that had been conquered in the farther east, and this step, which in the end converted the Mongol Khan into a Chinese emperor, was carried out by Kublai. For about three centuries the northern provinces of China had been detached from native rule and subject to foreign dynasties, first to the Khitan, a people from the basin of the Sungari River, and supposed, but doubtfully, to have been akin to the Tunguses, whose rule subsisted for two hundred years, and originated the name of Kitai, Kata, or Katai, by which, for nearly one thousand years, China has been known to the nations of Inner Asia, and to those whose acquaintance with it was got by that channel. The Kitan, whose dynasty is known in Chinese history as the Liao, or Iron, 
had been displaced in 1123 by the Churches or New Chen, another race of Eastern Tartary, of the same blood as the modern Manchus, whose emperors, in their brief period of prosperity, were known by the Chinese name of Tai Kin, by the Mongol name of the Altun Khans, both signifying golden. Already in the lifetime of Chinghis himself, the northern provinces of China proper, including their capital, known as Chengtu or Yenking, now Peking, had been wrenched from them, and the conquest of the dynasty was completed by Chinghis' successor Okodai in 1234. Southern China still remained in the hands of the native dynasty of the Song, who had their capital at the great city now well known as Hung Chao Fu. Their dominion was still substantially untouched, but its subjugation was a task to which Kublai, before many years, turned his attention, and which became the most prominent event of his reign. In India, the most powerful sovereign was the Sultan of Delhi, Nasir Uddin Mahmud, of the Turkey house of Iltitmish. But though both Sindh and Bengal acknowledged his supremacy, no part of peninsular India had yet been invaded, and throughout the long period of our travelers' residence in the east, the kings of Delhi had their hands too full, owing to the incessant incursions of the Mongols across the Indus, to venture on extensive campaigning in the south. Hence the Dravidian kingdoms of southern India were as yet untouched by foreign conquest, and the accumulated gold of ages lay in their temples and treasuries, an easy prey for the coming invader. In the Indo-Chinese peninsula and the eastern islands, a variety of kingdoms and dynasties were expanding and contracting, of which we have at best but dim and shifting glimpses. That they were advanced in wealth and art, far beyond what the present state of those regions would suggest, is attested by vast and magnificent remains of architecture, nearly all dating, so far as dates can be ascertained, from the twelfth to the fourteenth centuries, that epoch during which an architectural afflatus seems to have descended on the human race, and which are found at intervals over both the Indo-Chinese continent and the islands, as at Pagan in Burma, at Ayutthaya in Siam, at Angkor in Cambodia, at Borobudur and Brambanan in Java. All these remains are deeply marked by Hindu influence, and at the same time by strong peculiarities, both generic and individual. End of section 2 The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 3. The Polo Family, Personal History of the Travelers, Down to Their Final Return from the East. In days when history and genealogy were allowed to draw largely on the imagination for the origines of states and families, it was set down by one Venetian antiquary that among the companions of King Venetus, or of Prince Antenor of Troy, when they settled on the northern shores of the Adriatic, there was one Lucius Polus, who became the progenitor of our traveler's family, whilst another deduces it from Paolo, the first Doge, Paulus Lucas and Hephaestus of Heraclea, A.D. 696. More trustworthy traditions, recorded among the family histories of Venice, but still no more, it is believed, than traditions, represent the family of Polo as having come from Sebenico in Dalmatia in the 11th century. Before the end of the century, they had taken seats in the great council of the Republic, for the name of Domenico Polo is said to be subscribed to a grant of 1094, that of Pietro Polo, to an act of the time of the Doge Domenico Michele in 1122, and that of a Domenico Polo to an acquittance granted by the Doge Domenico Morosini and his council in 1153. 
the ascertained genealogy of the traveller however begins only with his grandfather who lived in the early part of the thirteenth century two branches of the polo family were then recognized distinguished by the confini or parishes in which they lived as polo of san jeremia and polo of san felice andrea polo of san felice was the father of three sons marco nicolo and maffeo and nicolo was the father of our marco till quite recently it had never been precisely ascertained whether the immediate family of our traveller belonged to the nobles of venice properly so called who had seats in the great council and were enrolled in the libro d'oro ramusio indeed styles our marco nobile and magnifico and rusticiano the actual scribe of the traveller's recollections calls him sage noble citoyen de venice but ramusio's accuracy and rusticiano's precision were scarcely to be depended on very recently however since the subject has been discussed with accomplished students of the venice archives proofs have been found establishing marco's personal claim to nobility inasmuch as both in judicial decisions and in official resolutions of the great council he is designated nobilis vir a formula which would never have been used in such documents i am assured had he not been technically noble of the three sons of andrea polo of san felice marco seems to have been the eldest and maffeo the youngest they were all engaged in commerce and apparently in a partnership which to some extent held good even when the two younger had been many years absent in the far east marco seems to have been established for a time at constantinople and also to have had a house no doubt of business at soldaia in the crimea where his son and daughter nicolo and marocca by name were living in twelve eighty this year is the date of the elder marco's will executed at venice and when he was weighed down by bodily ailment whether he survived for any length of time we do not know Niccolo Polo, the second of the brothers, had two legitimate sons, Marco, the author of our book, born in 1254, and Maffeo, of whose place in the family we shall have a few words to say presently. The story opens, as we have said, in 1260, when we find the two brothers, Niccolo and Maffeo the elder, at Constantinople. How long they had been absent from Venice, we are not distinctly told. Niccolo had left his wife there behind him. Maffeo apparently was a bachelor. In the year named, they started on a trading venture to the Crimea, whence a succession of openings and chances, recounted in the introductory chapters of Marco's work, carried them far north along the Volga, and thence first to Bokhara, and then to the court of the great Khan Kublai in the far east, on or within the borders of Cathay. That a great and civilized country so-called existed in the extremity of Asia had already been reported in Europe by the friars Plano Carpini in 1246 and William Rubruqui in 1253, who had not indeed reached its frontiers, but had met with its people at the court of the great Khan in Mongolia, whilst the latter of the two, with characteristic acumen, had seen that they were identical with the series of classic fame. Kublai had never before fallen in with European gentlemen. He was delighted with these Venetians, listened with strong interest to all that they had to tell him of the Latin world, and determined to send them back as his ambassadors to the Pope, accompanied by an officer of his own court. His letters to the Pope, as the Polos represent them, were mainly to desire the dispatch of a large body of educated missionaries to convert his people to Christianity. It is not likely that religious motives influenced Kublai in this, but he probably desired religious aid in softening and civilizing his rude kinsmen of the steppes, and judged, from what he saw in the Venetians, and heard from them, that Europe could afford such aid of a higher quality than the degenerate Oriental Christians with whom he was familiar, or the Tibetan Lamas, on whom his patronage eventually devolved when Rome so deplorably failed to meet his advances. The brothers arrived at Acre, 
in April 1269, and found that no pope existed, for Clement IV was dead the year before, and no new election had taken place. So they went home to Venice to see how things stood there after their absence of so many years. The wife of Niccolo was no longer among the living, but he found his son Marco, a fine lad of fifteen. The best and most authentic manuscripts tell us no more than this, but one class of copies, consisting of the Latin version made by our traveler's contemporary Francesco Pipino, and of the numerous editions based indirectly upon it, represents that Niccolo had left Venice when Marco was as yet unborn, and consequently had never seen him till his return from the east in 1269. We have mentioned that Niccolo Polo had another legitimate son by name Maffio, and him we infer to have been younger than Marco, because he is named last, Marcus et Matteus, in the testament of their uncle Marco the Elder. We do not know if they were by the same mother. They could not have been so if we are right in supposing Maffio to have been the younger, and if Pipino's version of the history be genuine. If, however, we reject the latter, as I incline to do, no ground remains for supposing that Niccolo went to the east much before we found him there, viz. in 1260, and Maffio may have been born of the same mother during the interval between 1254 and 1260. If, on the other hand, Pipino's version be held to, we must suppose that Maffio, who is named by his uncle in 1280, during his father's second absence in the east, was born of a marriage contracted during Niccolo's residence at home after his first journey, a residence which lasted from 1269 to 1271. The papal interregnum was the longest known at least since the Dark Ages. Those two years passed, and yet the cardinals at Viterbo had come to no agreement. The brothers were unwilling to let the great Khan think them faithless, and perhaps they hankered after the virgin field of speculation that they had discovered. So they started again for the east, taking young Mark with them. At Acre they took counsel with an eminent churchman, Tedaldo or Tebaldo Visconti, archdeacon of Liege, whom the book represents to have been legate in Syria, and who in any case was a personage of much gravity and influence. From him they got letters to authenticate the causes of the miscarriage of their mission, and started for the further east. But they were still at the port of Ayas on the Gulf of Scanderoon, which was then becoming one of the chief points of arrival and departure for the inland trade of Asia, when they were overtaken by the news that a pope was at last elected, and that the choice had fallen upon their friend Archdeacon Tedaldo. They immediately returned to Acre, and at last were able to execute the Khan's commission and to obtain a reply. But instead of the hundred able teachers of science and religion whom Kublai is said to have asked for, the new pope, Gregory X, could supply but two Dominicans, and these lost heart and drew back when they had barely taken the first step of the journey. Judging from certain indications, we conceive it probable that the three Venetians, whose second start from Acre took place about November 1271, proceeded by Ayas and Sivas, and then by Mardin, Mosul, and Baghdad, to Hormuz at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, with a view of going on by sea, but that some obstacle arose which compelled them to abandon this project and turn north again from Hormuz. They then traversed successively Kerman and Khorasan, Balkh and Badakhshan, whence they ascended the Panja, or Upper Oxus, to the plateau of Pamir, a route not known to have been since followed by any European traveler except Benedict Goys, till the spirited expedition of Lieutenant John Wood of the Indian Navy in 1838. Crossing the Pamir Highlands, the travelers descended upon Kashgar, whence they proceeded by Yarkan and Khotan, and the vicinity of Lake Lob, and eventually across the great Gobi Desert to Tangut, the name then applied by Mongols and Persians 
to territory at the extreme northwest of China, both within and without the wall. Skirting the northern frontier of China, they at last reached the presence of the Khan, who was at his usual summer retreat at Kaiping Fu, near the base of the Kingan Mountains, and nearly a hundred miles north of the Great Wall at Kalgan. If there be no mistake in the time, three years and a half, ascribed to this journey, in all the existing texts, the travelers did not reach the court till about May of 1275. Kublai received the Venetians with great cordiality, and took kindly to young Mark, who must have been, by this time, one and twenty. The Jeune Bachelor, as the story calls him, applied himself to the acquisition of the languages and written characters in chief use among the multifarious nationalities included in the Khan's court and administration, and Kublai, after a time, seeing his discretion and ability, began to employ him in the public service. M. Pothier has found a record in the Chinese annals of the Mongol dynasty, which states that in the year 1277 a certain Polo was nominated a second-class commissioner or agent attached to the Privy Council, a passage which we are happy to believe to refer to our young traveler. His first mission, apparently, was that which carried him through the provinces of Shanxi, Shenxi, and Sichuan, and the wild country on the east of Tibet, to the remote province of Yunnan, called by the Mongols Karajang, and which had been partially conquered by an army under Kublai himself in 1253, before his accession to the throne. Mark, during his stay at court, had observed the Khan's delight in hearing of strange countries, their marvels, manners, and oddities, and had heard his majesty's frank expressions of disgust at the stupidity of his commissioners when they could speak of nothing but the official business on which they had been sent. Profiting by these observations, he took care to store his memory or his notebooks with all curious facts that were likely to interest Kublai, and related them with vivacity on his return to court. This first journey, which led him through a region which is still very nearly a terra incognita, and in which there existed and still exists, among the deep valleys of the great rivers flowing down from eastern Tibet, and in the rugged mountain ranges bordering Yunnan and Kuei Chow, a vast ethnological garden, as it were, of tribes of various race and in every stage of uncivilization, afforded him an acquaintance with many strange products and eccentric traits of manners, wherewith to delight the emperor. Mark rose rapidly in favor, and often served Kublai again on distant missions, as well as in domestic administration, but we gather few details as to his employments. At one time we know that he held for three years the government of the great city of Yang Chao, though we need not try to magnify this office, as some commentators have done, into the vice-royalty of one of the great provinces of the empire. On another occasion, we find him with his uncle Mafio, passing a year at Ken Chao in Tengut, again, it would appear, visiting Karakoram, the old capital of the Khans in Mongolia. On another occasion, in Champa, or southern Cochin, China, and again, or perhaps as a part of the last expedition, on a mission to the Indian seas, when he appears to have visited several of the southern states of India. We are not informed whether his father and uncle shared in such employments, and the story of their services rendered to the Khan in promoting the capture of the city of Shangyang by the construction of powerful engines of attack, is too much perplexed by the difficulties of chronology to be cited with confidence. Anyhow, they were gathering wealth, and after years of exile, they began to dread what might follow old Kublai's death, and longed to carry their gear and their own gray heads safe home to the lagoons. The aged emperor growled refusal to all their hints, and but for a happy chance we should have lost our medieval Herodotus. Argun Khan of Persia, Kublai's great-nephew, had, in 1286, lost his favorite wife, the Katun Bulugan, 
and mourning her sorely, took steps to fulfill her dying injunction that her place should be filled only by a lady of her own kin, the Mongol tribe of Bayout. Ambassadors were dispatched to the court of Khan Balai to seek such a bride. The message was courteously received, and the choice fell on the lady Kokhachin, a maiden of seventeen, Mutbel Dam e Avena. The overland road from Peking to Tabriz was not only of portentous length for such a tender charge, but was imperiled by war, so the envoys desired to return by sea. Tartars in general were strangers to all navigation, and the envoys, much taken with the Venetians, and eager to profit by their experience, especially as Marco had just then returned from his Indian mission, begged the Khan as a favor to send the three Firingis in their company. He consented with reluctance, but having done so, fitted the party out nobly for the voyage, charging the Polos with friendly messages for the portentates of Europe, including the King of England. They appear to have sailed from the port of Zeitan, as the westerns called Swan Chau, or Chincheo in Fokien, in the beginning of 1292. It was an ill-starred voyage, involving long detentions on the coast of Sumatra and in the south of India, to which, however, we are indebted for some of the best chapters in the book, and two years or upwards passed before they arrived at their destination in Persia. The three hardy Venetians survived all perils, and so did the lady, who had come to look on them with filial regard. But two of the three envoys, and a vast proportion of the suit, had perished by the way. Argun Khan, too, had been dead even before they quitted China. His brother Kaikatu reigned in his stead, and his son Gazan succeeded to the lady's hand. We are told by one who knew both the princes well that Argun was one of the handsomest men of his time, whilst Gazan was among all his host one of the most insignificant in appearance. But in other respects the lady's change was for the better. Gazan had some of the highest qualities of a soldier, a legislator, and a king, adorned by many and varied accomplishments, though his reign was too short for the full development of his fame. The princess, whose enjoyment of her royalty was brief, wept as she took leave of the kindly and noble Venetians. They went on to Tabriz, and after a long halt there, proceeded homewards, reaching Venice, according to all the texts, some time in 1295. We have related Ramusio's interesting tradition, like a bit out of the Arabian Nights, of the reception that the travelers met with from their relations, and of the means that they took to establish their position with those relations, and with Venetian society. Of the relations, Marco the Elder had probably been long dead. Mafio, the brother of our Marco, was alive, and we hear also of a cousin, Consanguineus, Felice Polo, and his wife Fiordelisa, without being able to fix their precise position in the family. We know also that Niccolo, who died before the end of the century, left behind him two legitimate sons, Stefano and Zanino. It is not unlikely that these were born from some connection entered into during the long residence of the Polos in Cathay, though naturally their presence in the traveling company is not commemorated in Marco's prologue. End of section 3of the book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusichello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 4. Digression concerning the mention of the Polo family at Venice. We have seen that Ramusio places the scene of the story recently alluded to at the mansion in the parish of San Giovanni Crisostomo, the court of which was known in his time as the Corte del Milioni, 
and indeed he speaks of the travellers as at once on their arrival resorting to that mansion as their family residence. Ramusio's details have so often proved erroneous that I should not be surprised if this also should be a mistake. At least we find, so far as I can learn, no previous intimation that the family were connected with that locality. The grandfather Andrea is styled of San Felice. The will of Mafio Polo, the younger, made in 1300, which we shall give hereafter in abstract, appears to be the first document that connects the family with San Giovanni Crisostomo. It indeed styles the testator's father, the late Niccolo Paolo, of the confine of St. John Chrysostom, but that only shows what is not disputed, that the travelers, after their return from the east, settled in this locality. And the same will appear to indicate a surviving connection with San Felice, for the priests and clerks who drew it up and witnessed it are all of the church of San Felice, and it is to the parson of San Felice and his successor that Mafio bequeaths an annuity to procure their prayers for the souls of his father, his mother, and himself, though after the successor the annuity is to pass on the same condition to the senior priest of San Giovanni Crisostomo. Marco Polo the Elder is, in his will, described as of San Severo, as is also his sister-in-law Fiordelisa, and the document contains no reference to San Giovanni. On the whole, therefore, it seems probable that the palazzo in the latter parish were purchased by the travellers after their return from the east. The court, which was known in the sixteenth century as the Corte del Milioni, has been generally understood to be that now known as the Corte Sabionera, and here is still pointed out a relic of Marco Polo's mansion. Indeed, it is called now, 1899, Corte del Milione. M. Poutier's edition is embellished with a good engraving which purports to represent the house of Marco Polo, but he has been misled. His engraving, in fact, exhibits, at least as the prominent feature, an embellished representation of a small house which exists on the west side of the Sabionera, and which had, at one time, perhaps, that pointed style of architecture which his engraving shows, though its present decoration is paltry and unreal. But it is on the north side of the court, and on the foundations now occupied by the Malibran theatre, that Venetian tradition and the investigations of Venetian antiquaries concur in indicating the site of the Casa Polo. At the end of the sixteenth century a great fire destroyed the palazzo, and under the inscription of an old mansion ruined from the foundation, it passed into the hands of one Stefano Vecchia, who sold it in 1678 to Giovanni Carlo Grimani. He built on the site of the ruins a theater, which was in its day one of the largest in Italy, and was called the Theater of San Giovanni Crisostomo, afterwards the Teatro Emeronitio, when modernized in our own day, the proprietors gave it the name of Malibran, in honor of that famous singer, and this it still bears. In 1881, the year of the Venice International Geographical Congress, a tablet was put up on the theater with the following inscription. Qui furono le case di Marco Polo, che viaggiò le più lontane regioni dell'Asia e le descrisse, per decreto del comune, 1881. There is still to be seen on the north side of the court an arched doorway, in Italo-Byzantine style, richly sculptured with scrolls, discs, and symbolical animals, and on the wall above the doorway is a cross similarly ornamented. The style and the decorations are those which were usual in Venice in the 13th century. The arch opens into a passage from which a similar doorway at the other end, also retaining some scantier relics of decoration, leads to the entrance of the Malibran theatre. Over the archway, in the Corte Sabionera, the building rises into a kind of tower. This, as well as the sculptured arches and cross, Signor Cassoni, 
who gave a good deal of consideration to the subject, believed to be a relic of the old Polo house. But the tower, which Pothier's view does show, is now entirely modernized. Other remains of Byzantine sculpture, which are probably fragments of the decoration of the same mansion, are found embedded in the walls of neighboring houses. It is impossible to determine anything further as to the form or extent of the house of the time of the Polos, but some slight idea of its appearance about the year 1500 may be seen in the extract which we give from the famous pictorial map of Venice, attributed erroneously to Albert Dürer. The state of the buildings in the last century is shown in figure B, an extract from the fine map of Ugi, and their present condition is one reduced from the modern official map of the municipality. Coming from the church of San Giovanni Crisostomo to enter the Calle del Teatro on the left and the passage Soto Portico leading to the Corte del Milione, one has in front of him a building with a door of the epoch of the Renaissance. It was the office of the Proveditori of Silk. On the architrave are engraved the words, Provisoris Serici, and below, above the door, is the tablet which, in the year 1827, the Abbate Zenier caused to be put up with this inscription, Aides proxima, taliae cultui modo addicta, marcipolo itinerum fama praeclari, iam habitatio fuit. I believe that, of late years, some doubts have been thrown on the tradition of the site indicated as that of the Casa Polo, though I am not aware of the grounds of such doubts. But a document recently discovered at Venice by Commander Barossi, one of a series relating to the testamentary estate of Marco Polo, goes far to confirm the tradition. This is the copy of a technical definition of two pieces of house property adjoining the property of Marco Polo and his brother Stephen, which were sold to Marco Polo by his wife Donata in June 1321. Though the definition is not decisive, from the rarity of topographical references and absence of points of the compass. The description of Donata's tenement as standing on the Rio, presumably that of San Giovanni Crisostomo, on one side, opening like certain porticos and stairs on the other to the court and common alley leading to the church of San Giovanni Crisostomo, and abutting in two places on the Capolo, the property of her husband and Stefano, will apply perfectly to a building occupying the western portion of the area on which now stands the theater, and perhaps forming the western side of a court of which Casa Polo formed the other three sides. We know nothing more of Polo, till we find him appearing a year or two later, in rapid succession, as the captain of a Venetian galley, as a prisoner of war, and as an author. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices Part 5 Digression Concerning the War Galleys of the Mediterranean States in the Middle Ages And before entering on this new phase of the traveler's biography, it may not be without interest that we say something regarding the equipment of those galleys which are so prominent in the medieval history of the Mediterranean. Eschewing that Serbonian bog, where armies whole have sunk, of books and commentators, the theory of classification of the biremes and triremes of the ancients, we can at least assert on secure grounds that in medieval armament, up to this middle of the sixteenth century or thereabouts, the characteristic distinction of galleys of different calibers, so far as such differences existed, was based on the number of rowers that sat on one bench pulling each his separate oar, but through one portella or rowlock port. 
and to the classes of galleys so distinguished the italians of the later middle age at least did certainly apply rightly or wrongly the classical terms of bireme trireme and quinquireme in the sense of galleys having two men and two oars to a bench three men and three oars to a bench and five men and five oars to a bench that this was the medieval arrangement is very certain from the details afforded by marino sanudo the elder confirmed by later writers and by works of art previous to 1290 sanudo tells us almost all the galleys that went to the levant had but two oars and men to a bench but as it had been found that three oars and men to a bench could be employed with great advantage after that date nearly all galleries adopted this arrangement which was called ai tasoroli moreover experiments made by the venetians in 1316 had shown that four rowers to a bench could be employed still more advantageously and where the galleys could be used on inland waters and could be made more bulky sanudo would even recommend five to a bench or have gangs of rowers on two decks with either three or four men to the bench on each deck this system of grouping oars and putting only one man to an oar continued down to the sixteenth century during the first half of which came in the more modern system of using great oars, equally spaced, and requiring from four to seven men each to ply them, in the manner which endured till late in the last century when galleys became altogether obsolete. Captain Pantero Pantera, the author of a work on naval tactics, says he had heard from veterans who had commanded galleys equipped in the antiquated fashion that three men to a bench with separate oars answered better than three men to one great oar but four men to one great oar he says were certainly more efficient than four men with separate oars the new-fashioned great oars he tells us were styled remi di scalocchico the old grouped roars remi a sensile terms of etymology which i cannot explain it may be doubted whether the four-banked and five-banked galleys, of which Marino Sanudo speaks, really then came into practical use. A great five-banked galley on this system, built in 1529 in the Venice Arsenal by Vettor Fausto, was the subject of so much talk and excitement that it must evidently have been something quite new and unheard of. So late as 1567, indeed, the King of Spain built at Barcelona a galley of thirty-six benches to the side, and seven men to the bench, with a separate oar to each in the old fashion, but it proved a failure. Down to the introduction of the great oars, the usual system appears to have been three oars to a bench for the larger galleys, and two oars for the lighter ones. The fuste, or lighter galleys of the Venetians, even to about the middle of the sixteenth century, had their oars in pairs from stern to the mast, and single oars only from the mast forward. Returning then to the three-banked and two-banked galleys of the latter part of the thirteenth century, the number of benches on each side seems to have run from twenty-five to twenty-eight, at least as I interpret Sanudo's calculations. The hundred-oared vessels often mentioned, example by Muntaner, page 419, were probably two banked vessels with twenty-five benches to a side. The galleys were very narrow, only fifteen and a half feet in beam. But to give room for the play of oars and the passage of the fighting men, etc., this width was largely augmented by an operetta morta, or outrigger deck, projecting much beyond the ship's sides and supported by timber brackets. I do not find it stated how this projection was in the medieval galleys, but in those of the seventeenth century it was on each side as much as two-ninths of the true beam, and if it was as great in the thirteenth century galleys, the total width between the false gunnels would be about twenty-four and a quarter feet. In the center line of the deck ran, the whole length of the vessel, a raised gangway called the corsia, for passage clear of the oars. The benches were arranged as in this diagram. The part of the bench next to the gunwale was at right angles to it, but the other two-thirds of the bench were thrown forward obliquely. A, B, C indicate the position of the three rowers. The shortest oar, A, was called the torlicio, the middle one, the posticio, the long oar, C, piamero. I do not find any information as to how the oars worked on the gunwales. The Siena fresco appears to show them attached by loops and pins, which is the usual practice in boats of the Mediterranean now. 
In the cut from D. Tintoretto, the groups of oars protrude through regular ports in the bulwarks, but this probably represents the use of a later day. In any case, the oars of each bench must have worked in very close proximity. Sanudo states the length of the galleys of this time, 1300 to 1320, as 117 feet. This was doubtless length of keel, for that is specified, da roda a roda. In other Venetian measurements, but the whole oar space could scarcely have been so much, and with 28 benches to a side there could not have been more than 4 feet gunnel space to each bench and as one of the objects of the grouping oars was to allow room between the benches for the action of crossbowmen, etc., it is plain that the rowlock space for the three oars must have been very much compressed. The rowers were divided into three classes with graduated pay. The highest class, who pulled the poop or stroke oars, were called portolati. Those at the bow, called prodieri, formed the second class. Some elucidation of the arrangements that we have tried to describe will be found in our cuts. That at page 35 is from a drawing, by the aid of a very imperfect photograph, of part of one of the frescoes of Spinello Artini in the Municipal Palace at Siena, representing a victory of the Venetians over the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa's fleet, commanded by his son Otho in 1176. But no doubt the galleys, and etc., are of the artist's own age, the middle of the fourteenth century. In this we see plainly the projecting opera morta, and the rowers sitting two to a bench, each with his oar, for these are two banked. We can also discern the Latin rudder on the quarter. See this volume, page 119. In a picture in the Uffizi at Florence, of about the same date, by Pietro Larato, it is in the corridor near the entrance. May be seen a small figure of a galley with oars also very distinctly coupled. Cassoni has engraved, after Cristoforo Canale, a pictorial plan of a Venetian trireme of the 16th century, which shows the arrangement of the oars and triplets very plainly. The following cut has been sketched from an engraving of a picture by Domencio Tintoretto in Doge's palace, representing, I believe, the same action, real or imaginary, as Spinello's fresco, but with the costume and construction of a later date. It shows, however, very plainly the projecting opera morta, and the arrangement of the oars and fours, issuing through row ports and high bulwarks. Midship in the medieval galley, a castle was erected, of the width of the ship, and some twenty feet in length, its platform being elevated sufficiently to allow a free passage under it and over the benches. At the bow was the battery, consisting of mangonels, see volume 2, page 161, and great crossbows with winding gear, whilst there were shot ports for smaller crossbows along the gunnels in the intervals between the benches. Some of the larger galleys had openings to admit horses at the stern, which were closed and cocked for the voyage, being under water when the vessel was at sea. It seems to have been a very usual piece of tactics, in attacking as well as in a waiting attack, to connect a large number of galleys by hawsers, and sometimes also to link the oars together, so as to render it difficult for the enemy to break the line or run aboard. We find this practiced by the Genoese on the defensive at the Battle of Aias, Infra, page 43 and it is constantly resorted to by the Catalans in the battles described by Ramon de Muntaner. Sanudo says the toil of rowing in the galleys was excessive, almost unendurable, yet it seems to have been performed by freely enlisted men, and therefore it was probably less severe than that of the great oared galleys of more recent times, which it was found impracticable to work by free enlistment or otherwise than by slaves under the most cruel driving. I am not well enough read to say that war galleys were never rowed by slaves in the Middle Ages, but the only doubtful allusion to such a class that I have met with is in one passage of Muntaner, where he says, describing the Neapolitan and Catalan fleets drawing together for action, that the gangs of the galleys had to toil like four cats. Indeed, as regards Venice at least, convict rowers are stated to have been first introduced in 1549, previous to which the gangs were of Galeotti a soldate. We have already mentioned that Sanudo requires for his three-banked galley a ship's company of 250 men. They are distributed as follows. Comito, or master, one. Quartermasters, eight. Carpenters, two. Cockers, two. In charge of stores and arms, four. 
Orderlies, 2. Cook, 1. Arblasteers, 50. Rowers, 180. 250 total. This does not include the Soprocomito, or gentleman commander, who is expected to be valens homo et probus, a soldier and a gentleman fit to be consulted on occasion by the captain general. In the Venetian fleet he was generally a noble. The aggregate pay of such a crew, not including the Soprocomito, amounted monthly to 60 lire de grossi, or 600 florins, equivalent to 280 lire at modern gold value and the cost for a year to nearly 3,160 lira, exclusive to the victualling of the vessel and the pay of the gentleman commander. The build or purchase of a galley complete is estimated by the same author at 15,000 florins, or 7,012 lira. We see that war cost a good deal in money even then. Beside the ship's own complement, Sanudo gives an estimate for the general staff of a fleet of 60 galleys. This consists of a captain general, two vice-admirals, and the following. Six probi homines, or gentlemen of character, forming a council to the captain-general. Four commissaries of stores. Two commissaries over the arms. Three physicians. Three surgeons. Five master engineers and carpenters. Fifteen master smiths. Twelve master fletchers. Five cuirassmen and helmet-makers. 15 ore makers and shaft makers, 10 stone cutters for stone shot, 10 master arbalist makers, 20 musicians, 20 orderlies, etc. The musicians formed an important part of the equipment. Sanudo says that in going into action, every vessel should make the greatest possible display of colors. Gonfalons and broad banners should float from stern to stern, and gay pennons all along the bulwarks. Whilst it was impossible to have too much of noisy music, of pipes, trumpets, kettle drums, and what not, to put heart into the crew and strike fear into the enemy. So Joinville, in a glorious passage, describes the galley of his kinsman, the Count of Jaffa, at the landing of St. Louis in Egypt. The galley made the most gallant figure of them all, for it was painted all over, above water and below, with scutcheons of the Count's arms, the field of which was oar with a cross patee gules. He had a good three hundred rowers in his galley, and every man of them had a target blazoned with his arms in beaten gold. And, as they came on, the galley looked to be some flying creature, with such spirit did the rowers spin it along, or rather with the rustle of its flags, and the roar of its nacares and drums and saracen horns, you might have taken it for a rushing bolt of heaven. The galleys, which were very low in the water, could not keep the sea in rough weather and in winter they never willingly kept the sea at night, however fair the weather might be. Yet Sanudo mentions that he had been with armed galleys to slies in Flanders. I will mention two more particulars before concluding this digression. When captured, galleys were towed into port, it was stern foremost, and with their colors dragging on the surface of the sea. And the custom of saluting at sunset, probably by music, was in vogue on board the galleys of the thirteenth century. We shall now sketch the circumstances that led to the appearance of our traveller in the command of a war galley. End of section 5、section、six of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Ristocello di Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 6. The Jealousies and Naval Wars of Venice and Genoa. Lambda Doria's Expedition to the Adriatic. Battle of Curzola, and Imprisonment of Marco Polo by the Genoese. Jealousies, too characteristic of the Italian communities, were, in the case of the three great trading republics of Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, aggravated by commercial rivalries, whilst, between the two first of those states, and also between the last two, the bitterness of such feelings had been augmenting during the whole course of the thirteenth century. The brilliant part played by Venice in the conquest of Constantinople, 1204, 
and the preponderance she thus acquired on the Greek shores, stimulated her arrogance and the resentment of her rivals. The three states no longer stood on a level as bidders for the shifting favor of the Emperor of the East. By treaty, not only was Venice established as the most important ally of the empire, and as mistress of a large fraction of its territory, but all members of nations at war with her were prohibited from entering its limits. Though the Genoese colonies continued to exist, they stood at a great disadvantage, where their rivals were so predominant and enjoyed exemption from duties, to which the Genoese remained subject. Hence, jealousies and resentments reached a climax in the Levantine settlements, and this colonial exervation reacted on the mother states. A dispute which broke out at Acre in 1255 came to a head in a war which lasted for years and was felt all over Syria. It began in a quarrel about a very old church called St. Saba's, which stood on the common boundary of the Venetian and Genoese states in Acre, and this flame was blown by other unlucky occurrences. Acre suffered grievously. Venice at this time generally kept the upper hand, beating Genoa by land and sea, and driving her from Acre altogether. Four ancient porphyry figures from St. Saba's were sent in triumph to Venice, and with their strange devices still stand at the exterior corner of St. Mark's, towards the Ducal Palace. But no number of defeats could extinguish the spirit of Genoa, and the tables were turned when in her wrath she allied herself with Michael Paleologus to upset the feeble and tottering Latin dynasty, and with it the preponderance of Venice on the Bosphorus. The new emperor handed over to his allies the castle of their foes, which they tore down with jubilations, and now it was their turn to send its stones as trophies to Genoa. Mutual hate waxed fiercer than ever. No merchant fleet of either state could go to sea without convoy, and wherever their ships met, they fought. It was something like the state of things between Spain and England in the days of Drake. The energy and capacity of the Genoese seemed to rise with their success, and both in seamanship and in splendor they began almost to surpass their old rivals. The fall of Acre, 1291, and the total expulsion of the Franks from Syria in great measure barred the southern routes of Indian trade, whilst the predominance of Genoa in the Uxine more or less obstructed the free access of her rival to the northern routes by Trebizond and Tana. Truces were made and renewed, but the old fire still smoldered. In the spring of 1294 it broke into flame, in consequence of the seizure in the Grecian seas of three Genoese vessels by a Venetian fleet. This led to an action with a Genoese convoy which sought redress. The fight took place off Ayas in the Gulf of Scanderon, and though the Genoese were inferior in strength by one-third, they gained a signal victory, capturing all but three of the Venetian galleys with rich cargoes, including that of Marco Basilio, or Basiago, the Commodore. This victory over their haughty foe was in its completeness evidently a surprise to the Genoese, as well as a source of immense exultation which is vigorously expressed in a ballad of the day, written in a stirring salt-water rhythm. It represents the Venetians, as they enter the bay, in arrogant mirth reviling the Genoese with very unsavory epithets, as having deserted their ships to skulk on shore. They are described as saying, Off they've slunk, and left us nothing. We shall get nor prize, nor praise. Nothing save those crazy timbers, only fit to make a blaze. So they advance carelessly, on they come, but lo, their blunder, when our lads start up anon, breaking out like unchained lions, with a roar, fall on, fall on. After relating the battle and the thoroughness of the victory, ending in the conflagration of five and twenty captured galleys, the poet concludes by an admonition to the enemy to moderate his pride and curb his arrogant tongue, harping on the obnoxious epithet Porci la Proxy, which seems to have galled the Genoese. He concludes, Nor can I at all remember ever to have heard the story of a fight wherein the victors reap so rich a meed of glory. The community of Genoa decreed that the victory should be commemorated by the annual presentation of a gold pall to the monastery of St. Germans, the saint on whose feast, 28th May, it had been won. The startling news was received at Venice with wrath and grief for the flower of their navy had perished, and all energies were bent at once to raise an overwhelming force. The Pope, Boniface the Eighth, interfered as arbitrator, calling for plenipotentiaries from both sides, but spirits were too much inflamed, and this mediation came to naught. Further outrages on both sides occurred in 1296. 
the Genoese residences at Pera were fired, their great alum works on the coast of Anatolia were devastated, and Caffa was stormed and sacked, whilst on the other hand a number of the Venetians at Constantinople were massacred by the Genoese, and Marco Bembo, their balio, was flung from a housetop. Amid such events, the fire of enmity between the cities waxed hotter and hotter. In 1298, the Genoese made elaborate preparations for a great blow at the enemy, and fitted out a powerful fleet which they placed under the command of Lambda Doria, a younger brother of Umberto of that illustrious house, under whom he had served fourteen years before in the great rout of the Pisans at Meloria. The rendezvous of the fleet was in the Gulf of Spezia, as we learn from the same pithy Genoese poet who celebrated Aias. This time the Genoese were bent on bearding St. Mark's lion in his own den, and after touching at Messina they steered straight for the Adriatic. Now, as the stern on Toronto bears, pull with a will, and please the Lord, let them who bragged with fire and sword, to waste our homesteads, look to theirs. On their entering the gulf, a great storm dispersed the fleet. The admiral with twenty of his galleys got into port at Antivari, on the Albanian coast, and next day was rejoined by fifty-eight more, with which he scoured the Dalmatian shore, plundering all Venetian property. Some sixteen of his galleys were still missing when he reached the island of Corzola, or Scorzola, as the more popular name seems to have been, the Black Corsera of the Ancients, the ancient town of which, a rich and flourishing place, the Genoese took and burned. Thus they were engaged when word came that the Venetian fleet was in sight. Venice, on first hearing of the Genoese armament, sent Andrea Dandolo with a large force to join and supersede Maffeo Perolini, who was already cruising with a squadron in the Ionian Sea. And, on receiving further information of the strength of the hostile exposition, the Signori hastily equipped thirty-two more galleys in Chioggia and the ports of Dalmatia, and dispatched them to join Dandalo, making the whole number under his command up to something like ninety-five. Recent drafts had apparently told heavily upon the Venetian sources of enlistment, and it is stated that many of the compliments were made up of rustics swept in haste from the Uganian hills. To this the Genoese poet seems to allude, alleging that the Venetians, in spite of their haughty language, had to go begging for men and money up and down Lombardy. Did we do like that, think you, he adds? Beat up for aliens? We indeed? When lacked we home-born Genoese? Search all the seas, no salts like these, for courage, sea-craft, wit, at need. Of one of the Venetian galleys, probably in the fleet which sailed under Dandalo's immediate command, went Marco Polo, as Sopracomita, or gentleman commander. It was on the afternoon of Saturday, the 6th September, that the Genoese saw the Venetian fleet approaching, but, as sunset was not far off, both sides tacitly agreed to defer the engagement. The Genoese would appear to have occupied a position near the eastern end of the island of Corzola, with the peninsula of Savioncello behind them, and Medella on their left, whilst the Venetians advanced along the south side of Corzola. According to Venetian accounts, the Genoese were staggered at the sight of the Venetian armaments, and sent more than once to seek terms, offering finally to surrender galleys and munitions of war if the crews were allowed to depart. This is an improbable story, and that of the Genoese ballad seems more like the truth. Doria, it says, held a council of his captains in the evening at which they all voted for attack, while the Venetians, with that overweening sense of superiority which at this time is reflected in their own annals as distinctly as in those of their enemies, kept scout vessels out to watch that the Genoese fleet, which they looked on as already their own, did not steal away in the darkness. A vain imagination, says the poet, blind error of vainglorious men, to dream that we should seek to flee, after those weary leagues of sea crossed, but to hunt them in their den. The battle began early on Sunday, and lasted till the afternoon. The Venetians had the wind in their favor, but the morning sun in their eyes. They made the attack, and with great impetuosity captured ten Genoese galleys. But they pressed on too wildly, as some of their vessels ran aground. One of their galleys, too, being taken, was cleared of her crew and turned against the Venetians. These incidents caused confusion among the assailants. The Genoese, who had begun to give way, took fresh heart, formed a close column, and advanced boldly through the Venetian line, already in disorder. The sun had begun to decline when there appeared on the Venetian flank the fifteen or sixteen missing galleys of Doria's fleet, and fell upon it with fresh force. This decided the action. The Genoese gained a complete victory, capturing all but a few of the Venetian galleys, and including the flagship with Dandalo. The Genoese themselves lost heavily, 
especially in the early part of the action, and Lambda Doria's eldest son Octavian is said to have fallen on board his father's vessel. The number of prisoners taken was over 7,000, and among these was Marco Polo. The prisoners, even of the highest rank, appear to have been chained. Dandalo, in despair at his defeat, and at the prospect of being carried captive into Genoa, refused food, and ended by dashing his head against a bench. A Genoese account asserts that a noble funeral was given him after the arrival of the fleet at Genoa, which took place on the evening of the 16th October. It was received with great rejoicing, and the city voted the annual presentation of a pallium of gold brocade to the altar of the Virgin in the church of St. Matthew on every 8th of September, the Madonna's Day, on the eve of which the battle had been won. To the admiral himself a palace was decreed. It still stands, opposite the church of St. Matthew, though it has passed from the possession of the family. On the striped marble facades, both of the church and of the palace, inscriptions of that age, in excellent presentation, still commemorate Lambda's achievement. Malik al Mansur, the Mameluk Sultan of Egypt, as an enemy of Venice, sent a complimentary letter to Doria, accompanied by costly presents. The latter died at Savona, 17th October, 1323, a few months before the most illustrious of his prisoners, and his bones were laid in a sarcophagus which may still be seen forming the sill of one of the windows of St. Matteo, on the right as you enter. Over this sarcophagus stood the bust of Lambda till 1797, when the mob of Genoa, in idiotic imitation of the French proceedings of that age, threw it down. All of Lambda's six sons had fought with him at Maloria. In 1291, one of them, Tedicio, went forth into the Atlantic in company with Ogolino Vivaldi on a voyage of discovery, and never returned. Through Caesar, the youngest, this branch of the family still survives, bearing the distinctive surname of Lambda Doria. As to the treatment of the prisoners, accounts differ, a thing usual in such cases. The Genoese poet asserts that the hearts of his countrymen were touched, and that the captives were treated with compassionate courtesy. Navagerio the Venetian, on the other hand, declares that most of them died of hunger. Howsoever they may have been treated, here was Marco Polo, one of those many thousand prisoners in Genoa, and here, before long, he appears to have made acquaintance with a man of literary propensities, whose destiny had brought him into the like plight, by name or Stacano, or Rusticello, of Pisa. It was this person, perhaps, who persuaded the traveler to defer no longer the reduction to writing of his notable experiences. But in any case, it was he who wrote down those experiences at Marco's dictation. It is he, therefore, to whom we owe the preservation of this record, and possibly even that of the traveler's very memory. This makes the Genoese imprisonment so important an episode in Polo's biography. To Rusticano we shall presently reoccur. But let us first bring to a conclusion what may be gathered as to the duration of Polo's imprisonment. It does not appear whether Pope Boniface made any new effort for accommodation between the republics. But other Italian princes did interpose, and Matteo Visconti, Captain General of Milan, styling himself Vicar General in the Holy Roman Empire in Lombardy, was accepted as mediator, along with the community of Milan. Ambassadors from both states presented themselves at that city, and on the 25th May, 1299, they signed the terms of a peace. These terms were perfectly honorable to Venice, being absolutely equal and reciprocal, from which one is apt to conclude that the damage to the city of the sea was rather to their pride than to their power. The success of Genoa, in fact, having been followed up by no systematic attack upon Venetian commerce. Among the terms was the mutual release of prisoners on a day to be fixed by Visconti after the completion of all formalities. This day is not recorded, but as the treaty was ratified by the Doge of Venice on the 1st July, and the latest extant document concerned with the formalities appears to be dated 18th July, we may believe that before the end of August, Marco Polo was restored to the family mansion in St. Giovanni Vristostomo. Something further requires to be said before quitting this event in our traveler's life. For we confess that a critical reader may have some justification in asking what evidence there is that Marco Polo ever fought at Corzola, and ever was carried a prisoner to Genoa from that unfortunate action. A learned Frenchman, whom we shall have to quote freely in the immediately ensuing pages, does not venture to be more precise in reference to the meeting of Polo and Rusticano than to say of the latter, In 1298, being in durance in the prison of Genoa, he there became acquainted with Marco Polo, whom the Genoese had deprived of his liberty from motives equally unknown. To those who have no relish for biographies that round the meager skeleton of authentic facts with a plump padding of what might have been, 
This sentence of Pauline Paris is quite refreshing in its stern limitation to positive knowledge, and certainly no contemporary authority has yet been found for the capture of our traveller at Cozzola. Still, I think that the fact is beyond reasonable doubt. Ramusio's biographical notices certainly contain many errors of detail, and some, such as the many years' interval which he sets between the Battle of Cozzola and Marco's return, are errors which a very little trouble would have enabled him to eschew. But still, it does seem reasonable to believe that the main fact of Marco's command of a galley at Corzola, and capture there, was derived from a genuine tradition, if not from documents. Let us then turn to the words which close Rusticano's preamble. Lequel, Monsieur Marc, puis demeurant en le Chartre de Gênes, fit retraire toutes ces choses à Monsieur Rustacien de Pise, qu'on celle même Chartre était Autant qu'il avait douze cent quatre-vingt-dix-huit ans que Jésus eût vécu. These words are at least thoroughly consistent with Marco's capture at Corzola, as regards both the position in which they present him, and the year in which he is thus presented. There is, however, another piece of evidence, though it is curiously indirect. The Dominican friar Japco of Acqui was a contemporary of Polo's, and was the author of a somewhat obscure chronicle called Amajo Mundi, now this chronicle does contain mention of Marco's capture in action by the Genoese, but attributes it to a different action from Cozzola, and one fought at a time when Polo could not have been present. The passage runs as follows in a manuscript of the Ambrosian Library, according to an extract given by Baldelli Bone. In the year of Christ, 1296, in the time of Pope Boniface VI, of whom we have spoken above, a battle was fought in Armenia at the place called Deaz, between fifteen galleys of the Genoese merchants and twenty-five of the Venetian merchants, and after a great fight the galleys of the Venetians were beaten, and the crews all slain or taken, and among them was taken Monsieur Marco the Venetian, who was in company with those merchants, and who was called Malono, which is as much as to say a thousand thousand pounds, for so goes the phrase in Venice. So this Monsieur Marco Malono the Venetian, with the other Venetian prisoners, is carried off to the prison of Genoa, and there kept for a long time, this Messer Marco was a long time with his father and uncle in Tartare, and he saw there many things, and made much wealth, and also learned many things, for he was a man of ability. And so, being in prison at Genoa, he made a book concerning the great wonders of the world, i.e., concerning such of them as he had seen. And what he told in the book was not as much as he had really seen, because the tongues of detractors, who, being ready to impose their own lies on others, are over hasty to set down as lies what they in their perversity disbelieve or do not understand. And because there are many great and strange things in that book, which are reckoned past all credence, he was asked by his friends on his deathbed to correct the book by removing everything that went beyond the facts, to which his reply was that he had not told one half of what he had really seen. This statement concerning the capture of Marco at the Battle of Ayas is one which cannot be true, for we know that he did not reach Venice until 1295 traveling from Persia by way of Trebizond and the Bosphorus, whilst the Battle of Ayas, of which we have purposely given some detail, was fought in May, 1294. The date 1296 assigned to it in the preceding extract has given rise to some unprofitable discussion. Could that date be accepted, no doubt it would enable us also to accept this, the sole statement from the traveler's own age of the circumstances which brought him into a Genoese prison. It would enable us to place that imprisonment within a few months of his return from the East and to extend its duration to three years, points which would thus accord better with the general tenor of Ramusio's tradition than the capture of Cozzola. But the matter is not open to such a solution. The date of the Battle of Ayas is not more doubtful than that of the Battle of the Nile. It is clearly stated by several independent chroniclers, and is carefully established in the ballad which we have quoted above. We shall see repeatedly in the course of this book how uncertain are the transcriptions of dates in Roman numerals, and in the present case, the 96 is as certainly a mistake for 94, as is Boniface the Sixth in the same quotation, a mistake for Boniface the Eighth. But though we cannot accept the statement that Polo was taken prisoner at Ias in the spring of 1294, we may accept the passage as evidence from a contemporary source that he was taken prisoner in some sea fight with the Genoese, and thus admit it in corroboration of the Brumusian tradition of his capture in a sea fight at Corzola in 1298, which is perfectly consistent with all other facts in our possession. End of section 6. Recording by Todd. Of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, 
Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rasticello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notes, Part 7. Rusticiano or Rusticello of Pisa. Marco Polo's fellow prisoner at Genoa, the scribe who wrote down the travels. We have now to say something of that Rusticiano to whom all who value Polo's book are so much indebted. The relations between Genoa and Pisa had long been so hostile that it was only too natural in 1298 to find a Pisan in the jail of Genoa. An unhappy multitude of such prisoners had been carried thither fourteen years before, and the survivors still lingered there in vastly dwindled numbers. In the summer of 1284 was fought the battle from which Pisa had to date the commencement of our long decay. In July of that year the Pisans, at a time when the Genoese had no fleet in their own immediate waters, had advanced to the very port of Genoa, and shot their defiance into the proud city in the form of silver-headed arrows and stones belted with scarlet. They had to pay dearly for this insult. The Genoese, recalling their cruisers, speedily mustered a fleet of eighty-eight galleys, which were placed under the command of another of that illustrious house of Doria, the Scipios of Genoa, as they have been called, Uberto, the elder brother of Lamba. Lamba himself, with his six sons and another brother, was in the fleet, whilst the whole number of Dorias who fought in the ensuing action amounted to two hundred and fifty, most of them on board one great galley bearing the name of the family patron, St. Matthew. The Pisans, more than one-fourth inferior in strength, came out boldly, and the battle was fought off the Porto Pisano, in fact close in front of Leghorn, where a lighthouse on a remarkable arched basement still marks the islet of Meloria, whence the battle got its name. The day was the 6th of August, the Feast of St. Sixtus, a day memorable in the Pisan Fasti for several great victories, but on this occasion the defeat of Pisa was overwhelming. Forty of their galleys were taken or sunk, and upwards of nine thousand prisoners carried to Genoa. In fact, so vast a sweep was made at the flower of Pisan manhood that it was a common saying then, Che volveda Pisa, vada Genoa. Many noble ladies of Pisa went in large companies on foot to Genoa to seek their husbands or kinsmen. Quote, and when they made inquiry of the keepers of the prisons, the reply would be, Yesterday there died thirty of them, today there have died forty all of whom we have cast into the sea, and so it is daily. A body of prisoners so numerous and important naturally exerted themselves in the cause of peace, and through their efforts, after many months of negotiation, a formal peace was signed, 15th April 1288. But through the influence, as was alleged, of Count Ugolino, Dantes, who was then in power at Pisa, the peace became abortive, war almost immediately recommenced, and the prisoners had no release. And when the six thousand or seven thousand Venetians were thrown into the prisons of Genoa in October 1298, they would find there the scanty surviving remnant of the Pisan prisoners of Meloria, and would gather from them dismal forebodings of the fate before them. It is a fair conjecture that to that remnant Rusticiano of Pisa may have belonged. We have seen Ramusio's representation of the kindness shown to Marco during his imprisonment by a certain Genoese gentleman who also assisted him to reduce his travels to writing. We may be certain that this Genoese gentleman is only a distorted image of Rusticiano, the Pisan prisoner in the jail of Genoa whose name and part in the history of his hero's book Ramusio so strangely ignores. Yet patriotic Genoese writers in our own times have striven to determine the identity of this their imaginary countryman. 
Who, then, was Rusticiano, or, as the name actually is read in the oldest type of manuscript, Messer Rustician de Peace? Our knowledge of him is but scanty. Still something is known of him besides the few words concluding his preamble to our traveller's book, which you may read at pages one and two of the body of this volume. In Sir Walter Scott's Essay on Romance, when he speaks of the new mould in which the subjects of the old metrical stories were cast by the school of prose romancers which arose in the thirteenth century, we find the following words, quote, Whatever fragments or shadows of true history may yet remain hidden under the mass of accumulated fable which had been heaped upon them during successive ages, must undoubtedly be sought in the metrical romances but those prose authors who wrote under the imaginary names of Rusticien de Pise, Robert de Boron, and the like, usually seized upon the subject of some old minstrel, and recomposing the whole narrative after their own fashion, with additional character and adventure, totally obliterated in that operation any shades which remained of the original and probably authentic tradition. End quote. Evidently, therefore, Sir Walter regarded Rusticien of Pisa as a person belonging to the same ghostly company as his own Cleisbothams and Dryostus. But in this we see that he was wrong. In the great Paris library and elsewhere there are manuscript volumes containing the stories of the round table abridged and somewhat clumsily combined from the various prose romances of that cycle, such as Sir Tristan, Lancelot, Palamides, Giron le Courtois, etc., which had been composed, it would seem, by various Anglo-French gentlemen at the court of Henry III, styled, or styling themselves, Gas le Blanc, Luce du Gas, Robert de Bouron, and Elie de Bouron. And these abridgments or recasts are professedly the work of Le Maître Rusticien de Pise. Several of them were printed at Paris in the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th centuries as the works of Rusticien de Pise, and as the preambles and the like, especially in the form presented in those printed editions, appear to be due sometimes to the original composers, as Robert and Elie de Bouron, and sometimes to Rusticien de Pise, the recaster, there would seem to have been a good deal of confusion made in regard to their respective personalities, from a preamble to one of those compilations, which undoubtedly belongs to Rusticien, and which we shall quote at length by and by, we learn that Master Rusticien translated, or perhaps transferred, his compilation from a book belonging to King Edward of England, at the time when that prince went beyond seas to recover the Holy Sepulchre. Now Prince Edward started for the Holy Land in 1270, spent the winter of that year in Sicily, and arrived in Palestine in May 1271. He quitted it again in August 1272, and passed again by Sicily, where in January 1273 he heard of his father's death and his own consequent accession. Paulin Paris supposes that Rusticien was attached to the Sicilian court of Charles of Anjou, and that Edward, quote, may have deposited with that king the romances of the round table, of which all the world was talking, but the manuscripts of which were still very rare, especially those of the work of Helle de Bouron. Whether by order or only with permission of the King of Sicily, Arusician made haste to read, abridge, and rearrange the whole, and when Edward returned to Sicily, he recovered possession of the book from which the indefatigable Pison had extracted the contents. End quote. But this, I believe, is, in so far as it passes the facts stated in Rusticien's own preamble, pure hypothesis, for nothing is cited that connects Rustician with the King of Sicily. And if there be not some such confusion of personality as we have alluded to, in another of the preambles, which is quoted by Dunlop as an utterance of Rustician's, that personage would seem to claim to have been a comrade in arms of the two de Bons. We might therefore conjecture that Rustician himself had accompanied Prince Edward to Syria. Rustician's literary work appears from the extracts and remarks of Paulin Paris to be that of an industrious, simple man, 
without method or much judgment. Quote, the haste with which he worked is too perceptible. The adventures are told without connection. You find long stories of Tristan, followed by adventures of his father, Meliadus. End quote. For the latter derangement of historical sequence, we find a quaint and ingenious apology offered in Rustician's epilogue to Giron le Courtois. Quote, si fin le maître Rustician de Pise son compte en louant et régression le père le fit et le saint esprit et un mesme Dieu, fille de la Benoise, Vierge Marie, de ce qu'il m'a donné grâce, sens, force et mémoire, temps et lieu, de me mener afin de si haute et si noble matière comme celle-ci dont j'ai traité les faits et prouesses récitées et recordées à mon livre. Et si aucun me demande pourquoi j'ai parlé de Tristan avant que de son père, le roi Miliadus, le respond que ma matière ne soit pas connue, car je ne puis pas scavoir tout, ne mettre toutes mes paroles par ordre, et ainsi fin mon compte. Amen. End quote. In a passage of these compilations, the Emperor Charlemagne is asked whether in his judgment King Meliadus or his son Tristan were the better man. The Emperor's answer is, Quote, I should say that the King Meliadus was the better man, and I will tell you why I say so. As far as I can see, everything that Tristan did was done for love, and his great feats would never have been done but under the constraint of love, which was his spur and goad. Now that never can be said of King Meliadus. For what deeds he did, he did them not by dint of love, but by dint of his strong right arm. Purely out of his own good he did good, and not by constraint of love. End quote. It will be seen, remarks on this Paulin Paris, quote, that we are here a long way removed from the ordinary principles of round table romances, and one thing besides will be manifest, that is, that Rustician de Pise was no Frenchman. End quote. The same discretion is shown even more prominently in a passage of one of his compilations, which contains the romances of Arthur, Giron, and Meliadus, number 6975. No doubt, Rustician says, quote, other books tell the story of the Queen Ginevra and Lancelot differently from this, and there were certain passages between them of which the master, in his concern for the honour of both those personages, will say not a word. End quote. Alas, says the French bibliographer, that the copy of Lancelot which fell into the hands of poor Francesca of Rimini was not one of those expurgated by our worthy friend Rustician. A question may still occur to an attentive reader as to the identity of this romance compiler, Rustician de Pise, with the Messire Rustation de Pise, of a solitary manuscript of Polo's work though the oldest and most authentic, a name which appears in other copies as Rustapisan, Rastapisan, Rusticellus Civis Pisanus, Rustico, Rustasio da Pisa, Stasio da Pisa, and who is stated in the preamble to have acted as a traveller's scribe at Genoa. M. Poutier, indeed, asserts that the French of the manuscript Romances of Rustian de Pise is of the same barbarous character as that of the early French manuscript of Polo's book to which we have just alluded, and which we shall show to be the nearest presentation of the work as originally dictated by the traveller. The language of the latter manuscript is so peculiar that this would be almost perfect evidence of the identity of the writers if it were really the fact. A cursory inspection which I have made of two of those manuscripts in Paris, and the extracts which I have given, and am about to give, do not, however, by any means support M. Poutier's view. Nor would that view be consistent with the judgment of so competent an authority as Paulin Paris, implied in his calling Rustician a non recommandable in old French literature, and his speaking of him as versed in the secrets of the French romance tongue. In fact, the difference of language in the two cases would really be a difficulty in the way of identification if there were room for doubt. 
This, however, Paulin Paris seems to have excluded finally by calling attention to the peculiar formula of preamble which is common to the book of Marco Polo and to one of the romance compilations of Rusticien de Pise. The former will be found in English at pages 1, 2 of our translation, but we give a part of the original below for comparison with the preamble to the romances of Meliadus, Tristan, and Lancelot, as taken from manuscript 6961 of the Perry Library. Quote, Seigneur, Empereur et Prince, Duc et Comte et Baron et Chevalier et Vavasseur et Bourgeois, et tous les prud'hommes de ce huit monde qui avaient talent de vous délité en romance, si prenez ce huit livre et le faites lire de chef en chef, si aurez toutes les grandes aventures qui adviendront entre les chevaliers rang du temps au roi Outeur Pendragon, jusqu'à le temps au roi Artu son fils, et des compagnons de la table ronde, et sachez tout vraiment que ce livre fut translaté du livre Monseigneur Édouard le roi d'Angleterre en solitant qu'il passa outre la mer au service Notre Seigneur Dame Dieu pour conquester le sang sepulcre et Maître Rossicien de Pise, lequel est imaginé ici dessus, compila ce romnant, car il en translata toutes les merveilleuses nouvelles et aventures qu'il trouva en ce livre, et traita tout certainement de toutes les aventures du monde, et si sachez qu'il traitera plus de Monsieur Lancelot du Lac et Monsieur Tristan le fils au roi Méliadus de Lénois qui d'autres, parce qu'ils furent sans fait les meilleurs chevaliers qui à ce temps furent en terre, et l'y maître en dira de ces deux plusieurs choses et plusieurs nouvelles que l'on trouvera écrit en tous les autres livres, et parce que le maître le trouva écrit au livre d'Angleterre. Certainly, Paulin Paris observes, quote, there is a singular analogy between these two prefaces, and it must be remarked that the formula is not an ordinary one with translators, compilers, or authors of the 13th and 14th centuries. Perhaps you would not find a single other example of it. End quote. This seems to place beyond question the identity of the romance compiler of Prince Edward's suite in 1270 and the prisoner of Genoa, in 1298. In Dunlop's History of Fiction, a passage is quoted from the preamble of Meliadus, as set forth in the Paris printed edition of 1528, which gives us to understand that Rusticien de Pise had received as a reward for some of his compositions from King Henry III the prodigal gift of two chateaux. I gather, however, from passages in the work of Paulin Paris that this must certainly be one of those confusions of persons to which I have referred before, and that the recipient of the chateau was in reality Hélie de Bouron, the author of some of the originals which Rusticien manipulated. This supposed incident in Rusticien's scanty history must therefore be given up. We call this worthy Rusticien, or Rusticiano, as the nearest probable representation in Italian form of the Rusticien of the Round Table Manuscripts, and the Rustations of the old text of Polo. But it is highly probable that his real name was Rusticello, as is suggested by the form Rusticellus in the early Latin version published by the Société de Géographie. The change of one liquid for another never goes for much in Italy, and Rusticello might easily gallicize himself as Rusticien. In a very long list of Pisan officials during the Middle Ages, I find several bearing the name of Rusticello or Rusticelli, but no Rusticiano or Rusticiano. Respecting him, we have only to add that the peace between Genoa and Venice was speedily followed by a treaty between Genoa and Pisa. On the 31st July 1299, a truce for twenty-five years was signed between those two republics. It was a very different matter from that between Genoa and Venice, and contained much that was humiliating and detrimental to Pisa. 
but it embraced the release of prisoners, and those of Meloria, reduced it is said to less than one tithe of their original number, had the liberty at last. Among the prisoners then released, no doubt Rustician was one. But we hear of him no more. End of section 7of the book of Sir Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yeo. Introductory Notices, Part 8. Notices of Marco Polo's History After the Termination of His Imprisonment at Genoa. A few very disconnected notices are all that can be collected of matter properly biographical in relation to the quarter century during which Marco Polo survived the Genoese captivity. We have seen that he would probably reach Venice in the course of August 1299. Whether he found his aged father alive is not known, but we know at least that a year later, 31st of August, 1300, Master Niccolo was no longer in life. This we learn from the will of the younger Mafio, Marcus' brother, which bears the date just named, and of which we give an abstract below. It seems to imply strong regard for the testator's brother Marco, who is made inheritor of the bulk of the property failing the possible birth of a son. I have already indicated some conjectural deductions from this document. I may add that the terms of the second clause, as quoted in the note, seem to me to throw considerable doubt on the genealogy which bestows a large family of sons upon his brother Mafio. If he lived to have such a family, it seems improbable that the draft which he thus left in the hands of a notary to be converted into a will in the event of his death, a curious example of the validity attaching to all acts of notaries in those days, should never have been superseded, but should actually have been so converted after his death. As the existence of the parchment seems to prove. But for this circumstance, we might suppose the Marcolino mentioned in the ensuing paragraph to have been a son of the younger Mafio. Master Mafio, the uncle, was, we see, alive at this time. We do not know the year of his death, but it is alluded to by Friar Pipino in the preamble to his translation of the book, supposed to have been executed about 1315 and 1320, and we learn from a document in the Venetian archives that it must have been previous to 1318 and subsequent to February 1309, the date of his last will. The will itself is not known to be extant, but from the reference to it in this document we learn that he left 1,000 lire of public debt, in prestitorum, to a certain Marco Polo, called Marcolino. The relationship of this Marco to old Mafio is not stated, but we may suspect him to have been an illegitimate son. Marcolino was a son of Niccolo, son of Marco the Elder. See Volume 2, Calendar, Number 6. In 1302 occurs what was at first supposed to be a glimpse of Marco as a citizen, slight and quaint enough, being a resolution on the books of the Great Council to exempt the respectable Marco Polo from the penalty incurred by him on account of the omission to have his water pipe duly inspected. But since our Marco's claims to the designation of nobilis vir have been established, there is a doubt whether the providus vir or prudom here spoken of may not have been rather his namesake, Marco Polo of Canareggio or San Jeremia, of whose existence we learn from another entry of the same year. It is, however, possible that Marco the Traveller was called to the Great Council after the date of the document in question. We have seen that the traveler, and after him his house and his book, acquired from his contemporaries the surname, or nickname rather, of Il Milione. 
different writers have given different explanations of the origin of this name. Some, beginning with his contemporary Fray Jacopo d'Aqui, ascribing it to the families having brought home a fortune of a million of lire, in fact, to their being millionaires. This is the explanation followed by Sansofino, Marco Barbaro, Coronelli, and others. More far-fetched is that of Fontanini, who supposes the name to have been given to the book as containing a great number of stories, like the Cento Novelle, or the Thousand and One Nights. But there can be no doubt that Ramusius is the true, as it is the natural, explanation, and that the name was bestowed on Marco by the young wits of his native city, because of his frequent use of a word which appears to have been then unusual, in his attempts to convey an idea of the vast wealth and magnificence of the Khan's treasury and court. Ramusio has told us that he had seen Marco styled by this sobriquet in the books of the Seigneury, and it is pleasant to be able to confirm this by the next document which we cite. This is an extract from the books of the Great Council under the 10th of April, 1305, condoning the offense of a certain Bonaccio of Mestre in smuggling wine, for whose penalty one of the sureties had been the nobilis vir Marcus Paolo Milioni. It is alleged that long after our traveler's death there was always in the Venetian masks one individual who assumed the character of Marco Milioni and told Munchausen-like stories to divert the vulgar. Such, if this be true, was the honor of our prophet among the populace of his own country. A little later, we hear of Marco once more, as presenting a copy of his book to a noble Frenchman in the service of Charles of Valois. This prince, brother of Philip the Fair, in 1301 had married Catherine, daughter and heiress of Philip de Courtenay, titular emperor of Constantinople, and on the strength of his marriage had, at a later date, set up his own claim to the empire of the east. To this he was prompted by Pope Clement V, who, in the beginning of 1306, wrote to Venice, stimulating that government to take part in the enterprise. In the same year, Charles and his wife sent as their envoys to Venice, in connection with this matter, a noble knight called Thibault de Sepoy, along with an ecclesiastic of Chartres called Pierre Le Riche, and these two succeeded in executing a treaty of alliance with Venice, of which the original, dated 14th December 1306, exists at Paris. Thibault de Sepoy eventually went on to Greece with a squadron of Venetian galleys, but accomplished nothing of moment, and returned to his master in 1310. During the stay of Tybalt at Venice, he seems to have made acquaintance with Marco Polo, and to have received from him a copy of his book. This is recorded in a curious note, which appears on two existing manuscripts of Polo's book. This, that of the Paris Library, 10,270, or FR 5,649, and that of Bern, which is substantially identical in its text with the former, and this, I believe, a copy of it. The note runs as follows. Here you have the book of which my lord, Thibault, knight and lord of Sepoy, who made God a soil, requested a copy from Sir Mark Polo, burgess and resident of the city of Venice. And the said sire Marco Polo, being a very honorable person of high character and respect in many countries, because of his desire that what he had witnessed should be known throughout the world, and also for the honor and reverence he bore to the most excellent and puissant prince, my lord Charles, son of the king of France and count of Valois, gave and presented to the aforesaid lord of Sepoy the first copy that was taken of his sad book after he had made the same. And very pleasing it was to him that his book should be carried to the noble country of France, and there made known by so worthy a gentleman. And from that copy, which the said Messiah Thibault, sire the Sepoy above named, did carry into France, Messiah John, who was his eldest son, and is the present sire the Sepoy, after his father's decease, did have a copy made, 
and that very first copy that was made of the book after its being carried into france he did present to his very dear and dread lord monseigneur de valois thereafter he gave copies of it to such of his friends as asked for them and the copy above mentioned was presented by the sad sire marco polo to the sad lord de sepoy when the latter went to venice on the part of monseigneur de valois and of madame the empress his wife as vicar general for them both and all the territories of the empire of constantinople and this happened in the year of the incarnation of our lord jesus christ one thousand three hundred and seven and in the month of august of the bearings of this memorandum on the literary history of polo's book we shall speak in a following section when marco married we have not been able to ascertain but it was no doubt early in the fourteenth century for in thirteen twenty four we find that he had two married daughters besides one unmarried his wife's christian name was donata but of her family we have as yet found no assurance i suspect however that her name may have been loredano under thirteen eleven we find a document which is of considerable interest because it is the only one yet discovered which exhibits marco under the aspect of a practical trader it is the judgment of the court of requests upon a suit brought by the noble marco polo of the parish of san giovanni crisostomo against one paolo girardo of san apollinare it appears that marco had entrusted to the latter as a commission agent for sale on an agreement for half profits a pound and a half of musk priced at six lire of grossi about twenty two pounds ten shillings in value of silver the pound girardo had sold half a pound at that rate and the remaining pound which he brought back was deficient of a saggio or one-sixth of an ounce but he had accounted for neither the sale nor the deficiency hence marco sues him for three lire of grossi the price of the half pound sold and for twenty grossi as the value of the saggio and the judges cast the defendant in the amount with costs and the penalty of imprisonment in the common jail of venice if the amounts were not paid within a suitable term again in may thirteen twenty three probably within a year of his death sir marco appears perhaps only by attorney before the doge and his judicial examiners to obtain a decision respecting a question touching the rights to certain stairs and porticos in contact with his own house property and that obtained from his wife in san giovanni grisostomo to this allusion has been already made we catch sight of our traveller only once more it is on the ninth of january thirteen twenty four he is labouring with disease under which he is sinking day by day and he has sent for giovanni giustiniani priest of san procolo and notary to make his last will and testament it runs thus in the name of the eternal god amen in the year from the incarnation of our lord jesus christ thirteen twenty three on the ninth day of the month of january in the first half of the seventh indiction at rialto it is the counsel of divine inspiration as well as the judgment of a provident mind that every man should take thought to make a disposition of his property before death become imminent lest in the end it should remain without any disposition wherefore i marcus paulo of the parish of st john chrysostom finding myself to grow daily feebler through bodily ailment but being by the grace of god of a sound mind and of senses and judgment unimpaired have sent for john justiniani priest of san procolo and notary and have instructed him to draw out in complete form this my testament whereby i constitute as my trustees donata my beloved wife and my dear daughters fantina bellella and moreta in order that after my decease they may execute the dispositions and bequests which i am about to make herein first of all i will and direct that the proper tithe be paid and over and above the said tithe i direct that two thousand lire of venice denari be distributed as follows this twenty soldi of venice grossi to the monastery of st lawrence where i desire to be buried also three hundred lire of venice denari to my sister-in-law isabetta quirino that she owes me also forty soldi to each of the monasteries and hospitals all the way from grado to capo d'argine 
Also, I bequeath to the convent of San Giovanni and San Paolo, of the order of preachers, that which it owes me, and also ten lire to Friar Henier, and five lire to Friar Benvenuto, the Venetian, of the order of preachers, in addition to the amount of his debt to me. I also bequeath five lire to every congregation in Rialto, and four lire to every guild or fraternity of which I am a member. Also I bequeath twenty soldi of Venetian Grossi to the priest Giovanni Justiniani the notary, for his trouble about this my will, and in order that he may pray the Lord in my behalf. Also I release Peter the Tartar, my servant, from all bondage, as completely as I pray God to release mine own soul from all sin and guilt. And I also remit him whatever he may have gained by work at his own house. And over and above I bequeath him a hundred lire of Venice Denari. And the residue of the said two thousand lire, free of tithe, I direct to be distributed for the good of my soul, according to the discretion of my trustees. Out of my remaining property, I bequeath to the aforesaid Donata, my wife and trustee, eight lire of Venetian Grossi annually, during her life, for her own use, over and above her settlement, and the linen and all the household utensils, with three beds garnished. And all my other property, movable and immovable, that has not been disposed of, he follows some lines of mere technicality, I especially and expressly bequeath to my aforesaid daughters, Fantina, Bellella, and Moretta, freely and absolutely to be divided equally among them. And I constitute them my heirs, as regards all and sundry my property, movable and immovable, and as regards all rights and contingencies, tacit and expressed, of whatsoever kind, as herein before detailed, that belong to me or may fall to me, save and except that before division my said daughter Moreta shall receive the same as each of my other daughters hath received for dory and outfit. Here follow many lines of technicalities ending. And if any one shall presume to infringe or violate this will, may he incur the malediction of God Almighty, and abide bound under the anathema of the three hundred eighteen fathers, and furthermore he shall forfeit to my trustees aforesaid five pounds of gold. And so let this my testament abide in force. The signature of the above-named Master Marco Polo, who gave instructions for this deed. Peter Griffin, Priest, Witness. Humphrey Barberi, Witness. John Justiniani, Priest of San Procolo and Notary, have completed and authenticated this testament. We do not know, as has been said, how long Marco survived the making of this will, but we know, from a scanty series of documents commencing in June of the following year, 1325, that he had then been some time dead. He was buried, no doubt, according to his declared wish, in the church of San Lorenzo, and indeed San Sovino bears testimony to the fact in a confused notice of our traveler. But there does not seem to have been any monument to Marco, though the sarcophagus which had been erected to his father Niccolo by his own filial care, existed till near the end of the sixteenth century in the porch or corridor leading to the old church of San Lorenzo, and bore the inscription, Sepultura Domini Nicolai Paolo de Contrata Sancti Ioannis Grisostemi. The church was renewed from its foundations in 1592, and then, probably, the sarcophagus was cast aside and lost, and with it all certainty as to the position of the tomb. There is no portrait of Marco Polo in existence with any claim to authenticity. The quaint figure which we give in the bibliography, extracted from the earliest printed edition of his book, can certainly make no such pretension. The oldest one after this is probably a picture in the collection of Monsignor Badia at Rome, of which I am now able, by the owner's courtesy, to give a copy. It is set down in the catalogue to Titian, but is probably a work of the 1600s or thereabouts, to which the aspect and costume belong. It is inscribed, Marcus Polus Venetus Totius Orbis et Indie Peregratur Primus. Its history, unfortunately, cannot be traced, but I believe it came from a collection at Urbino, a marble statue was erected in his honor by a family at Venice in the 17th century, 
and is still to be seen in the Palazzo Morosini Gettenberg, in the Campo San Stefano, in that city. The medallion portrait on the wall of the Sala dello Scudo in the Ducal Palace, and which was engraved in Bettoni's collection of portraits of illustrious Italians, is a work of imagination, painted by Francesco Grisellini in 1761. From this, however, was taken the medal by Fabri, which was struck in 1847 in honor of the last meeting of the Italian Congresso Scientifico, and from the medal again is copied, I believe, the elegant woodcut which adorns the introduction to M. Potier's edition, though without any information as to its history. A handsome bust by Augusto Gamba has lately been placed among the illustrious Venetians in the inner arcade of the Ducal Palace. There is also a mosaic portrait of Polo, opposite the similar portrait of Columbus in the municipio at Genoa. From the short series of documents recently alluded to, we gather all that we know of the remaining history of Marco Polo's immediate family. We have seen in his will an indication that the two eldest daughters, Fantina and Bellela, were married before his death. In 1333, we find the youngest, Moreta, also a married woman, and Bellela deceased. In 1336, we find that their mother, Donata, had died in the interval. We learn, too, that Fantina's husband was Marco Bragadino, and Moreta's Ranuzzo Dolfino. The name of Bellela's husband does not appear. Fantina's husband is probably the Marco Bragadino, son of Pietro, who, in 1346, is mentioned to have been sent as Proveditore Generale to act against the Patriarch of Aquileia. And in 1379, we find Donna Fantina herself, presumably in widowhood, assessed as a resident of San Giovanni Crisostomo, on the estimo or forced loan for the Genoese War, at 1,300 lire, whilst Pietro Bragadino, of the same parish, her son, as I imagine, is assessed at 1,500 lire. The documents show a few other incidents which may be briefly noted. In 1326, we have the record of a charge against one Zanino Grioni for insulting Donna Moreta in the Campo of San Vitale, a misdemeanor punished by the Council of Forty with two months imprisonment. In March 1328, Marco Polo, called Marcolino of St. John Chrysostom, represents before the Domini Advocatores of the Republic that certain imprestita that had belonged to the late Mafio Polo the Elder had been alienated and transferred in May 1318 by the late Marco Polo of St. John Chrysostom, and since his death by his heirs, without regards to the rights of the said Marcolino, to whom the said Master Mafio had bequeathed 1,000 lire by his will, executed on the 6th of February, 1308, that is, 1309. The advocatores find that the transfer was to that extent unjust and improper, and they ordered that to the same extent it should be revoked and annulled. Two months later, the Lady Donata makes rather an unpleasant figure before the Council of Forty. It would seem that, on the claim of Messer Bertuccio Quirino, a mandate of sequestration had been issued by the Court of Requests, affecting certain articles in the Capolo, including two bags of money, which had been tied and sealed, but left in the custody of the Lady Donata. The sum so sealed was about 80 lire of grossi, 300 pounds in silver value, but when opened, only 45 lire and 22 grossi about 170 pounds were found therein, and the lady was accused of abstracting the balance non bono modo. Probably she acted, as ladies sometimes do, on a strong sense of her own rights and a weak sense of the claims of law. The council pronounced against her, ordering restitution and a fine of 200 lire over and above, with ceteris transeat in exemplum. It will have been seen that there is nothing in the amounts mentioned in Marco's will to bear out the large reports as to his wealth, though at the same time there is no positive ground for a deduction to the contrary. The mention in two of the documents of Agnes Loredano as the sister of the Lady Donata suggests that the latter may have belonged to the Loredano family, 
but as it does not appear whether Agnes was maid or wife, this remains uncertain. Respecting the further history of the family, there is nothing certain, nor can we give unhesitating faith to Ramuzio's statement that the last male descendant of the Polos of San Giovanni Grisostomo was Marco, who died Castellano of Verona in 1417, according to others 1418 or 1425, and that the family property then passed to Maria, or Anna, as she styled in a manuscript statement furnished to me from Venice, who was married in 1401 to Benedetto Cornaro, and again in 1414 to Azzo Trevisan. Her descendant in the fourth generation by the latter was Marc Antonio Trevisano, who was chosen Doge in 1553. The genealogy recorded by Marco Barbaro, as drawn up from documents by Ramuzio, makes the Castellano of Verona a grandson of our Marco by a San Mafio, who we may safely pronounce not to have existed, and makes Maria the daughter of Mafio, Marco's brother, that is to say, makes a lady marry in 1414 and have children whose father was born in 1271 at the very latest. The genealogy is given in several other ways, but as I have satisfied myself that they all, except perhaps this of Barbaros, which we see to be otherwise erroneous, confound together the two distinct families of Polo of San Jeremia and Polo of San Giovanni Crisostomo, I reserve my faith and abstain from presenting them. Assuming that the Marco or Marcolino Polo spoken of in the preceding page was a near relation, as is probable, though perhaps an illegitimate one, he is the only male descendant of old Andrea of San Felice, whom we can indicate as having survived Marco himself. And from a study of the links in the professed genealogies, I think it not unlikely that both Marco the Castellano of Verona and Maria Trevisan belonged to the branch of San Jeremia. The unfortunate doge of Venice, Marino Faliero, seems to have possessed many souvenirs of Marco Polo, and among them two manuscripts, one in the handwriting of his celebrated fellow citizen, and one adorned with miniatures. Mr. Julius von Schlosser has reprinted from the Bulletino di Arti Industrie Curiosità Veneziane, 3, 1880-1881, page 101, the inventory of the curiosities kept in the red chamber of Marino Faliero's palace in the parish of the St. Apostles. We give the following abstract of it. Anno ab incarnatione Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, millesimo trincentesimo quinquagesimo primo, indictione sexta mensis aprilis, inventarium rerum qui sunt in camera rubea domi habitationis clarissimi domini marini faletro de confinio sanctorum apostolorum scriptum per me Johannem presbiterum dicte ecclesiae. Item, alia capsaleta cum ogiis auri et argenti, inter quos unum anonum con inscriptione quae dicit, cuble can Marco Polo, et unum torques cum multis animalibus tartarorum sculptis, quae res donum dedit predictus Marcus quidem faletrorum. Item duo, capsalete de corio albo cum variis rebus auri et argenti, quas habuit praedictus Marcus a barbarorum rege. Item unum, ensem mirabilem, qui habet tres enses simul, quen habuit in suis itineribus praedictus Marcus. Item unum, tenturam de panis indicis, quam habuit praedictus Marcus. Item de itineribus marci praedicti liber, in corio albo cum multis figuris. Item aliud volumem quod vocatur de locis mirabilibus tartarorum scriptum mano praedicti marci. There is, kept at the Louvre in the very valuable collection of china ware given by Mr. Ernest Grandidier, a white porcelain incense burner, said to come from Marco Polo. This incense burner, which belonged to Baron Davidier, who received it as a present from one of the keepers of the treasury of St. Mark's at Venice, is an octagonal ting from the Fokien province and of the time of the Sung dynasty. By the kind permission of Monsieur Grandidier, we reproduce it from the plate 2-6 
of the Ceramique Chinoise, Paris, 1894, published by this learned amateur. End of section 8. nine of the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by rusticello de pisa translated by henry yule Introductory Notices, Part 9. Marco Polo's Book and the Language in Which It Was First Written. The book itself consists essentially of two parts. First, of a prologue, as it is termed, the only part which is actual personal narrative, and which relates, in a very interesting but far too brief manner, the circumstances which led the two elder Polos to the Khan's court, and those of their second journey with Mark, and of their return to Persia through the Indian seas. Secondly, of a long series of chapters of very unequal length, descriptive of notable sights and products, of curious manners and remarkable events, relating to the different nations and states of Asia, but above all, to the Emperor Kublai, his court, wars, and administration. A series of chapters near the close treats in a verbose and monotonous manner of sundry wars that took place between the various branches of the house of Chinghis in the latter half of the thirteenth century. This last series is either omitted or greatly curtailed in all the copies and versions except one, a circumstance perfectly accounted for by the absence of interest as well as value in the bulk of these chapters. Indeed, desirous though I have been to give the traveller's work complete, and sharing the dislike that every man who uses books must bear to abridgments, I have felt that it would be sheer waste and dead weight to print these chapters in full. This second and main portion of the work is in its oldest forms undivided, the chapters running on consecutively to the end. In some very early Italian or Venetian version, which Friar Peppino translated into Latin, it was divided into three books, and this convenient division has generally been adhered to. We have adopted Monsieur Pothier's suggestion in making the final series of chapters, chiefly historical, into a fourth. As regards the language in which Marco's book was first committed to writing, we have seen that Ramusio assumed, somewhat arbitrarily, that it was Latin. Marsden supposed it to have been the Venetian dialect. Baldelli Boni first showed, in his elaborate edition, Florence, 1827, by arguments that have been illustrated and corroborated by learned men since, that it was French. That the work was originally written in some Italian dialect was a natural presumption, and slight contemporary evidence can be alleged in its favor. For Fra Peppino, in the Latin version of the work, executed whilst Marco still lived, describes his task as a translation de vulgari, and in one manuscript copy of the same Friar Peppino's chronicle, existing in the library at Modena, he refers to the said version as made ex vulgari idiomate lombardico. But though it may seem improbable that at so early a date a Latin version should have been made at second hand, I believe this to have been the case, and that some internal evidence also is traceable that Peppino translated not from the original, but from an Italian version of the original. The oldest manuscript, it is supposed, in any Italian dialect, is one in the Maglia Beccian Library at Florence, which is known in Italy as Lotima, on account of the purity of its Tuscan, and as Della Crusca from its being one of the authorities cited by that body in their vocabulary. It bears on its face the following note in Italian, quote, This book, called The Navigation of Messer Marco Polo, a noble citizen of Venice, was written in Florence by Michael Ormani, my great-grandfather by the mother's side, who died in the year of grace 1309, and my mother brought it to our family of Del Riccio, and it belongs to me, Pier del Riccio, and to my brother, 1452." Quote. 
as far as i can learn the age which this note implies is considered to be supported by the character of the manuscript itself if it be accepted the latter is a performance going back to within eleven years at most of the first dictation of the travels at first sight therefore this would rather argue that the original had been written in pure tuscan but when baldelli came to prepare it for the press he found manifest indications of its being a translation from the french some of these he has noted others have followed up the same line of comparison we give some detailed examples in a note the french text that we have been quoting published by the geographical society of paris in eighteen twenty four affords on the other hand the strongest corresponding proof that it is an original and not a translation rude as is the language of the manuscript f r one 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 six formerly number seven three six seven of paris library it is in the correctness of the proper names and the intelligible exhibition of the itineraries much superior to any form of the work previously published the language is very peculiar we are obliged to call it French, but it is not French of Paris. Its style, says Pauline Paris, quote, is about as like that of good French authors of the age, as in our day the natural accent of a German, an Englishman, or an Italian, is like that of a citizen of Paris or Blois, end quote. The author is at war with all the practices of French grammar. Subject and object, numbers, moods, and tenses are in consummate confusion. Even readers of his own day must at times have been fain to guess his meaning. Italian words are constantly introduced, either quite in the crude or rudely gallicized. And words also, we may add, sometimes slip in which appear to be purely oriental, just as is apt to happen with Anglo-Indians in those days. All this is perfectly consistent with the supposition that we have in this manuscript a copy at least of the original words as written down by Rusticiano a Tuscan from the dictation of Marco, an orientalized Venetian, in French, a language foreign to both. But the character of the language as French is not its only peculiarity. There is in the style, apart from grammar or vocabulary, a rude angularity, a rough dramatism like that of oral narrative. There is a want of proportion in the style of different parts, now over curt, now diffuse and wordy, with at times even a hammering reiteration, a constant recurrence of pet colloquial phrases, in which, however, other literary works of the age partake, a frequent change in the spelling of the same proper names, even when recurring within a few lines, as if caught by ear only, a literal following to and fro of the hesitations of the narrator, a more general use of the third person in speaking of the traveller, but an occasional lapse into the first. All these characteristics are strikingly indicative of the unrevised product of dictation, and many of them would necessarily disappear either in translation or in a revised copy. Of changes in representing the same proper name, take as an example that of the Khan of Persia, whom Polo calls Kaikatu, but also Akatu, Katu, and the like. As an example of the literal following of dictation, take the following. Quote, Let us leave Rosia, and I will tell you about the great sea, the Euxine, and what provinces and nations lie round about it, all in detail, and we will begin with Constantinople. First, however, I should tell you about a province, etc. There is nothing more worth mentioning, so I will speak of other subjects but there is one thing more to tell you about rosia that i had forgotten now then let us speak of the great sea as i was about to do to be sure many merchants and others have been here but still there are many again who know nothing about it so it will be well to include it in our book we will do so then and let us begin first with the strait of constantinople at the straits leading into the great sea on the west side there is a hill called the pharaoh but since beginning on this matter I have changed my mind, because so many people know all about it, so we will not put it in our description, but go on to something else. End quote. See volume 2, page 487, sequential. And so on. 
as a specimen of tautology and hammering reiteration the following can scarcely be surpassed the traveller is speaking of the kuki i e the indian jogis quote, and there are among them certain devotees called chughi these are longer lived than the other people for they live from one hundred fifty to two hundred years and yet they are so hale of body that they can go and come wheresoever they please and do all the service needed for their monastery or their idols and do it just as well as if they were younger and that comes of the great abstinence that they practice in eating little food and only what is wholesome for they use to eat rice and milk more than anything else and again i tell you that these chughi who live such a long time as i have told you do also eat what i am going to tell you and you will think it a great matter for i tell you that they drink quicksilver and sulphur and mix them together and make a drink of them and then they drink this and they say that it adds to their life and in fact they do live much longer for it and i tell you that they do this twice every month and let me tell you that these people use this drink from their infancy in order to live longer and without fail those who live so long as i have told you use this drink of sulphur and quicksilver end quote. see geographic text page two thirteen such talk as this does not survive the solvent of translation and we may be certain that we have here the nearest approach to the traveller's reminiscences as they were taken down from his lips in the prison of genoa another circumstance heretofore i believe unnoticed is in itself enough to demonstrate the geographic text to be the source of all other versions of the work it is this in reviewing the various classes or types of texts of polo's book which we shall hereafter attempt to discriminate there are certain proper names which we find in the different texts to take very different forms each class adhering to the main to one particular form thus the names of the mongol ladies introduced at page thirty two and thirty six of this volume which are in proper oriental form bulughan and kukachin appear in the class of manuscripts which pothier has followed as bulgara and kogatra in the manuscripts of Pepino's version, and those founded on it, including Ramusio, the names appear in the corrector forms Bolgana or Bolgana and Kojasin. Now all the forms Bolgana, Bolgana, Bulgara, and Kogatra, Kochasin, appear in the geographic text. Kaikatu Khan appears in the Pauthier manuscript as Chiato, in the Pepinian as Akatu, in the Ramusian as Chiacato. All three forms, Chiato, Achatu, and Chiacato, are found in the geographic text. The city of Kobanan appears in the Pothier manuscripts as Kobanant, in the Pepinian and Ramusian editions as Kobanam or Kobanan. Both forms are found in the geographic text. The city of the great Khan, Kanbalig, is called in the Pothier manuscripts Kambaluk, in the Pepinian and Ramusian, less correctly, Kambalu. Both forms appear in the geographic text. The aboriginal people on the Burmese frontier, who received from the western officers of the Mongols the Persian name, translated from that applied by the Chinese, of Zardendan, or gold teeth, appear in the Pothier manuscripts most accurately as Zardandan, but in the Pepinian as Ardandan, still further corrupted in some copies into Arcladam. Now both forms are found in the geographic text. Other examples might be given, but these I think may suffice to prove that this text was the common source of both classes. In considering the question of the French original too, we must remember what has been already said regarding Rusticien de Pisa and his other French writings, and we shall find hereafter an express testimony born in the next generation that Marco's book was composed in Vulgari Gallico. But, after all, the circumstantial evidence that has been adduced from the texts themselves is the most conclusive. We have then every reason to believe both that the work was written in French, and that an existing French text is a close representation of it as originally committed to paper 
and that being so we may cite some circumstances to show that the use of French or quasi-French for the purpose was not a fact of a very unusual or surprising nature. The French language had at that time almost as wide, perhaps relatively a wider, diffusion than it has now. It was still spoken at the court of England, and still used by many English writers, of whom the authors or translators of the Round Table Romances at Henry III's court are examples. In 1249, Alexander III, King of Scotland, at his coronation, spoke in Latin and French, and in 1291, the English Chancellor addressing the Scotch Parliament did so in French. At certain of the Oxford colleges, as late as 1328, it was in order that the students should converse colloquio latino vel saltum gallico. Late in the same century, Gower had not ceased to use French, composing many poems in it, though apologizing for his want of skill therein. At si je nai de François la Faconde, je suis en gloire, si quier le va estre excuse. Indeed, down to nearly 1385, boys in the English grammar schools were taught to construe their Latin lessons into French. St. Francis of Assisi is said by some of his biographers to have had his original name changed to Francesco because of his early mastery of that language as a qualification for commerce. French had been the prevalent tongue of the Crusaders, and was that of the numerous Frank courts which they established in the east, including Jerusalem and the states of the Syrian coast, Cyprus, Constantinople during the reign of the Cortines, and the principalities of the Morea. The Catalan soldier and chronicler Ramon de Mutaner tells us that it was commonly said of the Morean chivalry that they spoke as good French as at Paris. Quasi-French at least was still spoken half a century later by the numerous Christians settled at Aleppo, as John Marignoli testifies, and if we may trust Sir John Mondeville, the Soldan of Egypt himself and four of his chief lords, spoke French right well. Ghazan Khan, the accomplished Mongol sovereign of Persia, to whom our traveller conveyed a bride from Cambaluk, is said by the historian Rashid Dudin to have known something of the frank tongue, probably French. Nay, if we may trust the author of the romance of Richard Coeur de Lyon, French was in his day the language of still higher spheres. Nor was Polo's case an exceptional one, even among writers on the East who were not Frenchmen. Mondeville himself tells us that he put his book first, quote, out of Latin into French, end quote, and then out of French into English. The history of the East, which the Armenian prince and monk Hayton dictated to Nicolas Falcon at Poitiers in 1307, was taken down in French. There are many other instances of the employment of French by foreign, and especially by Italian authors of that age. The Latin chronicle of the Benedictine Amato of Monte Cassino was translated into French early in the 13th century by another monk of the same abbey, at the particular desire of the Count of Militre, or Malta, quote, pour ce qu'il s'est lire et attendre Françoise et s'endelite, end quote. Martino da Canale, a countryman and contemporary of Polo's, during the absence of the latter in the East, wrote a chronicle of Venice in the same language, as a reason for which he alleges its general popularity. The like does the most notable example of all, Brunetto Latini, Dante's master, who wrote in French his encyclopedic and once highly popular work, Le Tresor. Other examples might be given, but in fact such illustration is superfluous when we consider that Rusticiano himself was a compiler of French romances. But why the language of the book as we see it in the geographic text should be so much more rude, inaccurate, and Italianized than that of Rusticiano's other writings, is a question to which I can suggest no reply quite satisfactory to myself. Is it possible that we have in it a literal representation of Polo's own language in dictating the story, a rough draft which it was intended afterwards to reduce to better form, and which was so reduced, after a fashion, in French copies of another type, regarding which we shall have to speak presently, 
and if this be the true answer why should polo have used a french jargon in which to tell his story is it possible that his own mother venetian such as he had carried to the east with him and brought back again was so little intelligible to rusticiano that french of some kind was the handiest medium of communication between the two i have known an englishman and a hollander driven to converse in malay chinese christians of different provinces are said sometimes to take to english as the readiest means of intercommunication and the same is said even of irish-speaking irishmen from remote parts of the island it is worthy of remark how many notable narratives of the middle ages have been dictated instead of being written by their authors and that in cases where it is impossible to ascribe this to ignorance of writing the armenian hayton though evidently a well-read man possibly could not write in roman characters but joinville is an illustrious example and the narratives of four of the most famous medieval travellers seem to have been drawn from them by a kind of pressure and committed to paper by other hands i have elsewhere remarked this as indicating how little diffused was literary ambition or vanity but it would perhaps be more correct to ascribe it to that intense dislike which is still seen on the shores of the mediterranean to the use of pen and ink on certain of these shores at least there is scarcely any inconvenience that the majority of respectable and good-natured people will not tolerate inconvenience to their neighbours be it understood rather than put pen to paper for the purpose of preventing it end of section nine Section 10 of the Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 10 Various Types of Text of Marco Polo's Book In treating of the various texts of Polo's book, we must necessarily go into some irksome detail. Those texts that have come down to us may be classified under four principal types. 1. The first type is that of the geographic text of which we have already said so much, this is found nowhere complete except in the unique manuscript of the Paris Library, to which it is stated to have come from the old library of the French kings at Blois. But the Italian Crusca and the old Latin version, number 3195 of the Paris Library, published with the geographic text, are evidently derived entirely from it, though both are considerably abridged. It is also demonstrable that neither of these copies has been translated from the other, for each has passages which the other omits, but that both have been taken, the one as a copy more or less loose, the other as a translation, from the intermediate Italian copy. A special difference lies in the fact that the Latin version is divided into three books, whilst the Crusca has no such division. I shall show in a tabular form the filiation of the texts which these facts seem to demonstrate. See Appendix G. There are other Italian manuscripts of this type, some of which show signs of having been derived independently from the French, but I have not been able to examine any of them with the care needful to make specific deductions regarding them. 2. The next type is that of the French manuscripts on which M. Pathier's text is based, and for which he claims the highest authority as having had the mature revision and sanction of the traveller. There are, as far as I know, five manuscripts which may be classed together under this type, three in the great Paris library, one at Bern, and one in the Bodleian. The high claims made by Pathier on behalf of this class of manuscripts, on the first three of which his text is formed, rest mainly upon the kind of certificate which two of them bear regarding the presentation of a copy by Marco Polo to Thibault de Sepoy, which we have already quoted, supra page 69. 
This certificate is held by Pothier to imply that the original of the copies which bear it, and of those having a general correspondence with them, had the special seal of Marco's revision and approval. To some considerable extent their character is corroborative of such a claim, but they are far from having the perfection which Pothier attributes to them, and which leads him into many paradoxes. It is not possible to interpret rigidly the bearing of this so-called certificate, as if no copies had previously been taken of any form of the book, nor can we allow it to impugn the authenticity of the geographic text, which demonstratively represents an older original, and has been, as we have seen, the parent of all other versions, including some very old ones, Italian and Latin, which certainly owe nothing to this revision. The first idea apparently entertained by Davisac and Pauline Paris was that the geographic text was itself the copy given to the Sieur de Sepoy, and that the differences in the copies of the class which we describe as type two merely resulted from the modifications which would naturally arise in the process of transcription into purer French. But closer examination showed the differences to be too great and too marked to admit of this explanation. These differences consist not only in the conversion of the rude, obscure, and half-Italian language of the original into good French of the period, there is also very considerable curtailment, generally of tautology, but also extending often to circumstances of substantial interest, whilst we observe the omission of a few notably erroneous statements or expressions, and a few insertions of small importance. None of the manuscripts of this class contain more than a few of the historical chapters which we have formed into Book Four. The only addition, of any magnitude, is that chapter which in our translation forms chapter 21 of Book Two. It will be seen that it contains no new facts, but is only a tedious recapitulation of circumstances already stated, though scattered over several chapters. There are a few minor additions. I have not thought it worth while to collect them systematically here, but two or three examples are given in a note. There are also one or two corrections of erroneous statements in the GT, which seem not to be accidental, and to indicate some attempt at revision. Thus a notable error in the account of Aden, which seems to conceive of the Red Sea as a river, disappears in Pothier's manuscripts A and B. And we find in these manuscripts one or two interesting names preserved, which are not found in the older text. But on the other hand, this class of manuscripts contains many erroneous readings of names, either adopting the worst of two forms occurring in the GT, or originating blunders of its own. Monsieur Pothier lays great stress on the character of these manuscripts as the sole authentic form of the work, from their claim to have been specially revised by Marco Polo. It is evident, however, from what has been said, that this revision can have been only a very careless and superficial one, and must have been done in great measure by deputy, being almost entirely confined to curtailment, and to the improvement of the expression, and that it is by no means such as to allow an editor to dispense with a careful study of the older text. There is another curious circumstance about the manuscripts of this type, that is, that they clearly divide into two distinct recensions, of which both have so many peculiarities and errors in common, that they must necessarily have been both derived from one modification of the original text, whilst at the same time there are such differences between the two as cannot be set down to the accidents of transcription. Pothier's manuscripts A and B, numbers 16 and 15 of the list in Appendix F, form one of these subdivisions. His C, number 17 of list, Byrne, number 56, and Oxford, number 6, the other. Between A and B, the differences are only such as seem constantly to have arisen from the whims of transcribers or their dialectic peculiarities. But between A and B on the one side, and C on the other, the differences are much greater. The readings of proper names in C are often superior, sometimes worse. But in the latter half of the work especially, it contains a number of substantial passages which are to be found in the GT, but are altogether absent from the manuscripts A and B, whilst in one case at least, 
the history of the siege of Sianfu, volume two page one fifty nine it converges considerably from the g t as well as from a and b i gather from the facts that the manuscript c represents an older form of the work than a and b i should judge that the latter had been derived from that older form but intentionally modified from it and as it is the manuscript c with its copy at Bern, that alone presents the certificate of derivation from the book given to the sieur de sepoy there can be no doubt that it is the true representative of that recension three the next type of text is that found in friar Pepino's latin version it is the type of which manuscripts are by far the most numerous in it condensation and curtailment are carried a good deal further than in type two the work is also divided into three books but this division does not seem to have originated with Pepino, as we find it in the ruder and perhaps older latin version of which we have already spoken under type one and we have demonstrated that this ruder latin is a translation from an italian copy it is probable therefore that an italian version similarly divided was the common source of what we call the geographic latin and of Pepino's more condensed version Pepino's version appears to have been executed in the latter years of polo's life but i can see no ground for the idea entertained by baldelli boni and professor bianconi that it was executed with polo's cognizance and retouched by him the absence of effective publication in the middle ages led to a curious complication of translation and retranslation thus the latin version published by grineus in the novus orbis basil fifteen thirty two is different from pepino's and yet clearly traceable to it as a base in fact it is a retranslation into latin from some version marsden thinks the printed portuguese one of pepino it introduces many minor modifications omitting specific statements of numbers and values generalizing the names and descriptions of specific animals exhibiting frequent sialism and self-sufficiency in modifying statements which the editor disbelieved it is therefore utterly worthless as a text and it is curious that andreas muller who in the seventeenth century devoted himself to the careful editing of polo should have made so unfortunate a choice as to reproduce this fifth-hand translation i may add that the french editions published in the middle of the sixteenth century are translations from grineus hence they complete this curious and vicious circle of translation french italian pepino's latin portuguese grineus's latin french four we now come to a type of text which deviates largely from any of those hitherto spoken of and the history and true character of which are involved in a cloud of difficulty we mean that italian version prepared for the press by g b ramusio with most interesting though as we have seen not always accurate preliminary dissertations and published at venice two years after his death in the second volume of the navigazioni e viaggi the peculiarities of this version are very remarkable ramusio seems to imply that he used as one basis at least the latin of Pepino, and many circumstances such as the division into books the absence of the terminal historical chapters and of those about the magi and the form of many proper names confirm this but also many additional circumstances and anecdotes are introduced many of the names assume a new shape and the whole style is more copious and literary in character than in any other form of the work whilst some of the changes or interpolations seem to carry us further from the truth others contain facts of asiatic nature or history as well as of polo's own experiences which it is extremely difficult to ascribe to any hand but the traveller's own this was the view taken by baldelli klaproth and newman but hugh murray lazari and bartoli regard the changes as interpolations by another hand and lazari is rash enough to ascribe the whole to a rifacimento of ramusio's own age asserting it to contain interpolations not merely from polo's own contemporary hayton but also from travellers of later centuries such as conti barbosa and pigafetta the grounds for these last assertions have not been cited 
nor can I trace them. But I admit to a certain extent indications of modern tampering with the text, especially in cases where proper names seem to have been identified and more modern forms substituted. In days, however, where an editor's duties are ill understood, this was natural. Thus we find substituted for the Bastra, or Baskra, of the older texts, the more modern and incorrect Balsora, dear to memories of the Arabian Nights. Among the provinces of Persia we have Span, Ispahan, where older texts read Istanit. For Kormos we have Ormus, for Herminia and Laias, Armenia and Giasa, Kulam for the older Koilum, Sokotera for Skotra. With these changes may be classed the chapter headings, which are undisguisedly modern and probably Ramusio's own. In some other cases this editorial spirit has been over-meddlesome and has gone astray. Thus Malabar is substituted wrongly for Mabar in one place, and by a grosser error for Dalivar in another. The age of young Marco, at the time of his father's first return to Venice, has been arbitrarily altered from fifteen to nineteen, in order to correspond with a date which is itself erroneous. Thus also Polo is made to describe Ormus as on an island, contrary to the old texts and to the fact, for the city of Hormuz was not transferred to the island, afterwards so famous, till some years after Polo's return from the east. It is probably also the editor who in the notice of the oil springs of Caucasus, volume 1, page 46, has substituted camel loads for ship loads, in ignorance that the site of those alluded to was probably Baku on the Caspian. Other erroneous statements, such as the introduction of window glass as one of the embellishments of the palace at Cambaloc, are probably due only to accidental misunderstanding. Of circumstances certainly genuine, which are peculiar to this edition of Polo's work, and which it is difficult to assign to any one but himself, we may note the specification of the woods east of Yezd as composed of date trees, volume 1, pages 88 and 89, the unmistakable allusion to the subterranean irrigation channels of Persia, page 123, the accurate explanation of the term Mulahet, applied to the sect of assassins, page 139 to 142, the mention of the lake, Syracul, on the plateau of Pamer, of the wolves that prey on the wild sheep, and of the piles of wild ram's horns used as landmarks in the snow, pages 171 to 177. To the description of the Tibetan yak, which is in all the texts, Ramusio's version alone adds a fact probably not recorded again until the present century, that is, that it is the practice to cross the yak with the common cow, page 274. Ramusio alone notices the prevalence of the guatre at Yarkland, confirmed by recent travellers, volume 1, page 187, the vermilion seal of the great Khan imprinted on the paper currency, which may be seen in our plate of a Chinese note, page 426, the variation in Chinese dialects, volume 2, page 236, the division of the hulls of junks into watertight compartments, volume 2, page 249, the introduction into China from Egypt of the art of refining sugar, volume 2, page 226. Ramusio's account of the position of the city of Sindafu, Cheng Tu Fu, encompassed and intersected by many branches of a great river, volume 2, page 40, is much more just than that in the old text which speaks of but one river through the middle of the city. The intelligent notices of the Khan's charities, as originated by his adoption of idolatry or Buddhism, of the astrological superstitions of the Chinese, and of the manners and character of the latter nation, are found in Ramusio alone. To whom but Marco himself, or one of his party, can we refer the brief but vivid picture of the delicious atmosphere and scenery of the Badakhshan Plateaus, volume 1, page 158, and of the benefit that Messer Marco's health derived from a visit to them. In this version alone again, we have an account of the oppressions exercised by Kublai's Mohammedan minister Ahmad, telling how the Cathayans rose against him and murdered him, with the addition that Messer Marco was on the spot when all this happened. 
now not only is the whole story in substantial accordance with the chinese annals even to the name of the chief conspirator but those annals also tell of the courageous frankness of quote, polo assessor of the privy council end quote, in opening the khan's eyes to the truth many more such examples might be adduced but these will suffice it is true that many of the passages peculiar to the ramusian version and indeed the whole version show a freer utterance and more of a literary faculty than we should attribute to polo judging from the earlier texts it is possible however that this may be almost if not entirely due to the fact that the version is the result of a double translation and probably of an editorial fusion of several documents processes in which angularities of expression would be dissolved though difficulties will certainly remain the most probable explanation of the origin of this text seems to me to be some such hypothesis as the following i suppose that polo in his latter years added with his own hand supplementary notes and reminiscences marginally or otherwise to a copy of his book that these perhaps in his lifetime more probably after his death were digested and translated into latin and that ramusio or some friend of his in retranslating and fusing them with peppino's version for the navigazioni made those minor modifications in names and other matters which we have already noticed the mere facts of digestion from memoranda and double translation would account for a good deal of unintentional corruption that more than one version was employed in the composition of ramusio's edition we have curious proof in at least one passage of the latter we have pointed out at page four hundred ten of this volume a curious example of misunderstanding of the old french text a passage in which the term roi de Pelaine, or king of furs is applied to the sable and which in the crusca has been converted into an imaginary tartar phrase le roi de Pelame, or as peppino makes it ronde another indication that peppino's version and the crusca passed through a common medium but ramusio exhibits both the true reading and the perversion eli tatari la chiamano regina delle pelli there is the true reading egli animali si chiamano ronde and there the perverted one we may further remark that ramusio's version betrays indications that one of its bases either was in the venetian dialect or had passed through that dialect for a good many of the names appear in venetian forms for example, substituting the S for the sound of CH, J, or soft G, as in Gosa, Sorsania, Sagate, Gonsa, for Joju, Quensanfu, Koigansu, Tapinsu, Zipangu, Ziamba. To sum up, it is, I think, beyond reasonable dispute that we have, in what we call the geographic text, as nearly as may be an exact transcript of the traveller's words as originally taken down in the prison of genoa we have again in the manuscripts of the second type an edition pruned and refined probably under instructions from marco polo but not with any critical exactness and lastly i believe that we have embedded in the ramusian edition the supplementary recollections of the traveller noted down at a latter period of his life but perplexed by repeated translation compilation and editorial mishandling and the most important remaining problem in regard to the text of polo's work is the discovery of the supplemental manuscript from which ramusio derived those passages which are found only in his edition it is possible that it may still exist but no trace of it in anything like completeness has yet been found though when my task was all but done i discovered a small part of the ramusian peculiarities in a manuscript at venice whilst upon this subject of manuscripts of our author i will give some particulars regarding a very curious one containing a version of the irish language this remarkable document is found in the book of lismore belonging to the duke of devonshire that magnificent book finely written on vellum of the largest size was discovered in eighteen fourteen enclosed in a wooden box along with a superb crozier on opening a closed doorway in the castle of lismore it contained lives of the saints 
the romance history of charlemagne the history of the lombards histories and tales of irish wars etc etc and among the other matter this version of marco polo a full account of this book and its mutilations will be found in o'curry's lectures on the manuscript materials of ancient irish history page 196 and following dublin 1861 the book of lismore was written about 1460 for fingon mccarthy and his wife catherine fitzgerald daughter of gerald eighth earl of desmond the date of the translation of polo is not known but it may be supposed to have been executed about the above date probably in the monastery of lismore county of waterford from the extracts that have been translated for me it is obvious that the version was made with an outstanding freedom certainly from friar francesco peppino's latin both beginning and end are missing but what remains opens thus compare it with friar peppino's real prologue as we give it in the appendix kings and chieftains of that city there was then in the city a princely friar in the habit of saint francis named franciscus who was versed in many languages he was brought to the place where those nobles were and they requested of him to translate the book from the tartar into the latin language it is an abomination to me said he to devote my mind or labor to works of idolatry and irreligion they entreated him again it shall be done said he for though it be an irreligious narrative that is related therein yet the things are miracles of the true god and every one who hears this much against the holy faith shall pray fervently for their conversion and he who will not pray shall waste the vigor of his body to convert them i am not in dread of this book of marcus for there is no lie in it my eyes beheld him bringing the relics of the holy church with him and he left his testimony whilst tasting of death that it was true and marcus was a devout man what is there in it then but that franciscus translated this book of marcus from the tartar into latin and the years of the lord at that time were fifteen years two score two hundred and one thousand twelve fifty five it then describes armain beck little armenia armain moor great armenia musul tarisius persida Kamandi, and so forth the last chapter is that on abaskia abaskia also is an extensive country under the government of seven kings four of whom worship the true god and each of them wears a golden cross on his forehead and they are valiant in battle having been brought up fighting against the gentiles of the other three kings who are unbelievers and idolaters and the kingdom of aden a sudan rules over them the king of abaskia once took a notion to make a pilgrimage to the sepulchre of jesus not at all said his nobles and warriors to him for we should be afraid lest the infidels through whose territories you would have to pass should kill you there is a holy bishop with you said they send him to the sepulchre of jesus and much gold with him the rest is wanting end of section ten of the book of sir marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by anna simon the book of sir marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by rusticello da pisa translated by henry yule introductory notices part eleven some estimate of the character of polo and his book that marco polo has been so universally recognized as the king of medieval travellers is due rather to the width of his experience the vast compass of his journeys and the romantic nature of his personal history than to transcendent superiority of character or capacity the generation immediately preceding his own has bequeathed to us in the report of the franciscan friar william de rubriqui on the mission with which st louis charged him to the tartar courts the narrative of one great journey which in its rich detail its vivid pictures its acuteness of observation and strong good sense seems to me to form a book of travels of much higher claims than any one series of polo's chapters a book indeed which has never had justice done to it 
for it has few superiors in the whole library of travel. Enthusiastic biographers, beginning with Ramusio, have placed Polo on the same platform with Columbus, but where has our Venetian traveller left behind him any trace of the genius and lofty enthusiasm, the ardent and justified previsions which marked the great admiral as one of the lights of the human race? It is a juster praise that the spur which his book eventually gave to geographical studies, and the beacons which it hung out at the eastern extremities of the earth, helped to guide the aims, though scarcely to kindle the fire, of the greater son of the rival republic. His work was at least a link in the providential chain which at last dragged the new world to light. Surely Marco's real, indisputable, and in their kind unique claims to glory may suffice. He was the first traveller to trace a route across the whole longitude of Asia, naming and describing kingdom after kingdom which he had seen with his own eyes, the deserts of Persia the flowering plateau and wild gorges of Baraksan, the jade-bearing rivers of Khotan, the Mongolian steppes, cradle of the power that had so lately threatened to swallow up Christendom, the new and brilliant court that had been established at Kambaluk, the first traveller to reveal China in all its wealth and vastness, its mighty rivers, its huge cities, its rich manufacturers, its swarming population, the inconceivably vast fleets that quickened its seas and its inland waters, to tell us of the nations on its borders with all their eccentricities of manners and worship, of Tibet with its sordid devotees, of Burma with its golden pagodas and their tinkling crowns, of Laos, of Siam, of Cochin China, of Japan, the eastern Thule with its rosy pearls and golden-roofed palaces, the first to speak of that museum of beauty and wonder, still so imperfectly ransacked, the Indian archipelago, source of those aromatics then so highly prized and whose origin was so dark, of Java, the pearl of islands, of Sumatra, with its many kings, its strange costly products, and its cannibal races, of the naked savages of Nicobar and Andaman, of Ceylon, the Isle of Gems, with its sacred mountain and its tomb of Adam, of India the Great, not as a dreamland of Alexandrian fables, but as a country seen and partially explored, with its virtuous Brahmans, its obscene ascetics, its diamonds, and the strange tales of their acquisition, its sea-beds of pearl, and its powerful sun. The first in medieval times to give any distinct account of the secluded Christian empire of Abyssinia, and the semi-Christian island of Socotra, to speak, though indeed dimly, of Zanjibar, with its negroes and its ivory, and of the vast and distant Madagascar, bordering on the dark ocean of the south, with its rook and other monstrosities, and, in a remotely opposite region, of Siberia and the Arctic Ocean, of dog sledges, white bears, and reindeer-riding tunguses. That all this rich catalogue of discoveries should belong to the revelations of one man and one book is surely ample ground enough to account for and to justify the author's high place in the role of fame, and there can be no need to exaggerate his greatness, or to invest him with imaginary attributes. What manner of man was Sir Marco? It is a question hard to answer. Some critics cry out against personal detail in books of travel, but as regards him, who would not welcome a little more egotism. In his book, impersonality is carried to excess, and we are often driven to discern by indirect and doubtful indications alone whether he is speaking of a place from personal knowledge or only from hearsay. In truth, though there are delightful exceptions, and nearly every part of the book suggests interesting questions, a desperate meagerness and boldness does extend over considerable tracts of the story. In fact, his book reminds us sometimes of his own description of Corazan. On chevange par beaux plans and belles costières, là où il a molle, beau arbage et bon pasture et fruits assez. Et aucune fois il trouve l'an un désert de soixante mille au demain. Est-ce quel désert ne trouve l'an point d'eau, mais la convient porter au lui? Still, some shadowy image of the man may be seen in the book, a practical man, brave, shrewd, prudent, 
keen in affairs and never losing his interest in mercantile details, very fond of the chase, sparing of speech, with a deep wandering respect for saints, even though they be pagan saints, and their asceticism, but a contempt for patterns and such like, whose consciences would not run in customary grooves, and on his own part a keen appreciation of the world's pomps and vanities. See, on the one hand, his undisguised admiration of the hard life and long fastings of Sakya Muni, and on the other, how enthusiastic he gets in speaking of the great Khan's command of the good things of the world, but above all, of his matchless opportunities of sport. Of humour there are hardly any signs in his book. His almost solitary joke, I know but one more, and it pertains to the Uk Anekonta, occurs in speaking of the Khan's paper money, when he observes that Kublai might be said to have the true philosopher's stone, for he made his money at pleasure out of the bark of trees. Even the oddest eccentricities of outlandish tribes scarcely seem to disturb his gravity, as when he relates in his brief way of the people called Gold Teeth on the frontier of Burma, that ludicrous custom which Mr. Tyler has so well illustrated under the name of the Kuvad. There is more savour of laughter in the few lines of a Greek epic which relate precisely the same custom of a people on the Euxine. In the Tiberinian land, when some good woman bears her lord a babe, tis he is swathered and groaning put to bed, whilst she, arising, tends his bath, and serves nice possets for her husband in the stroll. Of scientific notions, such as we find in the unveracious Mondeville, we have no trace in truthful Marco. The former, lying with the circumstance, tells us boldly that he was in thirty-three degrees of south latitude. The latter is full of wonder that some of the Indian islands where he had been lay so far to the south that he lost sight of the pole star. When it rises again on his horizon, he estimates the latitude by the pole stars being so many cubits high. So the gallant Baber speaks of the sun having mounted spear high when the onset of battle began at Paniput. Such expressions convey no notion at all to such as have had their ideas sophisticated by angular perceptions of altitude, but similar expressions are common among Orientals, and indeed I have heard them from educated Englishmen. In another place, Marco states regarding certain islands in the northern ocean that they lie so very far to the north that in going thither one actually leaves the pole star of trifle behind towards the south, a statement to which we know only one parallel, to wit, in the voyage of that adventurous Dutch skipper who told Master Moxon, King Charles II's hydrographer, that he had sailed two degrees beyond the pole. The book, however, is full of bearings and distances and I have thought it worth while to construct a map from its indications in order to get some approximation to Polo's own idea of the face of that world which he had traversed so extensively. There are three allusions to maps in the course of his work. In his own bearings, at least on land journeys, he usually carries as long a great general traverse line, without much caring about small changes of direction. Thus, on the great outward journey from the frontier of Persia to that of China, the line runs almost continuously entre Levant et Grec, or east-north-east. In his journey from Kambaluk or Peking to Mien or Burma, it is always Ponent or West, and in that from Peking to Zeiton in Fokien, the port of embarkation for India, it is Skelok or Southeast. The line of bearings in which he deviates most widely from truth is that of the cities on the Arabian coast from Aden to Hormuz, which he makes to run steadily first Maestra, or northwest, a conception which it has not been very easy to realize on the map. In the early part of the book we are told that Marco acquired several of the languages current in the Mongol Empire, and no less than four written characters. We have discussed what these are likely to have been, and have given a decided opinion that Chinese was not one of them. Besides intrinsic improbability, and positive indications of Marco's ignorance of Chinese, in no respect is his book so defective as in regard to Chinese manners and peculiarities. The Great Wall is never mentioned, though we have shown reason for believing that it was in his mind when one passage of his book was dictated. The use of tea, though he travelled through the tea districts of Fokien, is never mentioned. The compressed feet of the women and the employment of the fishing cormorant, both mentioned by Friar Oderic, the contemporary of his later years, artificial egg-hatching, 
printing of books, though the notice of this art seems positively challenged in his account of paper money. Besides a score of remarkable arts and customs which one would have expected to recur to his memory are never alluded to. Neither does he speak of the great characteristic of the Chinese writing. It is difficult to account for these omissions, especially considering the comparative fullness with which he treats the manners of the Tartars and of the southern Hindus, but the impression remains that his associations in China were chiefly with foreigners. Wherever the place he speaks of had a Tartar or Persian name, he uses that rather than the Chinese one. Thus, Katai, Kambaluk, Polisangin, Tangut, Shaganur, Sayanfu, Kenyanfu, Tenduk, Akbalek, Karyan, Sardandan, Zaitan, Kemensu, Brios, Karamoran, Chorja, Juju, are all Mongol, Turkey, or Persian forms, though all have Chinese equivalents. In reference to the then recent history of Asia, Marco is often inaccurate. For example, in his account of the death of Gingis, in the list of his successors, and in his statement of the relationship between notable members of that house. But the most perplexing knot in the whole book lies in the interesting account which he gives of the siege of Siamfu or Xianyang during the subjugation of southern China by Kublai. I have entered on this matter in the notes, and will only say here that M. Potier's solution of the difficulty is no solution, being absolutely inconsistent with the story as told by Marco himself, and that I see none, though I have so much faith in Marco's veracity that I am loath to believe that the facts admit of no reconciliation. Our feign attempt to appreciate some of Marco's qualities, as gathered from his work, will seem far below the very high estimates that have been pronounced, not only by some who have delighted rather to enlarge upon his frame than to make themselves acquainted with his work, but also by persons whose studies and opinions have been worthy of all respect. Our estimate, however, does not abate a jot of our intense interest in his book and affection for his memory. And we have a strong feeling that, owing partly to his reticence, and partly to the great disadvantages under which the book was committed to writing, we have in it a singularly imperfect image of the man. A question naturally suggests itself, how far Polo's narrative, at least in its expression, was modified by passing under the pen of a professed literature of somewhat humble claims, such as Rusticiano was. The case is not a singular one, and in our own day the ill-judged use of such assistance has been fatal to the reputation of an adventurous traveller. We have, however, already expressed our own view that in the geographic text we have the nearest possible approach to a photographic impression of Marco's oral narrative. If there be an exception to this, we should seek it in the descriptions of battles, in which we find the narrator to fall constantly into a certain vein of bombastic commonplaces, which look like the stock phrases of a professed romancer, and which indeed have a strong resemblance to the actual phraseology of certain metrical romances. Whether this feature be due to Rusticiano I cannot say, but I have not been able to trace anything of the same character in a cursory inspection of some of his romance compilations. Still, one finds it impossible to conceive of our sober and reticent Messer Marco pacing the floor of his Genoese dungeon, and seven times over rolling out this magniloquent bombast with sufficient deliberation to be overtaken by the pen of the faithful amanuensis. On the other hand, though Marco, who had left home at fifteen years of age, naturally shows very few signs of reading, there are indications that he had read romances, especially those dealing with the fabulous adventures of Alexander. To these he refers explicitly or tacitly in his notices of the Iron Gate and of Gog and Magog, in his allusions to the marriage of Alexander with Darius's daughter, and to the battle between those two heroes, and in his repeated mention of the Arbre Sol, or Arbre Sec, on the Khorasan frontier. The key to these allusions is to be found in that legendary history of Alexander, entirely distinct from the true history of the Macedonian conqueror, which in great measure took the place of the latter in the imagination of East and West for more than a thousand years. This fabulous history is believed to be of Greco-Egyptian origin, and in its earliest extent a compiled form in the Greek of the pseudo calestines can be traced back to at least about A.D. 200. From the Greek, its marvels spread eastward at an early date. Some part, at least, of their matter was known to Moses of Corinne, in the 5th century. They were translated into Armenian, Arabic, Hebrew, and Syriac, 
and were reproduced in the verses of Ferdusi and various other Persian poets, spreading eventually even to the Indian archipelago, and finding utterance in Malay and Siamese. At an early date they had been rendered into Latin by Julius Valerius, but this work had probably been lost sight of, and it was in the tenth century that they were re-imported from Byzantium to Italy by the archpriest Leo, who had gone as envoy to the eastern capital from John, Duke of Campania. Romantic histories on this foundation, in verse and prose, became diffused in all the languages of Western Europe, from Spain to Scandinavia, rivaling in popularity the romantic cycles of the Round Table or of Charlemagne. Nor did this popularity cease till the sixteenth century was well advanced. The heads of most of the medieval travellers were crammed with these fables as genuine history, and by the help of that community of legend on this subject which they found wherever Mohammedan literature had spread, Alexander Magnus was to be traced everywhere in Asia. Friar Odoric found Tana near Bombay to be the veritable city of King Porus. John Magnoli's vain glory led him to imitate King Alexander in setting up a marble column in the corner of the world over against Paradise, that is, somewhere on the coast of Travancore, whilst Sir John Mondeville, with a cheaper ambition, borrowed wonders of the travels of Alexander to adorn his own. Nay, even in after days, when the Portuguese stumbled with amazement on those vast ruins in Cambodia, which have so lately become familiar to us through the works of Maud, Thompson, and Garnier, they ascribed them to Alexander. Prominent in all these stories is the tale of Alexander's shutting up a score of impure nations, at the head of which were Gog and Magog, within a barrier of impassable mountains, there to await the latter days, a legend with which the disturbed mind of Europe not unnaturally connected that cataclysm of unheard-of pagans that seemed about to deluge Christendom in the first half of the thirteenth century. In these stories also the beautiful Roxana, who becomes the bride of Alexander, is Darius's daughter, bequeathed to his arms by the dying monarch. Conspicuous among them, again, is the legend of the oracular trees of the sun and moon, which with audible voice foretell the place and manner of Alexander's death. With this Alexandrian legend some of the later forms of the story had mixed up one of Christian origin about the dry tree, l'arbre sec, and they had also adopted the oriental story of the land of darkness and the mode of escape from it, which Polo relates, at page 484 of volume 2. We have seen in the most probable interpretation of the nickname Milioni that Polo's popular reputation in his lifetime was of a questionable kind, and a contemporary chronicler, already quoted, has told us how on his deathbed the traveller was begged by anxious friends to retract his extraordinary stories. A little later, one who copied the book Per Passare Tempo e Malinconia says frankly that he puts no faith in it. Sir Thomas Brown is content to carry a wary eye in reading Paulus Venetus, but others of our countrymen in the last century express strong doubts whether he ever was in Tartary or China. Marden's edition might well have extinguished the last sparks of scepticism. Hammer meant praise in calling Polo der Vater orientalischer Hodogetik, in spite of the uncouthness of the eulogy. But another grave German writer, ten years after Marston's publication, put forth in a serious book that the whole story was a clumsy imposture. End of section 11《The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Ricicello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yu. Introductory Notices, Part 12. Contemporary Recognition of Polo and His Book But we must return for a little to Polo's own times. Ramusio states, as we have seen, that immediately after the first commission of Polo's narrative to writing, in Latin, as he imagined, many copies of it were made, 
it was translated into the vulgar tongue, and in a few months all Italy was full of it. The few facts that we can collect do not justify this view of the rapid and diffused renown of the traveller and his book. The number of manuscripts of the letter, dating from the fourteenth century, is no doubt considerable, but a large portion of these are of Peppino's condensed Latin translation, which was not put forth, if we can trust Ramusio, till 1320, and certainly not much earlier. The whole number of manuscripts in various languages that we have been able to register amounts to about 80. I find it difficult to obtain statistical data as to the comparative number of copies of different works existing in manuscript. With Dante's great poem, of which there are reckoned close upon 500 manuscripts, comparison would be inappropriate. But of the travels of Friar Odoric, a poor work indeed beside Marco Polo's, I reckoned thirty-nine manuscripts, and could now add at least three more to the list. I described seventy-three in my edition of Odoric, H.C. Also, I find that of the nearly contemporary work of Brunetto Latini, the Tresor, a sort of condensed encyclopedia of knowledge, but a work which one would scarcely have expected to approach the popularity of Polo's book, the editor enumerates some fifty manuscripts. And from the great frequency with which one encounters in catalogues both manuscripts and early printed editions of Sir John Mandeville, I should suppose that the lying wonders of our English knight had a far greater popularity and more extensive diffusion than the voracious and more sober marvels of Polo. To southern Italy, Polo's popularity certainly does not seem at any time to have extended. I cannot learn that any manuscript of his book exists in any library of the late kingdom of Naples or in Sicily. Dante, who lived for twenty-three years after Marco's work was written, and who touches so many things in the seen and unseen world, never alludes to Polo, nor, I think, to anything that can be connected with his book. I believe that no mention of Cathay occurs in the Divina Commedia. That distant region is indeed mentioned more than once in the poems of a humbler contemporary, Francesco da Barberino. There is nothing in his allusions besides this name to suggest any knowledge of Polo's work. Neither can I discover any trace of Polo or his work in that of his contemporary and countryman, Marino Sanudo the Elder, though this worthy is well acquainted with the somewhat later work of Hayton, and many of the subjects which he touches in his own book would seem to challenge a reference to Marco's labours. Of contemporary or nearly contemporary references to our traveller by name, the following are all that I can produce, and none of them are new. First, there is the notice regarding his presentation of his book to Thibaut de Sepoy, of which we need say no more. Next, there is the preface to Friar Pipino's translation, which we give at length in the appendix, E, to these notices. The phraseology of this appears to imply that Marco was still alive, and this agrees with the date assigned to the work by Romusio. Pipino was also the author of a chronicle, of which a part was printed by Muratori, and this contains chapters on the Tartar wars, the destruction of the old man of the mountain, etc., derived from Polo. A passage not printed by Muratori has been extracted by Professor Bianconi from a manuscript of this chronicle in the Modena Library, and runs as follows, quote, The matters which follow concerning the magnificence of the Tartar emperors, whom in their language they call Chan, as we have said, are related by Marcus Paulus the Venetian in a certain book of his, which has been translated by me into Latin out of the Lombardic vernacular, having gained the notice of the emperor himself and become attached to his service, he passed nearly twenty-seven years in the Tartar countries. End quote. Again, we have that mention of Marco by Friar Jacopo d'Acqui, which we have quoted in connection with his capture by the Genoese at page 54, and the Florentine historian Giovanni Vellani when alluding to the Tartars, says, quote, Let him who would make full acquaintance with their history examine the book of Friar Hayton, 
lord of Kolkos in Armenia, which he made at the instance of Pope Clement V, and also the book called Milione, which was made by Messer Marco Polo of Venice, who tells much about their power and dominion, having spent a long time among them. And so let us quit the Tartars and return to our subject, the history of Florence. End quote. Lastly, we learn from a curious passage in a medical work by Pietro of Abano, a celebrated physician and philosopher, and a man of Polo's own generation, that he was personally acquainted with the traveller. In a discussion on the old notion of the non-habitability of the equatorial regions which Pietro controverts, he says, quote, In the country of the Zinji there is seen a star as big as a sack. I know a man who has seen it, and he told me it had a faint light like a piece of a cloud, and is always in the south. I have been told of this and other matters by Marco the Venetian, the most extensive traveller and the most diligent inquirer whom I have ever known. He saw this same star under the Antarctic. He described it as having a great tail, and drew a figure of it thus. He also told me that he saw the Antarctic pole at an altitude above the earth apparently equal to the length of a soldier's lance, whilst the arctic pole was as much below the horizon. Tis from that place, he says, that they export to Escamfa, line alloys, and Brazil. He says the heat there is intense, and the habitations few, and these things he witnessed in a certain island at which he arrived by sea. He tells me also that there are wild men there, and also certain very great rams that have very coarse and stiff wool, just like the bristles of our pigs. End quote. In addition to these five, I know no other contemporary references to Polo, nor indeed any other within the fourteenth century, though such there must surely be, excepting in a chronicle written after the middle of that century by John of Ypres, abbot of St. Bertin, otherwise known as Friar John the Long, and himself a person of very high merit in the history of travel, as a precursor of the Ramusius, Hakluys, and Purchases, for he collected together and translated, when needful, into French all of the most valuable works of Eastern travel and geography produced in the age immediately preceding his own. In his chronicle, the abbot speaks at some length of the adventures of the Polo family, concluding with a passage to which we have already had occasion to refer. Quote, and so Messrs. Nicolaus and Mafias, with certain Tartars, were sent a second time to these parts. But Marcus Pauli was retained by the Emperor and employed in his military service, abiding with him for a space of twenty-seven years. And the Khan, on account of his ability, dispatched him upon affairs of his to various parts of Tartary and India, and the islands, on which journeys he beheld many of the marvels of those regions and concerning these he afterwards composed a book in the French vernacular, which said book of marvels, with others of the same kind, we do possess. End quote. Thesaurus Novo Anecdote, 3, 747. There is, however, a notable work which is ascribed to a rather early date in the 14th century, and which, though it contains no reference to Polo by name, shows a thorough acquaintance with his book, and borrows themes largely from it. This is the poetical romance of Baudouin de Sebourg, an exceedingly clever and vivacious production, partaking largely of that bantering, half-mocking spirit which is, I believe, characteristic of many of the later medieval French romances. Baudouin is a knight who, after a very wild and loose youth, goes through an extraordinary series of adventures, displaying great faith and courage, and eventually becomes king of Jerusalem. I will cite some of the traits evidently derived from our traveller, which I have met with in a short examination of this curious work. Baudouin, embarked on a dromond in the Indian Sea, is wrecked in the territory of Baudas, and near a city called Falis, which stands on the river of Baudas. The people of this city were an unbelieving race. Quote, Il ne crayon Dieu, Mahon, ne tervogan, idole, crucifice, diable, ne tyran. End quote. Page 300. 
Their only belief was this, that when a man died, a great fire should be made beside his tomb, in which should be burned all his clothes, arms, and necessary furniture, whilst his horse and servant should be put to death, and then the dead man would have the benefit of all these useful properties in the other world. Moreover, if it was the king that died, quote, C'est le roi de la terre y a loi trespassant. Si façon ont tué, huit jours et un tenant, tous chiots sont en contrat par la chité passant, pour tenir compagnie le seigneur suffisant. Tell us toi le créange ou paix dont je quand. End quote. Page 301. Baudin arrives when the king has been dead three days, and through dread of this custom all the people of the city are shut up in their houses. He enters an inn and helps himself to a vast repast, having been fasting for three days. He is then seized and carried before the king, Polybans by name. We might have quoted this prince at page 87 as an instance of the diffusion of the French tongue. Quote, Polyban sauf François car on le doctrina. Je renoué de France sept ans y demora, qu'il l'y apprit François, si que bel an parla. End quote. Page 309. Baudouin exclaims against their barbarous belief, and declares the Christian doctrine to the king, who acknowledges good points in it, but concludes, quote, Façon, dit Polyban, à le chier hardier, Je ne créerai, vous Dieu, à nul jour de ma vie, ni votre loi ne vaut un pomme pourri. End quote. Page 311. Baudouin proposes to prove his faith by fighting the prince, himself unarmed, the latter with all his arms. The prince agrees, but is rather dismayed at Baudouin's confidence, and desires his followers, in case of his own death, to burn with him horses, armour, etc., asking at the same time which of them would consent to burn along with him, in order to be his companions in the other world. Quote, Là en un ou deux dont casquin s'excria, nous mourons volontiers quand vos corps morts sera. End quote. Page 313. Baudouin's prayer for help is miraculously granted. Polybans is beaten and converted by a vision. He tells Baudouin that in his neighborhood, beyond Bauda, quote, Ou cinq lieux, ou six, chez un fel prince, orgueilleux et despice, de la rouge montagne et prince et marchis, or vous direz comment il a ses gens nourris. Je vous dis, que je roi a fait un paradis, tant noble et gracieuse, et plein de tels délits. Car en ce paradis est un rié établi, qui se partit en trois, en ce noble pourpris, en l'un cœur lit claré, d'espice bien garni, et en l'autre le mier, qui les a ressoufis. Et l'ivain du piémont y cure par droit à vie. Il n'y vend ni gel, chez lié et de sami, de riches draps de soie, bien ouvrés à des vies, et à vœux tout ce qui se chie vous de vie, un à deux puchelles qui mouent en clair les vies, carolant et trescant, menant galérie. Et si elle lit Dieu est d'âme et supalatis, qui doctrine les autres et en fait et en dit, celle à la fille au roi sont dit des hauts assis. End quote. Pages 319 to 320. This lady Ivorine, the old man's daughter, is described, among other points, as having, quote, les yeux verts comme faucon, noble et argentis. End quote. Page 320. The king of the mountain collects all the young male children of the country and has them brought up for nine or ten years. Quote, Des dans un lieu obscur, là les mettons tout dit, 
avec mal best, quien et casse et souris, colores et lizardes, et scorpion petit. Là endroit ne peut ne l'avoir joué, ni ri. End quote. Pages 320 to 321. And after this dreary life they are shown the paradise, and told that such shall be their portion if they do their lord's behest. Quote, S'il disoit à son homme, va ton droit à Paris, si me fier d'un coutel le roi de Saint-Denis, jamais n'a reste roi, né par nuit, né par dit, sa roi tuer le roi, voyant toucher marchi, et déouis d'estre à force traîné et mal mis. End quote. Page 321. Baudouin determines to see this paradise in the lovely Ivorine. The road led by Baudin. Quote, Or à voix achetant, si l'histoire ne ment, en le chit de Baudin christien jusqu'à cent. Qui manonon iloec par tréu d'argent, que casqu'un christien au roi calife rend. L'hyper du calife, qui régnant longuement, ama le chrétien et Dieu premièrement. Et le fit établir un monstier noble et gens, où chrétiens faisant faire leur sacrement. Une moute noble pierre leur donna proprement, où on a voix possé mahon mou longuement. End quote. Page 322. The story is, in fact, that which Marco relates of Samarcant. The caliph dies. His son hates the Christians. His people complain of the toleration of the Christians and their minister. But he says his father had pledged him not to interfere, and he dared not forswear himself. If, without doing so, he could do them an ill turn, he would gladly. The people then suggest their claim to the stone. Quote, Or l'heure donna vos pères, dont je fus mes prisons, cette pierre bioseur chrétien demandant, ils ne le pourront rendre, pour vrai le vous disons, si l'immonstier n'a mis, et par pièce, et par mon, et si l'estuit des faits, jamais ne le laron, réfère chi en droit, en s'aimant avront fait et accompli notre intention. End quote. Page 324. The caliph accordingly sends for Master Tumas, the priest of the Christians, and tells him the stone must be given up. Quote, Il a cent ans, eu plus son ami à cela, maon le nostre Dieu, dont je n'aimie esta, que l'ivou monstier soit fait de Nostrana. End quote. Page 324. Master Thomas, in great trouble, collects his flock, mounts the pulpit, and announces the calamity. Baudouin and his convert Polybons then arrive. Baudouin recommends confession, fasting, and prayer. They follow his advice, and on the third day the miracle occurs. Quote, La scripture le dit qui nous a cherté fi, que le pierre marron qui au ou mur fut fiqui, salior du pilé quoi que nous vous en dit, droit en mi le monstier qu'on que ne fut brisi, et démourant l'itro dont le pierre hervidi, sans pierre et sans cahier, à casque parti, chou des heures soutient par divine mestri, tout un air proprement, ne le tenait à Feli. Encore le voit-on en échelle partie, qui croire ne m'envole si voit, car je l'en prie. End quote. Page 327. The caliph comes to see and declares it to be the devil's doing. Seeing Polybans, who is his cousin, he hails him, but Polybans draws back, avowing his Christian faith. The caliph, in a rage, has him off to prison. 
Baudun becomes very ill and has to sell his horse and arms. His disease is so offensive that he is thrust out of his hostel, and in his wretchedness, sitting on a stone, he still avows his faith and confesses that even then he has not received his deserts. He goes to beg in the Christian quarter, and no one gives to him, but still his faith and love to God hold out. Quote, en Simon Baudouin, chez rue Cherka, tant qu'à un chavetier Baudouin s'arresta, qui chavat qu'usva, son pain en garion, jones fut et plaisant, appartement ouvra, Baudouin le regard qu'on comme ne parla. End quote, page 334. The cobbler is charitable, gives him bread, shoes, and a grey coat that was a foot too short. He then asks Baudouin if he will not learn his trade, but that is too much for the knightly stomach. Quote, et Baudouin répond, Lipru et Limembru, Jamroi trop mieux que je fis pendu. End quote, page 335. The caliph, now in his council, expresses his vexation about the miracle, and says he does not know how to disprove the faith of the Christians. A very sage old Saracen, who knew Hebrew and Latin and some thirty languages, makes a suggestion, which is, in fact, that about the moving of the mountain, as related by Marco Polo. Master Thomas is sent for again, and told that they must transport the high mountain of Tur to the valley of Joaquin which lies to the westward. He goes away in new despair, and causes his clerk to sonner le cloque for his people. Whilst they are weeping and wailing in the church, a voice is heard desiring them to seek a certain holy man who is at the good cobbler's, and to do him honour. God at his prayer will do a miracle. They go in procession to Baudouin, who thinks they are mocking him. They treat him as a saint, and strive to touch his old coat. At last he consents to pray along with the whole congregation. The caliph is in his palace with his princes, taking his ease at the window. Suddenly he starts up, exclaiming, quote, Seigneur, par mama, que jaour et tient chier, le monde terre emportant le diable d'un fer, les caliphs s'écrier, Seigneur Franck Palazin, voyez le monde de terre qui chemit au chemin. Fallez là tout en air par mon Dieu Apollin, j'ai bientôt le verrons en nouvelle Jacquin. End quote. Page 345. The caliph is converted, releases Polybans, and is baptized, taking the name of Baudouin to whom he expresses his fear of the Vieux de la Montagne with his haute assise, telling anew the story of the assassin's paradise, and so enlarges on the beauty of Ivorine that Baudouin is smitten, and his love heals his malady. Toleration is not learned, however. Quote, Baudouin, le calife, fit baptisier sa et qui ne voit Dieu croire, li testons li pourfin. End quote page 350. The caliph gives up his kingdom to Baduin, proposing to follow him to the wars of Syria, and Baduin presents the kingdom to the cobbler. Baduin, the caliph, and Prince Polybans then proceed to visit the mountain of the old man. The caliph professes to him that they want help against Godfrey of Boulogne. The view says he does not give a bouton for Godfrey. He will send one of his autasis straight to his tent, and give him a great knife of steel between Fille et Poumont. After dinner they go out and witness the feat of devotion which we have quoted elsewhere. They then see the paradise and the lovely Ivorine, with whose beauty Baudouin is struck dumb. The lady has never smiled before. Now she declares that he for whom she had long waited was come. Baudouin exclaims, quote, Madame Fujou Chou qui suis le vous soupchi, quand la puchelle l'orligata je ris, et lui dit, Baudouin, vous êtes mes amis. End quote. Pages 362 to 363. The old one is vexed, but speaks pleasantly to his daughter, 
who replies with frightfully bad language, and declares herself to be a Christian. The father calls out to the caliph to kill her. The caliph pulls out a big knife and gives him a blow that nearly cuts him in two. The amiable Ivorine says she will go with Baudouin. Quote, Ce me père est mort, non don, je parasi. End quote page 364. We need not follow the story further, as I did not trace beyond this point any distinct derivation from our traveller, with the exception of that allusion to the incombustible covering of the napkin of St. Veronica, which I have quoted at page 216 of this volume. But, including this, here are at least seven different themes borrowed from Marco Polo's book, on which to be sure his poetical contemporary plays the most extraordinary variations. In the third volume of the complete works of Geoffrey Chaucer, Oxford, 1894, the Reverend Walter W. Skeet gives an account of the sources of the Canterbury Tales. Regarding the squire's tales, he says that one of his sources was the travels of Marco. Mr. Cayley, in his Tales and Popular Fictions, published in 1834, at page 76, distinctly derives Chaucer's tale from the travels of Marco Polo. I cannot quote all the arguments given by the Reverend W. W. Skeet to support his theory, pages 463 to 477. Regarding the opinion of Professor Skeet of Chaucer's indebtedness to Marco Polo, see Marco Polo and the Squire's Tale by Professor John Matthews Manley, volume 11 of the Publications of the Modern Language Association of America, 1896, pages 349 to 362. Mr. Manley says, page 360, quote, It seems clear, upon reviewing the whole problem, that if Chaucer used Marco Polo's narrative, he either carelessly or intentionally confused all the features of the setting that could possibly be confused, and retained not a single really characteristic trait of any person, place, or event. It is only by twisting everything that any part of Chaucer's story can be brought into relation with any part of Polo's. To do this might be allowable if any rational explanation could be given for Chaucer's supposed treatment of his author, or if there were any scarcity of sources from which Chaucer might have obtained as much information about Tartary as he seems really to have possessed. But such an explanation would be difficult to devise, and there is no such scarcity. Any one of half a dozen accessible accounts could be distorted into almost, if not quite, as great resemblance to the squire's tale as Marco Polo's can. End quote. Mr. A. W. Pollard, in his edition of The Squire's Tale, London, 1899, writes, quote, A very able paper by Professor J. M. Manley demonstrate the needlessness of Professor Skeet's theory, which has introduced fresh complications into an already complicated story. My own belief is that, Though we may illustrate the squire's tale from these old accounts of Tartary, and especially from Marco Polo, because he has been so well edited by Colonel Yule, there is very little probability that Chaucer consulted any of them. It is much more likely that he found these details where he found more important parts of his story, that is, in some lost romance. But if we must suppose that he provided his own local colour, we have no right to pin him down to using Marco Polo to the exclusion of other accessible authorities. End quote. Mr. Pollard adds in a note, page 13, There are some features in these narratives, for example, the account of the gorgeous dresses worn at the Khan's feast, which Chaucer, with his love of colour, could hardly have helped reproducing if he had known them. End quote. H. C. End of section twelve. Thirteen of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, 
by Rusticello de Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Introductory Notices, Part 13, Nature of Polo's Influence on Geographical Knowledge. Marco Polo contributed such a vast amount of new facts to the knowledge of the Earth's surface that one might have expected his book to have had a sudden effect upon the science of geography. But no such result occurred speedily, nor was its beneficial effect of any long duration. No doubt several causes contributed to the slowness of its action upon the notions of cosmographers, of which the unreal character attributed to the book, as a collection of romantic marvels, rather than of geographical and historic facts, may have been one, as Santarum urges. But the essential causes were no doubt the imperfect nature of publication before the invention of the press, the traditional character which clogged geography as well as all other branches of knowledge in the Middle Ages, and the entire absence of scientific principle in what passed for geography, so that there was no organ competent to the assimilation of a large mass of new knowledge. Of the action of the first cause, no examples can be more striking than we find in the false conception of the Caspian as a gulf of the ocean, entertained by Strabo, and the opposite error in regard to the Indian Sea held by Ptolemy, who regards it as an enclosed basin, when we contrast these with the correct ideas on both subjects presented by Herodotus. The later geographers no doubt knew his statements, but did not appreciate them, probably from not possessing the evidence on which they were based. As regards the second cause alleged, we may say that down nearly to the middle of the 15th century, cosmographers, as a rule, made scarcely any attempt to reform their maps by any elaborate search for new matter, or by lights that might be collected from recent travelers. Their world was in its outline that handed down by the traditions of their craft, as sanctioned by some father of the church, such as Osiris or Isidore, as sprinkled with a combination of classical and medieval legend, Solinus being the great authority for the former. Almost universally, the Earth's surface is represented as filling the greater part of a circular disk rounded by the ocean, a fashion that already existed in the time of Aristotle and was ridiculed by him. No dogma of false geography was more persistent or more pernicious than this. Jerusalem occupies the central point because it was found written in the prophet Ezekiel, Hec dicit dominus Deus, ista est Jerusalem in medio gentium hosui eom, et in secuturis eos terras a declaration supposed to be corroborated by the psalmist's expression, regarded as prophetic of the death of our Lord, Deus autum rex noster, ante secula operest et salutum in midea terre. Psalm 73, verse 12. The terrestrial paradise was represented as occupying the extreme east, because it was found in Genesis that the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. Gog and Magog were set in the far north or northeast, because it was said again in Ezekiel, Ece ergo super tegog, princeum capitus mosca et turubal, et ascendere te feciam de lateraribus aquilonius. While probably the topography of those mysterious nationalities was completed by a girdle of mountains out of the Alexandrian fables. The loose and scanty nomenclature was mainly borrowed from Pliny or Mela through such fathers as we have named, whilst vacant spaces were occupied by Amazons, Aramisessians, and the realm of Prester John. A favorite representation of the inhabited earth was this, a great O enclosing a T, which thus divides the circle in three parts, the greater or half circle being Asia, the two quarter circles Europe and Africa. These maps were known to St. Augustine. Even Ptolemy seems to have been almost unknown, and indeed, had his geography been studied, it might, with all its errors, have tended to some greater endeavors after accuracy. Roger Bacon, while lamenting the exceeding deficiency of geographical knowledge in the Latin world, and proposing to assay an exacter distribution of countries, says he will not attempt to do so by latitude and longitude, for this is a system of which the Latins have learned nothing. He himself, while still somewhat burdened by the authoritative dicta of saints and sages of past times, ventures at least to criticize some of the latter, such as Pliny and Ptolemy, and declares his intention to have recourse to the information of those who have traveled most extensively over the earth's surface and, judging from the good use he makes, in his description of the northern parts of the world, of the travels of Requebus, whom he had known and questioned, besides diligently studying his narrative, we might have expected much in geography from this great man, had similar materials been available to him for other parts of the earth. He did attempt a map with mathematical determination of places, but it has not been preserved. It may be said with general truth, that the world map's current up to the end of the 13th century had more analogy to the mythical cosmography of the Hindus than to anything properly geographical. 
both no doubt were originally based in the main on real features in the hindu cosmography these genuine features are symmetrized as in a kaleidoscope in the european cartography they are squeezed together in a manner that one can only compare to a pig in brawn here and there some feature strangely compressed and distorted is just recognizable a splendid example of this kind of map is that famous one at hereford executed about a d twelve seventy five of which a facsimile has lately been published accompanied by a highly meritorious illustrative essay among the arabs many able men from the early days of islam took an interest in geography and devoted labor to geographical compilations in which they often made use of their own observations of the itineraries of travelers and of other fresh knowledge but somehow or other their maps were always far behind their books though they appear to have had an early translation of ptolemy and elaborate tables of latitudes and longitudes form a prominent feature in many of their geographical treaties there appears to be no arabian map in existence laid down with meridians and parallels whilst all of their best known maps are on an old system of the circular disk this apparent incapacity for map making appears to have acted as a heavy drag and bar upon progress in geography amongst the arabs notwithstanding its early promise among them and in spite of the application to its furtherance of the great intellects of some such as abu hriyan abironi and of the indefatigable spirit of travel and omnivorous curiosity of others such as masudi some distinct trace of acquaintance with the arabian geography is to be found in the world map of marino salundo the elder constructed between thirteen hundred and thirteen twenty and this may be regarded as an exceptionally favorable specimen of the cosmography in vogue for the author was a diligent investigator and compiler who evidently took a considerable interest in geographical questions and had a strong enjoyment and appreciation of a map nor is the map in question without some result of these characteristics his representation of europe northern africa syria asia minor arabia and its two gulfs is a fair approximation of general facts his collected knowledge has enabled him to locate with more or less of general truth georgia the iron gates Cathay, the plain of mogul euphrates and tigris persia baghdad caius aden though on the wrong side of the red sea abyssinia abesh zangobar zinz jida zid etc but after all the traditional forms are too strong for him jerusalem is still the center of the disk of the habitable earth so that the distance is as great from syria to gades in the extreme west as from syria to the indian interior of Prester john which terminates the extreme east and africa beyond the arabian gulf is carried according to the arabian modification of ptolemy's misconception far to the eastward until it almost meets the prominent shores of india the first genuine medieval attempt at a geographical construction that i know of absolutely free from the traditional adola is the map of the known world from the portolano Medicio in the laurentian library of which an extract is engraved in the atlas of baldelli bono's polo i need not describe it however because i cannot satisfy myself that it makes much use of polo's contributions and its facts have been embodied in a more ambitious work of the next generation the celebrated catalan map of thirteen seventy five in the great library of paris this also but on a larger scale and in a more comprehensive manner is an honest endeavor to represent the known world on the basis of collected facts casting aside all theories pseudo-scientific or pseudo-theological and a very remarkable work it is in this map it seems to me marco polo's influence i will not say on geography but on map making is seen to the greatest advantage his book is the basis of the map as regards central and further asia and partially as regards india his names are often sadly perverted and it is not always easy to understand the view that the compiler took of his itineraries still we have Cathay admirably placed in the true position of china as a great empire filling the southeast of asia the eastern peninsula of india is indeed absent altogether but the peninsula of hither india is for the first time in the history of geography represented with a fair approximation to its correct form and position and sumatra also java is not badly placed karajan bochiam mean and bangala are located with a happy conception of their relation to Cathay and to India. Many details in India, foreign to Polo's book, and some in Cathay, as well as in Turkestan and Siberia, which have been entirely derived from other sources, have been embodied in the map. But the study of his book has, I conceive, been essentially the basis of those great portions which I have specified, and the additional matter has not been in mass sufficient to perplex the compiler. 
Hence we really see in this map something like the idea of Asia that the traveler himself would have presented had he bequeathed a map to us. In the following age we find more frequent indications that Polo's book was diffused and read, and now that the spirit of discovery began to stir, it was apparently regarded in a juster light as a book of facts, and not as a mere Roman de Grand Khan. But in fact this age produced new supplies of crude information in greater abundance than the knowledge of geographers was prepared to digest or coordinate, and the consequence is that the magnificent work of Faramoro, 1459, though the result of immense labor in the collection of facts and the endeavor to combine them, really gives a considerably less accurate idea of Asia than that which the Catalan map had afforded. And when, at a still later date, the great burst of discovery eastward and westward took effect, the results of all attempts to combine the new knowledge with the old was most unhappy. The first and crudest forms of such combination attempted to realize the ideas of Columbus regarding the identity of his discoveries with the regions of the great Khan's dominion. But even after America had vindicated its independent position on the surface of the globe, and the new knowledge of the Portuguese had introduced China, where the Catalan map of the 14th century had presented Cathay, the latter country, with a hold of Polo's nomenclature, was shoved away to the north, forming a separate system. Henceforward, the influence of Polo's work on maps was simply injurious, and when to his nomenclature was added a sprinkling of Ptolemies, as was usual throughout the 16th century, the result was a most extraordinary hodgepodge, conveying no approximation to any consistent representation of facts. Thus, in a map of 1522, running the eye along the north of Europe and Asia from west to east, we find the following succession of names. Romlandia, or Greenland, as a great peninsula overlapping that of Norvegia and Sushia. Livonia, Pluscovia and Moscovia. Tartaria, bounded on the south by Sicia extra Uman, and on the east by the rivers Orques and Balpetis, out of Ptolemy which are made to flow into the Arctic Sea. South of these are Eryxicus and Ameria, or Ptolemy's Oxyditis and Mesmera, and Serica Regio. Then, following the north coast, Paolo Regio, Judea Closi, i.e., the ten tribes who are constantly associated or confounded with the shut-up nations of Gog and Magog. These impinge upon the river Poluscus, flowing into the northern ocean at latitude 75 degrees, but which is in fact no other than Polos Polisangan, Immediately south of this is Solomon Porventia, Polos again, and on the coast, Thrancut, Catea, the rivers Camaron and Oman, a misreading of Polos Quinin, Quinzie, and Mangi. The maps of Mercator, 1587, and Mangini, 1597, are similar in character, but more elaborate, introducing China as a separate system. Such indeed also is Blau's map, 1663, excepting that Ptolemy's contributions are reduced to one or two. In Sanson's map, 1659, the data of Polo and the medieval travelers are more cautiously handled, but a new element of confusion is introduced in the form of numerous features derived from Andrisi. It is scarcely worthwhile to follow the matter further. With the increase of knowledge of northern Asia from the Russian side, and that of China from the maps of Martini, followed by the surveys of the Jesuits, and with the real science brought to bear on Asiatic geography by such men as de Slille and de Anville, mere traditional nomenclature gradually disappeared, and the task which the study of Polo has provided for the geographers of later days has been chiefly that of determining the true localities that his book describes under obsolete or corrupted names. Before concluding, it may be desirable to say a few words on the subject of important knowledge other than geographical, which various persons have supposed that Marco Polo must have introduced from Eastern Asia to Europe. Respecting the mariner's compass and gunpowder, I shall say nothing, as no one now, I believe, imagines Polo to have had anything to do with their introduction. But from a highly respectable source in recent years, we have seen the introduction of block printing into Europe connected with the name of our traveler. The circumstances are stated as follows. In the beginning of the 15th century, a man named Pamphilo Castaldi, of Fetra, was employed by the seniori or government of the Republic, to engross deeds and public edicts of various kinds, the initial letters at the commencement of the writing being usually ornamented with red ink, or illuminated in gold and colors. According to San Sovino, certain stamps or types had been invented some time previously by Pietro of Natale, Bishop of Aquilia. These were made at Morano of Glass, and were used to stamp or print the outline of the large initial letters of public documents which were afterwards filled up by hand. 
for Filo Castaldi improved on these glass types by having others made of wood or metal, and having seen several Chinese books which the famous traveller Marco Polo had brought from China, and of which the entire text was printed with wooden blocks, he caused movable wooden types to be made, each type containing a single letter, and with these he printed several broadsides and single leaves at Venice in the year 1426. Some of these single sheets are said to be preserved among the archives at Feltro. The tradition continues that John Faust, of Mayence, became acquainted with Castaldi, and passed some time with him at his scriptorum at Feltre, and in short, developed from the knowledge so acquired, the great invention of printing. Mr. Curzon goes on to say that Panfilo Castaldi was born in 1398 and died in 1490, and that he gives the story as he found it in an article written by Dr. Jacobo Fasson of Feltre, in a Venetian newspaper called Il Gondolier, number 103, of 27th December, 1843. In a later paper, Mr. Curzon thus recurs to the subject. Though none of the early block books have dates affixed to them, many of them are, with reason, supposed to be more ancient than any books printed with movable types. Their resemblance to Chinese block books is so exact that they would almost seem to be copied from the books commonly used in China. The impressions are taken off on one side of the paper only, and in binding, both the Chinese and ancient German or Dutch block books, the blank sides of the pages are placed opposite each other, and sometimes pasted together. The impressions are not taken off with printer's ink, but with a brown paint or color of a much thinner description, more in the nature of India ink, as we call it, which is used in printing Chinese books. Although the German and Oriental block books are so precisely alike in almost every respect, that we must suppose that the process of printing them must have been copied from ancient Chinese specimens, brought from that country by some early travelers, whose names have not been handed down to our times. The writer then refers to the tradition that Gutenberg, as it is stated on this occasion, not Faust, having learned Castaldi's art, etc., mentioning a circumstance which he supposes to indicate that Gutenberg had relations with Venice, and appears to assent to the probability of the story of the art having been founded on specimens brought home by Marco Polo. This story was, in recent years, diligently propagated in northern Italy, and resulted in the erection of Feltre of a public statue of Pompilo Castaldi, bearing this inscription, besides others of like tenor. To Pompilo Castaldi, the illustrious inventor of movable printing types, Italy renders this tribute of honor too long deferred. In the first edition of this book, I devoted a special note to the exposure of the worthiness of the evidence for this story. This note was, with the present essay, translated and published at Venice by Commander Batshot, but this challenge to the supporters of the patriotic romance, so far as I have heard, brought none of them into the lists in its defense. But since Costaldi has got his statue from the printers of Lombardy, would it not be mere equity that the mariners of Spain should set up a statue at Helva to the pilot Alonso Sanchez of that port, who, according to Spanish historians, after discovering the New World, died in the house of Columbus of Tetcheria, and left the crafty Genoese to appropriate his journals and rob him of his fame? Seriously. If anybody in Fetra cares for the real reputation of his native city, let him do his best to have that preposterous and discreditable fiction removed from the base of the statue. If Costaldi has deserved a statue on other and truer grounds, let him stand. If not, let him be burnt into honest lime. I imagine that the original story that attracted Mr. Curzon was more jeu d'esprit than anything else, but that the author, finding what a stone he had set rolling, did not venture to retract. Mr. Curzon's own observations, which I have italicized about the resemblance of the two systems, are, however, very striking, and seem clearly to indicate the derivation of the art from China. But I should suppose that in the tradition, if ever there was any genuine tradition of the kind at Feltra, a circumstance worthy of all doubt, the name of Marco Polo was introduced merely because it was so prominent a name in Eastern travel. The fact has been generally overlooked and forgotten that, for many years in the course of the 14th century, not only were missionaries of the Roman Church and the houses of the Franciscan order established in the chief cities of China, but a regular trade was carried on overland between Italy and China by way of Tana, or Azov, Astrakhan, Ostra, and Kamul, insomuch that instructions for the Italian merchant following that route form the first two chapters in the mercantile handbook of Balducci Pergolati, circa 1340. Many a traveler besides Marco Polo might therefore have brought home the block books, and this is the less to be ascribed to him, because he so curiously admits to speak of the art of printing, when his subject seems absolutely to challenge his description. End of section 13. Recording by Todd.
fourteen of the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by rusticello de pisa translated by henry yule introductory notices part fourteen explanations regarding the basis adopted for the present translation it remains to say a few words regarding the basis adopted for our english version of the traveller's record ramusio's recension was that which marsden selected for translation but at the date of his most meritorious publication nothing was known of the real literary history of polo's book and no one was aware of the peculiar value and originality of the French manuscript texts, nor had Marston seen any of them. A translation from one of those texts is a translation at first hand. A translation from Ramusio's Italian is, as far as I can judge, the translation of a translated compilation from two or more translations, and therefore whatever be the merits of its matter inevitably carries us far away from the spirit and style of the original narrator m pothier i think did well in adopting for the text of his edition the manuscripts which i have classed as of the second type the more as there had hitherto been no publication from those texts but editing a text in the original language and translating are tasks substantially different in their demands it will be clear from what has been said in the preceding pages that I should not regard as a fair or full representation of Polo's work a version on which the geographic text did not exercise a material influence. But to adopt that text, with all its awkwardnesses and tautologies, as the absolute subject of translation, would have been a mistake. What I have done has been, in the first instance, to translate from Pothier's text, the process of abridgment in this text, however it came about, has been on the whole judiciously executed, getting rid of the intolerable prolixities of manner which belong to many parts of the original dictation, but as a general rule preserving the matter. Having translated this, not always from the text adopted by Pothier himself, but with the exercise of my own judgment on the various readings which that editor lays before us, I then compared the translation with the geographic text, and transferred from the latter not only all items of real substance that had been omitted, but also all expressions of special interest and character, and occasionally a greater fullness of phraseology where condensation in Pothier's text seemed to have been carried too far. And finally I introduced, between brackets, everything peculiar to Ramusio's version that seemed to me to have a just claim to be reckoned authentic, and that could be so introduced without harshness or mutilation. Many passages from the same source which were of interest in themselves, but failed to meet one or other of these conditions, have been given in the notes. As regards the reading of proper names and foreign words, in which there is so much variation in the different manuscripts and editions, I have done my best to select what seemed to be the true reading from the G.T. and Pothier's three manuscripts, only in some rare instances transgressing this limit. Where the manuscripts in the repetition of a name afforded a choice of forms, I have selected that which came nearest the real name when known. Thus the G.T. affords Baldassian, Badassian, Badassiam, Badausiam, Balassian. I adopt Badassian, or in English spelling, Badashan, because it is closest to the real name, Badakshan. Another place appears as Kobanin, Kabanat, Kobain. I adopt the first because it is the truest expression of the real name, Kobanan. In chapters 23 and 24 of Book 1, we have in the G.T., Asisim, Asisin, Asesin, and in Pothier's manuscripts, Hussisins, Harisins, etc. I adopt Asisin, or in the English spelling, Ashishin, for the same reason as before. So with Kremen, Krermen, Krermen, Kermen, Anglis Kermen. 
Cormos, Hormos, and many more. In two or three cases I have adopted a reading which I cannot show literatim in any authority, but because such a form appears to be the just resultant from the variety of readings which are presented, as in surveying one takes the mean of a number of observations when no one can claim an absolute preference. Polo's proper names, even in the French texts, are in the main formed on an Italian fashion of spelling. I see no object in preserving such spelling in an English book, so after selecting the best reading of the name, I express it in English spelling, printing Badashan, Pashai, Kerman, Badassian, instead of Badassian, Passei, Quermen, and so on. And when a little trouble has been taken to ascertain the true form and force of Polo's spelling of Oriental names and technical expressions, it will be found that they are in the main as accurate as Italian lips and orthography will admit, and not justly liable either to those disparaging epithets, or to those exegetical distortions which have been too often applied to them. Thus, for example, Cocosine, Gel or Gelin, Tonocane, Cobinin, Onendik, Barguerlach, Argon, Sensin, Quesican, Toscaol, Bulargusi, Zardandin, Anin, Kaugagu, Coloman, Gaunispola, Mutfili, Avarian, Choyak, are not, it will be seen, the ignorant blunderings which the interpretations affixed by some commentators would imply them to be, but are, on the contrary, all but perfectly accurate utterances of the names and words intended. End of section 14of the book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume 1 by Rusticello de Pisa translated by Henry Yule Prologue, Part 1, Chapters 1 and 2 Prologue Great princes, emperors, and kings, dukes and marquises, counts, knights, and burgesses, and people of all degrees who desire to get knowledge of the various races of mankind, and of the diversities of the sundry regions of the world, take this book and cause it to be read to you. For ye shall find therein all kinds of wonderful things, and the divers histories of the great Hermenia, and of Persia, and of the land of the Tartars, and of India, and of many another country, of which our book doth speak, particularly and in regular succession, according to the description of Messer Marco Polo, a wise and noble citizen of Venice, as he saw them with his own eyes. Some things indeed there be therein which he beheld not, but these he heard from men of credit and veracity and we shall set down things seen as seen, and things heard as heard only, so that no jot of falsehood may mar the truth of our book, and that all who shall read it or hear it read may put full faith in the truth of all its contents. For let me tell you that since our Lord God did mould with his hands our first father Adam, even until this day, never hath there been a Christian, or pagan, or Tartar, or Indian, or any man of any nation, who in his own person hath had so much knowledge and experience of the divers parts of the world and its wonders, as hath had this Messer Marco. And for that reason he bethought himself that it would be a very great pity did he not cause to be put in writing all the great marvels that he had seen, or on sure information heard of, so that other people who had not these advantages might, by his book, get such knowledge. And I may tell you that in acquiring this knowledge he spent in those various parts of the world good six and twenty years. Now, being thereafter an inmate of the prison at Genoa, he caused Messer Rusticiano of Pisa, who was in the said prison likewise, to reduce the whole to writing, and this befell in the year 1298 from the birth of Jesus. Chapter 1. How the two brothers Polo set forth from Constantinople to traverse the world. 
it came to pass in the year of Christ, 1260, when Baldwin was reigning at Constantinople, that Messer Nicholas Polo, the father of my lord Mark, and Messer Maffeo Polo, the brother of Messer Nicholas, were at the said city of Constantinople, whither they had gone from Venice with their merchants' wares. Now these two brethren, men singularly noble, wise, and provident, took counsel together to cross the greater sea on a venture of trade. So they laid in a store of jewels and set forth from Constantinople, crossing the sea to Soldea. Chapter 2. How the Two Brothers Went On Beyond Soldea. Having stayed a while at Soldea, they considered the matter and thought it well to extend their journey further. So they set forth from Soldea and travelled till they came to the court of a certain Tartar prince, Barca Khan by name, whose residences were at Sara and at Bulgara, and who was esteemed one of the most liberal and courteous princes that ever was among the Tartars. This Barca was delighted at the arrival of the two brothers, and treated them with great honour. So they presented to him the whole of the jewels that they had brought with them. The prince was highly pleased with these, and accepted the offering most graciously, causing the brothers to receive at least twice its value. After they had spent a twelve-month at the court of this prince, there broke out a great war between Barca and Alau, the lord of the Tartars of the Levant, and great hosts were mustered on either side. But in the end Barca, the lord of the Tartars of the Ponent, was defeated, though on both sides there was great slaughter. And by reason of this war no one could travel without peril of being taken. Thus it was at least on the road by which the brothers had come, though there was no obstacle to their travelling forward. So the brothers, finding they could not retrace their steps, determined to go forward. Quitting Bulgara, therefore, they proceeded to a city called Ukaka, which was at the extremity of the kingdom of the lord of the Ponent. And thence departing again, and passing the great river Tigris, they travelled across a desert which extended for seventeen days' journey, and wherein they found neither town nor village, falling in only with the tents of Tartars occupied with their cattle at pasture. End of section 15《of the Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Prologue, Part 2, Chapters 3 to 9. Chapter 3. How the two brothers, after crossing a desert, came to the city of Bokhara, and fell in with certain envoys there. After they had passed the desert, they arrived at a very great and noble city called Bokhara, the territory of which belonged to a king whose name was Barak, and is also called Bokhara. The city is the best in all Persia and when they had got hither they found they could neither proceed further forward nor yet turn back again, wherefore they abode in that city of Bokhara for three years. And whilst they were sojourning in that city, there came from Alau, lord of the Levant, envoys on their way to the court of the great Khan, the lord of all the Tartars in the world. And when the envoys beheld the two brothers, they were amazed, for they had never before seen Latins in that part of the world. And they said to the brothers, Gentlemen, if ye will take our counsel, ye will find great honour and profit shall come thereof. So they replied that they would be right glad to learn how. In truth, said the envoys, the great Khan hath never seen any Latins, and he hath a great desire so to do. Wherefore, if ye will keep us company to his court, ye may depend upon it that he will be right glad to see you, and will treat you with great honour and liberality, whilst in our company ye shall travel with perfect security, and need fear to be molested by nobody. Chapter 4. How the two brothers took the envoy's counsel, and went to the court of the great Khan. So when the two brothers had made their arrangements, they set out on their travels, in company with the envoys, 
and journeyed for a whole year, going northward and northeastward before they reached the court of that prince. And on their journey they saw many marvels of divers and sundry kinds, but of these we shall say nothing at present, because Messer Mark, who has likewise seen them all, will give you a full account of them in the book which follows. Chapter 5 How the Two Brothers Arrived at the Court of the Great Khan When the two brothers got to the Great Khan, he received them with great honor and hospitality, and showed much pleasure at their visit, asking them a great number of questions. First, he asked about the emperors, how they maintained their dignity and administered justice in their dominions, and how they went forth to battle, and so forth. And then he asked the like questions about the kings and princes and other potentates. Chapter 6 how the great Khan asked all about the manners of the Christians, and particularly about the Pope of Rome. And then he inquired about the Pope and the Church, and about all that is done at Rome, and all the customs of the Latins. And the two brothers told him the truth in all its particulars, with order and good sense, like sensible men as they were. And this they were able to do, as they knew the Tartar language well. Chapter 7 how the great Khan sent the two brothers as his envoys to the Pope. When that prince, whose name was Kublai Khan, lord of the Tartars all over the earth, and of all the kingdoms and provinces and territories of that vast quarter of the world, had heard all that the brothers had to tell him about the ways of the Latins, he was greatly pleased, and took it into his head that he would send them on an embassy to the Pope. So he urgently desired them to undertake this mission along with one of his barons, and they replied that they would gladly execute all his commands as those of their sovereign lord. Then the prince sent to summon to his presence one of his barons, whose name was Kojital, and desired him to get ready, for it was proposed to send him to the pope along with the two brothers. The baron replied that he would execute the lord's commands to the best of his ability. After this, the prince caused letters from himself to the Pope to be indicted in the Tartar tongue, and committed them to the two brothers, and to that baron of his own, and charged them with what he wished them to say to the Pope. Now the contents of the letter were to this purport. He begged that the Pope would send as many as an hundred persons of our Christian faith, intelligent men, acquainted with the seven arts, well qualified to enter into controversy, and able clearly to prove by force of argument to idolaters and other kinds of folk that the law of Christ was best, and that all other religions were false and not, and that if they would prove this, he and all under him would become Christians, and the church's liege men. Finally he charged his envoys to bring back to him some oil of the lamp which burns on the sepulchre of our Lord at Jerusalem. Chapter 8 how the great Khan gave them a tablet of gold, bearing his orders in their behalf. When the prince had charged them with all his commission, he caused to be given them a tablet of gold, on which was inscribed that the three ambassadors should be supplied with everything needful in all the countries through which they should pass, with horses, with escorts, and, in short, with whatever they should require. And when they had made all needful preparations, the three ambassadors took their leave of the emperor and set out. When they had traveled I know not how many days, the Tartar baron fell sick, so that he could not ride, and being very ill and unable to proceed further, he halted at a certain city. So the two brothers judged it best that they should leave him behind, and proceed to carry out their commission, and, as he was well content that they should do so, they continued their journey." and I can assure you that whithersoever they went, they were honorably provided with whatever they stood in need of, or chose to command. And this was owing to that tablet of authority from the Lord which they carried with them. So they traveled on and on until they arrived at Laias in Hermenia, a journey which occupied them, I assure you, for three years. It took them so long, because they could not always proceed, being stopped sometimes by snow, or by heavy rains falling, or by great torrents which they found in an impassable state. Chapter 9. How the Two Brothers Came to the City of Acre. They departed from Laias and came to Acre, 
arriving there in the month of April, in the year of Christ, 1269, and then they learned that the Pope was dead. And when they found that the Pope was dead, his name was Pope blank, they went to a certain wise churchman who was legate for the whole kingdom of Egypt, and a man of great authority, by name Theobald of Piacenza, and told him of the mission on which they were come. When the legate heard their story, he was greatly surprised, and deemed the thing to be of great honor and advantage for the whole of Christendom. So his answer to the two ambassador brothers was this, Gentlemen, ye see that the Pope is dead, wherefore ye must needs to have patience until a new Pope be made, and then shall ye be able to execute your charge. Seeing well enough that what the legate said was just, they observed, But while the Pope is a-making, we may as well go to Venice and visit our households. So they departed from Acre and went to Negropont, and from Negropont they continued their voyage to Venice. On their arrival there, Monsieur Nicholas found that his wife was dead, and that she had left behind her a son of fifteen years of age, whose name was Marco, and tis of him that this book tells. The two brothers abode at Venice a couple of years, tarrying until a pope should be made. End of chapter 16《Section 17 of the Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Prologue, Part 3, Chapters 10 to 15. Chapter 10. How the two brothers again departed from Venice, on their way back to the great Khan, and took with them Mark, the son of Messer Nicholas. When the two brothers had tarried as long as I have told you, and saw that never a pope was made, they said that their return to the great Khan must be put off no longer. So they set out from Venice, taking Mark along with them, and went straight back to Acre, where they found the legate of whom we have spoken. They had a good deal of discourse with him concerning the matter, and asked his permission to go to Jerusalem to get some oil from the lamp on the sepulchre, to carry with them to the great Khan, as he had enjoined. The legate giving them leave, they went from Acre to Jerusalem, and got some of the oil, and then returned to Acre, and went to the legate, and said to him, as we see no sign of a pope's being made, we desire to return to the great Khan, for we have already tarried long, and there has been more than enough delay. To which the legate replied, Since tis your wish to go back, I am well content. Wherefore he caused letters to be written for delivery to the great Khan, bearing testimony that the two brothers had come in all good faith to accomplish his charge, but that as there was no pope, they had been unable to do so. Chapter 11. How the two brothers set out from Acre, and Mark along with them. When the two brothers had received the legate's letters, they sent forth from Acre to return to the Grand Khan, and got as far as Laias. But shortly after their arrival there, they had news that the legate aforesaid was chosen pope, taking the name of Pope Gregory of Piacenza news which the two brothers were very glad indeed to hear. And presently there reached them at Laias a message from the legate, now the Pope, desiring them, on the part of the apostolic see, not to proceed further on their journey, but to return to him incontinently. And what shall I tell you? The king of Hermenia caused a galley to be got ready for the two ambassador brothers, and dispatched them to the Pope at Acre. Chapter 12 how the two brothers presented themselves before the new pope. And when they had been thus honorably conducted to Acre, they proceeded to the presence of the pope, and paid their respects to him with humble reverence. He received them with great honor and satisfaction, and gave them his blessing. He then appointed two friars of the order of preachers to accompany them to the great Khan, and to do whatever might be required of them. These were unquestionably as learned churchmen as were to be found in the province of that day, one being called Friar Nicholas of Vicenza, 
and the other Friar William of Tripoli. He delivered to them also proper credentials and letters in reply to the great Khan's messages, and gave them authority to ordain priests and bishops, and to bestow every kind of absolution, as if given by himself in proper person, sending by them also many fine vessels of crystal as presents to the great Khan. So when they had got all that was needful, they took leave of the Pope, receiving his benediction, and the four set out together from Acre, and went to Laias, accompanied always by Messer Nicholas's son Marco. Now about the time that they reached Laias, Bendoquedar, the Soldan of Babylon, invaded Hermenia with a great host of Saracens, and ravaged the country, so that our envoys ran a great peril of being taken or slain and when the preaching friars saw this they were greatly frightened and said that go they never would so they made over to messer nicholas and messer maffeo all their credentials and documents and took their leave departing in company with the master of the temple chapter thirteen how messer nicolo and messer maffeo polo accompanied by mark travelled to the court of the great khan so the two brothers, and Mark along with them, proceeded on their way, and journeying on, summer and winter, came at length to the great Khan, who was then at a certain rich and great city, called Kamenfu. As to what they met with on the road, whether in going or coming, we shall give no particulars at present, because we are going to tell you all those details in regular order in the after part of this book. Their journey back to the Khan occupied a good three years and a half, owing to the bad weather and severe cold that they encountered. And let me tell you in good sooth that when the great Khan heard that Messrs. Niccolo and Maffeo Polo were on their way back, he sent people a journey of full forty days to meet them, and on this journey, as on their former one, they were honorably entertained upon the road, and supplied with all that they required. Chapter 14. How Messer Niccolo and Messer Maffeo Polo and Marco presented themselves before the great Khan. And what shall I tell you? When the two brothers and Mark had arrived at that great city, they went to the imperial palace, and there they found the sovereign attended by a great company of barons. So they bent the knee before him, and paid their respects to him with all possible reverence, prostrating themselves on the ground. Then the Lord bade them stand up, and treated them with great honor, showing great pleasure at their coming, and asked many questions as to their welfare and how they had sped. They replied that they had in verity sped well, seeing that they found the Khan well and safe. Then they presented the credentials and letters which they had received from the Pope, which pleased him right well, and after that they produced the oil from the sepulchre and at that also he was very glad, for he set great store thereby. And next, spying Mark, who was then a young gallant, he asked who was that in their company. Sire, said his father, Messer Niccolo, tis my son and your liege man. Welcome he is, too, quoth the emperor. And why should I make a long story? There was great rejoicing at the court because of their arrival, and they met with attention and honor from everybody. So there they abode at the court with the other barons. Chapter 15. How the Emperor Sent Mark on an Embassy of His Now it came to pass that Marco, the son of Messer Niccolo, sped wondrously in learning the customs of the Tartars, as well as their language, their manner of writing, and their practice of war. In fact, he became in brief space to know several languages and four sundry written characters. And he was discreet and prudent in every way, insomuch that the emperor held him in great esteem. And so when he discerned Mark to have so much sense, and to conduct himself so well and beseemingly, he sent him on an embassage of his to a country which was a good six months' journey distant. The young gallant executed his commission well and with discretion. Now he had taken note on several occasions that when the prince's ambassadors returned from different parts of the world, they were able to tell him about nothing except the business on which they had gone, and that the prince in consequence held them for no better than fools and dolts, and would say, 
I had far lever hearken about the strange things, and the manners of the different countries you have seen, than merely be told of the business you went upon. For he took great delight in hearing of the affairs of strange countries. Mark, therefore, as he went and returned, took great pains to learn about all kinds of different matters in the countries which he visited, in order to be able to tell about them to the great Khan. End of section 17「Of the Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Prologue, Part 4, Chapters 16 to 18. Chapter 16 How Mark Returned from the Mission Whereon He Had Been Sent. When Mark returned from his embassage, he presented himself before the emperor, and after making his report of the business with which he was charged and its successful accomplishment, he went on to give an account in a pleasant and intelligent manner of all the novelties and strange things that he had seen and heard, insomuch that the emperor and all such as heard his story were surprised, and said, If this young man live, he will assuredly come to be a person of great worth and ability. And so from that time forward he was always entitled Messer Marco Polo, and thus we shall style him henceforth in this book of ours, as is but right. Thereafter Messer Marco abode in the Khan's employment some seventeen years, continually going and coming hither and thither, on the missions that were entrusted to him by the Lord, and sometimes with the permission and authority of the great Khan, on his own private affairs. And as he knew all the sovereign's ways, like a sensible man he always took much pains to gather knowledge of anything that would be likely to interest him, and then on his return to court he would relate everything in regular order, and thus the emperor came to hold him in great love and favor. And for this reason also he would employ him the oftener on the most weighty and most distant of his missions. These Messer Marco ever carried out with discretion and success, God be thanked. So the emperor became ever more partial to him, and treated him with the greater distinction, and kept him so close to his person that some of the barons waxed very envious thereat. And thus it came about that Messer Marco Polo had knowledge of, or had actually visited, a greater number of the distant countries of the world than any other man, the more that he was always giving his mind to get knowledge, and to spy out and inquire into everything, in order to have matter to relate to the Lord. Chapter 17 How Messer Niccolo, Messer Maffeo, and Messer Marco asked leave of the great Khan to go their way. When the two brothers and Mark had abode with the Lord all that time that you have been told, having meanwhile acquired great wealth in jewels and gold, they began among themselves to have thoughts about returning to their own country, and indeed it was time, for, to say nothing of the length and infinite perils of the way, when they considered the Khan's great age, they doubted whether, in the event of his death before their departure, they would ever be able to get home. They applied to him several times for leave to go, presenting their request with great respect, but he had such a partiality for them, and liked so much to have them about him, that nothing on earth would persuade him to let them go. Now it came to pass in those days that the Queen Bolgana, wife of Argon, lord of the Levant, departed this life, and in her will she had desired that no lady should take her place or succeed her as Argon's wife, except one of her own family, which existed in Cathay. Argon therefore dispatched three of his barons, by name respectively, Olite, Apuska, and Koja, as ambassadors to the great Khan, attended by a very gallant company, in order to bring back as his bride a lady of the family of Queen Volgana, his late wife. When these three barons had reached the court of the great Khan, they delivered their message, explaining wherefore they had come. 
the khan received them with all honour and hospitality and then sent for a lady whose name was kochachin who was of the family of the deceased queen bolgana she was a maiden of seventeen a very beautiful and charming person and on her arrival at court she was presented to the three barons as the lady chosen in compliance with their demand they declared that the lady pleased them well meanwhile messer marco chanced to return from india whither he had gone as the lord's ambassador and made his report of all the different things that he had seen in his travels and of the sundry seas over which he had voyaged and the three barons having seen that messer niccolo messer maffeo and messer marco were not only latins but men of marvellous good sense withal took thought among themselves to get the three to travel with them their intention being to return to their country by sea on account of the great fatigue of that long land journey for a lady and the ambassadors were the more desirous to have their company as being aware that those three had great knowledge and experience of the indian sea and the countries by which they would have to pass and especially messer marco so they went to the great khan and begged as a favor that he would send the three latins with them as it was their desire to return home by sea the lord having that great regard that i have mentioned for those three latins was very loath to do so and his countenance showed great dissatisfaction but at last he did give them permission to depart enjoining them to accompany the three barons and the lady chapter eighteen how the two brothers and messer marco took leave of the great khan and returned to their own country and when the prince saw that the two brothers and messer marco were ready to set forth he called them all three to his presence and gave them two golden tablets of authority which would secure them liberty of passage through all his dominions and by means of which whithersoever they should go all necessaries would be provided for them and for all their company and whatever they might choose to order. He charged them also with messages to the king of France, the king of England, the king of Spain, and the other kings of Christendom. He then caused thirteen ships to be equipped, each of which had four masts, and often spread twelve sails. And I could easily give you all particulars about these, but as it would be so long an affair, I will not enter upon this now, but hereafter, when time and place are suitable. Among the said ships were at least four or five that carried crews of two hundred fifty or two hundred sixty men. And when the ships had been equipped, the three barons and the lady and the two brothers and Messer Marco took leave of the great Khan and went on board their ships with a great company of people, and with all necessaries provided for two years by the emperor. They put forth to sea, and after sailing for some three months they arrived at a certain island towards the south, which is called Java, and in which there were many wonderful things which we shall tell you all about by and by. Quitting this island, they continued to navigate the Sea of India for eighteen months more, before they arrived whither they were bound, meeting on their way also with many marvels, of which we shall tell hereafter and when they got thither they found that argon was dead so the lady was delivered to kasan his son but i should have told you that it was a fact that when they embarked they were in number some six hundred persons without counting the mariners but nearly all died by the way so that only eight survived the sovereignty when they arrived was held by kiakatu so they commended the lady to him and executed all their commission and when the two brothers and Messer Marco had executed their charge in full, and done all that the great Khan had enjoined on them in regard to the lady, they took their leave and set out upon their journey. And before their departure, Kiakatu gave them four golden tablets of authority, two of which bore gerfalcons, one bore lions, whilst the fourth was plain, and having on them inscriptions which directed that the three ambassadors should receive honour and service all through the land, as if rendered to the prince in person, and that horses and all provisions, and everything necessary, should be supplied to them. And so they found in fact, for throughout the country they received ample and excellent supplies of everything needful, 
and many a time indeed as i may tell you they were furnished with two hundred horsemen more or less to escort them on their way in safety and this was all the more needful because kiakatu was not the legitimate lord and therefore the people had less scruple to do mischief than if they had had a lawful prince another thing too must be mentioned which does credit to those three ambassadors and shows for what great personages they were held the great khan regarded them with such trust and affection that he had confided to their charge the queen cochachin as well as the daughter of the king of manzi to conduct to argon the lord of all the levant and those two great ladies who were thus entrusted to them they watched over and guarded as if they had been daughters of their own until they had transferred them to the hands of their lord whilst the ladies young and fair as they were looked on each of those three as a father and obeyed them accordingly indeed both kassan who is now the reigning prince and the queen cochachin his wife have such a regard for the envoys that there is nothing they would not do for them and when the three ambassadors took leave of that lady to return to their own country she wept for sorrow at the parting what more shall i say having left kikatu they travelled day by day till they came to trebizond and thence to constantinople from constantinople to negropont and from negropont to venice and this was in the year twelve ninety five of christ's incarnation and now that i have rehearsed all the prologue as you have heard we shall begin the book of the description of the divers things that messer marco met with in his travels End of section eighteen. Teen of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdom and Marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tyler Dewald. The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Ewell. Section 19 book first chapters one through four chapter one here the book begins and first it speaks of the lesser hermenia there are two hermenias the greater and the less the lesser hermenia is governed by a certain king who maintains a just rule in his dominions but is himself subject to the Tartar. The country contains numerous towns and villages, and has everything in plenty. Moreover, it is a great country for sport in the chase of all manner of beasts and birds. It is, however, by no means a healthy region, but grievously the reverse. In days of old, the nobles there were valiant men, and did doughty deeds of arms. But nowadays they are poor creatures, and good at naught, unless it be boozing. They are great at that. Howbeit, they have a city upon the sea, which is called Laas, at which there is a great trade. For you must know that all the spicery and cloths of silk and gold, and the other valuable wares that come from the interior, are brought to that city, and the merchants of Venice and Genoa, and other countries, come thither to sell their goods, and to buy what they lack. And whatsoever persons would travel to the interior of the East, merchants or others, they take their way by this city of Laos. Having now told you about the Lesser Hermenia, we shall now tell you about Turkomania. Chapter 2. Concerning the Province of Turkomania. 
In Turkomania, there are three classes of people. First, there are the Turkomans. These are worshippers of Muhammad, a rude people with an uncouth language of their own. They dwell among the mountains and downs, where they find good pasture, for their occupation is cattle-keeping. Excellent horses, known as Tarquans, are reared in their country, and also very valuable mules. The other two classes are the Armenians and the Greeks, who live mixed with the former in the towns and villages occupying themselves with trade and handicrafts. They weave the finest and handsomest carpets in the world, and also a great quantity of fine and rich silks, of cremoisy, and other colors, and plenty of other stuffs. Their chief cities are Konia, Savast, where the glorious Messer St. Blaise suffered martyrdom, and Caesarea, besides many other towns and bishops' sees, of which we will not speak at present, for it would be too long a matter. These peoples are subject to the Tartar of Levant as their suzerain. We will now leave this province and speak of the Greater Armenia. Chapter 3 Description of the Greater Hermenia This is a great country. It begins at a city called Arzinga at which they weave the best buckrams in the world. It possesses also the best baths from natural springs that are anywhere to be found. The people of the country are Armenians, and are subject to the Tartar. There are many towns and villages in the country, but the noblest of the cities is Arzinga, which is the see of an archbishop and then Arzaron and Arzizi. The country is indeed a passing great one, and in the summer it is frequented by the whole host of the Tartars of the Levant, because it then furnishes them with such an excellent pasture for their cattle. But in the winter the cold is past all bounds, so in that season they quit this country, and go to a warmer region, where they find other good pastures. At a castle called Paperth, that you pass in going from Trebizond to Taurus, there is a very good silver mine. And you must know that it is in this country of Armenia that the Ark of Noah exists on the top of a certain great mountain, on the summit of which Snow is so constant that no one can ascend, for the snow never melts, and it is constantly added to by new falls. Below, however, the snow does melt, and runs down, producing such rich and abundant herbage that in summer cattle are sent to pasture from a long way round about, and it never fails them. The melting snow also causes a great amount of mud on the mountain. The country is bounded on the south by a kingdom called Mosul, the people of which are Jacobite and Nestorian Christians, of whom I shall have more to tell you presently. On the north it is bounded by the land of the Georgians, of whom I also shall speak. On the confines towards Georgiania, there is a fountain from which oil springs in great abundance, insomuch that a hundred shiploads may be taken from it at one time. This oil is not good to use with food, but tis good to burn, and is also used to anoint camels that have the mange. People come from vast distances to fetch it for in all countries round about they have no other oil. Now, having done with Great Armenia, we will tell you of Georgiania. Chapter 4 Of Georgiania and the King Thereof In Georgiania 
there is a king called David Melek, which is as much to say, David King. He is subject to the Tartar. In old times, all the kings were born with the figure of an eagle upon the right shoulder. The people are very handsome, capital archers, and most valiant soldiers. They are Christians of the Greek rite, and have a fashion of wearing their hair cropped like churchmen. This is the country beyond which Alexander could not pass when he wished to penetrate the region of the Ponent, because that the defile was so narrow and perilous, the sea lying on the one hand and on the other lofty mountains impassable to horsemen. The strait extends like this for four leagues, and a handful of people might hold it against the world. Alexander caused a very strong tower to be built there, to prevent the people beyond the passing to attack him, and this got the name of the Iron Gate. This is the place that the book of Alexander speaks of when it tells us how he shut up the Tartars between two mountains. Not that they were really Tartars, however, for there were no Tartars in those days, but they consisted of a race of people called the Comanians, and many besides. In this province all the forests are of boxwood. There are numerous towns and villages, and silk is produced in great abundance. They also weave cloth of gold and all kinds of very fine silk stuffs. The country produce the best goshawks in the world, which are called avigy. It has indeed no lack of anything, and the people live by trade and handicrafts. Tis a very mountainous region, and full of straight defiles and of fortresses, insomuch that the Tartars have never been able to subdue it out and out. There is in this country a certain convent of nuns, called St. Leonard's, about which I have to tell you a very wonderful circumstance. Near the church in question, there is a great lake at the foot of a mountain, and in this lake are found no fish, great or small, throughout the year till Lent come. On the first day of Lent, they find in it the finest fish in the world, and the greatest store too thereof, and these continue to be found till Easter Eve. After that they are found no more till Lent come round again, and so tis every year. Tis really a passing great miracle. The sea whereof I spoke as coming so near the mountains is called the Sea of Gel, or Gelen and extends about seven hundred miles. It is twelve days' journey distant from any other sea, and into it it flows the great river Euphrates, and many others, whilst it is surrounded by mountains. Of late, the merchants of Genoa have begun to investigate this sea, carrying ships across, and launching them thereon. It is from this country, on this sea also, that silk called Gellis is brought. The said sea produces quantities of fish, especially sturgeon, and the river mouth salmon, and other big kinds of fish. End of section 19. Recording by Tyler Dewald. of the book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1 by Rusticello da Pisa 
translated by henry yule book first chapter five of the kingdom of mosul on the frontier of armenia towards the southeast is the kingdom of mosul it is a very great kingdom and inhabited by several different kinds of people whom we shall now describe first there is a kind of people called arabi and these worship mohammed then there is another description of people who are nestorian and jacobite christians they have a patriarch whom they call the jatolic and this patriarch creates archbishops and abbots and prelates of all other degrees and sends them into every quarter as to india to bodas or to cathay just as the pope of rome does in the latin countries for you must know that though there is a very great number of christians in these countries they are all jacobite and nestorians christians indeed but not in the fashion enjoined by the pope of rome for they come short in several points of the faith all the cloths of gold and silk that are called muslins are made in this country and those great merchants called muslins who carry for sale such quantities of spicery and pearls and cloths of silk and gold are also from this kingdom there is yet another race of people who inhabit the mountains in this quarter and are called kurds some of them are christians some of them are saracens but they are an evil generation whose delight it is to plunder merchants near this province is another called muz and murdin producing an immense quantity of cotton from which they make a great deal of buckram and other cloth the people are craftsmen and traders and all are subject to the tartar king chapter six of the great city of baudas and how it was taken baudas is a great city which used to be the seat of the caliph of all the saracens in the world just as rome is the seat of the pope of all the christians a very great river flows through the city and by this you can descend to the sea of india there is a great traffic of merchants with their goods this way they descend some eighteen days from Bodas, and then come to a certain city called Kisi, where they enter the Sea of India. There is also on the river, as you go from Bodas to Kisi, a great city called Bastra, surrounded by woods in which grow the best dates in the world. In Bodas they weave many different kinds of silk stuffs and gold brocades, such as Nasich and Nak, and cremosi and many other beautiful tissue richly wrought with figures of beasts and birds it is the noblest and greatest city in all these regions now it came to pass on the day in the year of christ 1255 that the lord of the tartars of the levant whose name was alau brother of the great khan now reigning gathered a mighty host and came up against Baudas and took it by storm. It was a great enterprise, for in Baudas there were more than a hundred thousand horse beside foot soldiers. And when Alau had taken the place, he found therein a tower of the caliphs, which was full of gold and silver and other treasures. In fact, the greatest accumulation of treasure in one spot that ever was known. When he beheld that great heap of treasure, he was astonished, and, summoning the caliph to his presence, he said to him, Caliph, tell me now why thou hast gathered such a huge treasure. What didst thou mean to do therewith? Knewest thou not that I was thine enemy, and that I was coming against thee with so great an host to cast thee forth of thine heritage? wherefore didst thou not take of thy gear and employ it in paying knights and soldiers to defend thee and thy city the caliph wist not what to answer and said never a word so the prince continued now then caliph 
since i see what a love thou hast borne thy treasure i will e'en give it thee to eat so he shut the caliph up in the treasure tower and bade that neither meat nor drink should be given him saying now caliph eat of thy treasure as much as thou wilt since thou art so fond of it for never shalt thou have aught else to eat so the caliph lingered in the tower four days and then died like a dog truly his treasure would have been more service to him had he bestowed it upon men who would have defended his kingdom and his people rather than let himself be taken and disposed and put to death as he was howbeit since that time there has been never another caliph either at baudas or anywhere else now i will tell you of a great miracle that befell at baudas wrought by god on behalf of the christians chapter seven how the caliph of baudas took counsel to slay all the christians in his land i will tell you then this great marvel that occurred between baudas and mazul it was in the year of christ that there was a caliph at baudas who bore a great hatred to christians and was taken up day and night with the thought how he might either bring those who were in his kingdom over to his own faith or might procure them all to be slain and he used daily to take counsel about this with the devotees and priests of his faith for they all bore the christians like malice and indeed it is a fact that the whole body of saracens throughout the world are always most malignantly disposed towards the whole body of christians now it happened that the caliph with those shrewd priests of his got hold of that passage in our gospel which says that if a christian had faith as a grain of mustard seed and should bid a mountain be removed it would be removed and such indeed is the truth but when they had got hold of this text they were delighted for it seemed to them the very thing whereby either to force all the christians to change their faith or to bring destruction upon them all the caliph therefore called together all the christians in his territories who were extremely numerous and when they had come before him he showed them the gospel and made them read the text which i have mentioned and when they had read it he asked them if that was the truth the christians answered that it was assuredly so well said the caliph since you say that it is the truth i will give you a choice among such a number of you there must needs surely be this small amount of faith so you must either move that mountain there and he pointed to a mountain in the neighbourhood or you shall die an ill death unless you choose to eschew death by all becoming saracens and adopting our holy law to this end i give you a respite of ten days if the thing be not done by that time ye shall die or become saracens and when he had said this he dismissed them to consider what was to be done in this strait wherein they were chapter eight how the christians were in great dismay because of what the caliph had said the christians on hearing what the caliph had said were in great dismay but they lifted all their hopes to god their creator that he would help them in this their strait all the wisest of the christians took counsel together and among them were a number of bishops and priests but they had no resource except to turn to him from whom all good things do come beseeching him to protect them from the cruel hands of the caliph so they were all gathered together in prayer both men and women for eight days and eight nights and while they were thus engaged in prayer it was revealed in a vision by a holy angel of heaven to a certain bishop who was a very good christian that he should desire a certain christian cobbler who had but one eye to pray to god and that god in his goodness would grant such a prayer because of the cobbler's holy life 
now i must tell you what manner of man this cobbler was he was one who led a life of great uprightness and chastity and who fasted and kept from all sin and went daily to church to hear mass and gave daily a portion of his gains to god and the way how he came to have but one eye was this it happened one day that a certain woman came to him to have a pair of shoes made and she showed him her foot that he might take her measure now she had a very beautiful foot and leg and the cobbler in taking her measure was conscious of sinful thoughts and he had often heard it said in the holy evangel that if thine eye offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee rather than sin so as soon as the woman had departed he took the awl that he used in stitching and drove it into his eye and destroyed it and this is the way he came to lose his eye so you can judge what a holy just and righteous man he was chapter nine how the one-eyed cobbler was desired to pray for the christians now when this vision had visited the bishop several times he related the whole matter to the christians and they agreed with one consent to call the cobbler before them and when he had come they told him it was their wish that he should pray and that god had promised to accomplish the matter by his means on hearing their request he made a good many excuses declaring that he was not at all so good a man as they represented but they persisted in their request with so much sweetness that at last he said he would not tarry but do what they desired chapter ten how the prayer of the one-eyed cobbler caused the mountain to move and when the appointed day was come all the christians got up early men and women small and great more than one hundred thousand persons and went to church to hear the holy mass and after mass had been sung they all went forth together in a great procession to the plain in front of the mountain carrying the precious cross before them loudly singing and greatly weeping as they went and when they arrived at the spot there they found the caliph with all his saracen host armed to slay them if they would not change their faith for the saracens believed not in the least that god would grant such a favour to the christians these latter stood indeed in great fear and doubt but nevertheless they rested their hopes on their god jesus christ so the cobbler received the bishop's benison and then threw himself on his knees before the holy cross and stretched out his hands towards heaven and made this prayer blessed lord god almighty i pray thee by thy goodness that thou wilt grant this grace unto thy people insomuch that they perish not nor thy faith be cast down nor abused nor flouted not that i am in the least worthy to prefer such a request unto thee but for thy great power and mercy i beseech thee to hear this prayer from me thy servant full of sin and when he had ended this his prayer to god the sovereign father and giver of all grace and whilst the caliph and all the saracens and other people there were looking on the mountain rose out of its place and moved to the spot where the caliph had pointed and when the caliph and all his saracens beheld they stood amazed at the wonderful miracle that god had wrought for the christians insomuch that a great number of saracens became christians and even the caliph caused himself to be baptized in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost amen and became a christian but in secret howbeit when he died they found a little cross hung round his neck and therefore the saracens would not bury him with the other caliphs but put him in a place apart the christians exulted greatly at this most holy miracle and returned to their homes full of joy giving thanks to their creator for that which he had done and now you have heard in what wise took place this great miracle 
and marvel not that the saracens hate the christians for the accursed law that mohammed gave them commands them to do all the mischief in their power to all other descriptions of people and especially to christians to strip such of their goods and do them all manner of evil because they belong not to their law see then what an evil law and what naughty commandments they have but in such fashion the saracens act throughout the world now i have told you something of bodas i could easily indeed have told you first of the affairs and the customs of the people there but it would be too long a business looking to the great and strange things that i have got to tell you as you will find detailed in this book so now i will tell you of the noble city of tauris end of section 20 Reading by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. One of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Section 21. Book 1st. Chapters 11 to 15. Of the Noble City of Taurus. Of the Monastery of St. Barsama on the borders of taurus of the great country of persia with some account of the three kings how the three kings return to their own country of the eight kingdoms of persia and how they are named chapter eleven of the noble city of taurus taurus is a great and noble city situated in a great province called iraq in which are many other towns and villages but as taurus is the most noble I will tell you about it the men of taurus get their living by trade and handicrafts for they weave many kinds of beautiful and valuable stuffs of silk and gold the city has such a good position that merchandise is brought thither from india bordas cremasor and many other regions and that attracts many latin merchants especially genoese to buy goods and transact other business there the more as it is also a great market for precious stones it is a city in fact where merchants make large profits the people of the place are themselves poor creatures and are a great medley of different classes there are armenians nestorians jacobites georgians persians and finally the natives of the city themselves who are worshippers of mohammed these last are a very evil generation they are known as Torisi. The city is all girt round with charming gardens, full of many varieties of large and excellent fruits. Now we will quit Taurus, and speak of the great country of Persia. From Taurus to Persia is a journey of twelve days. Chapter 12 Of the Monastery of St. Barsamo On the Borders of Taurus On the borders of the territory of Taurus, there is a monastery called after saint barsamo a most devout saint there is an abbot with many monks who wear a habit like that of the carmelites and these to avoid idleness are continually knitting wooden girdles these they place upon the altar of saint barsamo during the service and when they go begging about the province like the brethren of the holy spirit they present them to their friends and to the gentlefolks for they are excellent things to remove bodily pain wherefore every one is devoutly eager to possess them chapter thirteen of the great country of persia with some account of the three kings persia is a great country which was in old times very illustrious and powerful but now the tartars have wasted and destroyed it in persia is the city of saba from which the three magi set out when they went to worship jesus christ and in this city they are buried in three very large and beautiful monuments side by side 
and above them there is a square building carefully kept the bodies are still entire with the hair and beard remaining one of these was called jasper the second melchior and the third balthazar messer marco polo asked a great many questions of the people of that city as to those three magi but never one could he find that knew aught of the matter except that these were three kings who were buried there in days of old however at a place three days journey distant he heard of what i am going to tell you he found a village there which goes by the name of Kala Ataperistan, which is as much to say the castle of the fire worshippers. And the name is rightly applied, for the people there do worship fire, and I will tell you why. They relate that in old times three kings of that country went away to worship a prophet that was born, and they carried with them three manner of offerings gold, and frankincense, and myrrh in order to ascertain whether the prophet were God. Or an earthly king or a physician for said they if he take the gold then he is an earthly king if he take the incense he is God if he take the myrrh he is a physician so it came to pass when they had come to the place where the child was born the youngest of the three kings went in first and found the child apparently just of his own age so he went forth again marveling greatly the middle one entered next, and like the first he found the child seemingly of his own age. So he also went forth again, and marvelled greatly. Lastly, the eldest went in, and as it had befallen the other two, so it befell him. And he went forth very pensive, and when the three had rejoined one another, each told what he had seen, and then they all marvelled the more. So they agreed to go in all three together, and on doing so, they beheld the child with the appearance of its actual age, to wit, some thirteen days. Then they adored, and presented their gold and incense and myrrh, and the child took all the three offerings, and then gave them a small closed box, whereupon the kings departed to return to their own land. Chapter 14 What Befell When the Three Kings Returned to Their Own Country and when they had ridden many days they said they would see what the child had given them so they opened the little box and inside they found a stone on seeing this they began to wonder what this might be that the child had given them and what was the import thereof now the signification was this when they presented their offerings the child had accepted all three and when they saw that they had said within themselves that he was the true god and the true king and the true physician and what the gift of the stone implied was that this faith which had begun in them should abide firm as a rock for he well knew what was in their thoughts howbeit they had no understanding at all of this signification of the gift of the stone so they cast it into a well then straightway a fire from heaven descended into that well wherein the stone had been cast and when the three kings beheld this marvel they were sore amazed and it greatly repented them that they had cast away the stone, for well they then perceived that it had a great and holy meaning. So they took of that fire and carried it into their own country, and placed it in a rich and beautiful church, and there the people keep it continually burning, and worship it as a god, and all the sacrifices they offer are kindled with that fire, and if ever the fire becomes extinct, they go to other cities round about where the same faith is held, and obtain of that fire from them, and carry it to the church. And this is the reason why the people of the country worship fire. They will often go ten days' journey to get of that fire. Such then was the story told by the people of, of that castle to Messer Marco Polo. They declared to him for a truth that such was their history, and that one of the three kings was of the very city called Saba, and the second from Ava, and the third of that very castle where they still worship fire, with the people of all the country round about. Having related this story, I will now tell you of the different provinces of Persia and their peculiarities. Chapter 15 Of the Eight Kingdoms of Persia and How They Are Named now you must know that Persia is a very great country, and contains eight kingdoms. 
I will tell you the names of them all the first kingdom is that at the beginning of Persia and is called Kasvin the second is further to the south and is called Kurdistan the third is law the fourth Sualstan the fifth Istanit the sixth Sirazi the seventh Sonkara the eighth Tunakane which is at the further extremity of Persia all these kingdoms lie in a southerly direction except one to wit Tunukane, that lies towards the east and borders on the country of Arbasol. in this country of Persia there is a great supply of fine horses and people take them to India for sale for they are horses of great price a single one being worth as much of their money as is equal to two hundred livres tournois some will be more some less according to the quality here also are the finest asses in the world one of them being worth full thirty marks of silver for they are very large and fast and acquire a capital amble dealers carry their horses to kisi and Kamosa, two cities on the shores of the sea of india and there they meet with merchants who take the horses on to india for sale in this country there are many cruel and murderous people so that no day passes but there is some homicide among them were it not for the government which is that of the tartars of the levant they would do great mischief to merchants and indeed maugre the government they often succeed in doing such mischief unless merchants be well armed they run the risk of being murdered or at least robbed of everything and it sometimes happens that a whole party perishes in this way when not on their guard the people are all saracens i e followers of the law of mahomet in the cities there are traders and artisans who live by their labor and crafts weaving cloths and gold and silk stuffs of sundry kinds they have plenty of cotton produced in the country and abundance of wheat barley millet panic and wine with fruits of all kinds some one may say but the saracens don't drink wine which is prohibited by their law the answer is that they gloss their text in this way that if the wine be boiled so that a part is dissipated and the rest becomes sweet they may drink without breach of the commandment for it is then no longer called wine the name being changed with the change of flavor End of section 21Twenty two of the book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian. Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book 1st, Chapter 16, Concerning the Great City of Yazdi. Yazdi also is properly in Persia. It is a good and noble city, and has a great amount of trade. They weave their quantities of a certain silk tissue, known as Yazdi, which merchants carry into many quarters to dispose of the people are worshippers of Mahomet When you leave this city to travel further you ride for seven days over great plains Finding harbor to receive you at three places only There are many fine woods producing dates upon the way such as one can easily ride through and in them there is great sport to be had in hunting and hawking there being partridges and quails and abundance of other game so that the merchants who pass that way have plenty of diversion there are also wild asses handsome creatures at the end of those seven marches over the plain you come to a fine kingdom which is called kerman book first chapter seventeen concerning the kingdom of kerman Kerman is a kingdom which is also properly in Persia, and formerly it had a hereditary prince. Since the Tartars conquered the country, the rule is no longer hereditary, 
but the Tartar sends to administer whatever lord he pleases. In the kingdom are produced the stones called turquoises, in great abundance. They are found in the mountains where they are extracted from the rocks. There are also plenty of veins of steel and ondonique. The people are very skillful in making harness of war. Their saddles, bridles, spurs, swords, bows, quivers, and arms of every kind are very well made indeed, according to the fashion of those parts. The ladies of the country and their daughters also produce exquisite needlework in the embroidery of silk stuffs in different colours, with figures of beasts and birds, trees and flowers, and a variety of other patterns. They work hangings for the use of noblemen so deftly that they are marvels to see, as well as cushions, pillows, quilts, and all sorts of things. In the mountains of Kerman are found the best falcons in the world. They are inferior in size to the peregrine, red on the breast, under the neck, and between the thighs, their flight so swift that no bird can escape them. On quitting the city, you ride on for seven days, always finding towns, villages, and handsome dwelling-houses, so that it is very pleasant travelling, and there is excellent sport also to be had by the way of hunting and hawking. When you have ridden those seven days over a plain country, you come to a great mountain, and when you have got to the top of the pass, you find a great descent which occupies some two days to go down. All along you find a variety and abundance of fruits, and in former days there were plenty of inhabited places on the road, but now there are none, and you meet with only a few people looking after their cattle at pasture. From the city of Kerman to this descent the cold in winter is so great that you can scarcely abide it, even with a great quantity of clothing. Book First, Chapter 18 of the city of Kamadi and its ruins, also touching the Corona robbers. After you have ridden downhill those two days, you find yourself in a vast plain, and at the beginning thereof there is a city called Kamadi, which formerly was a great and noble place, but now is of little consequence, for the Tartars in their incursions have several times ravaged it. The plain whereof I speak is a very hot region, and the province that we now enter is called Riobales. The fruits of the country are dates, pistachios, and apples of paradise, with others of the like not found in our cold climate. There are vast numbers of turtle doves attracted by the abundance of fruits, but the Saracens never take them, for they hold them in abomination. And on this plain there is a kind of bird called francolin. But different from the francolin of other countries, for their colour is a mixture of black and white, and the feet and beak of vermilion colour. The beasts also are peculiar, and first I will tell you of their oxen. These are very large, and all over white as snow. The hair is very short and smooth, which is owing to the heat of the country. The horns are short and thick, not sharp in the point and between the shoulders they have a round hump some two palms high. There are no handsomer creatures in the world, and when they have to be loaded they kneel like the camel. Once the load is adjusted they rise. Their load is a heavy one, for they are very strong animals. Then there are sheep here as big as asses, and their tails are so large and fat that one tail shall weigh some thirty pounds. They are fine, fat beasts, and afford capital mutton. In this place there are a number of villages and towns which have lofty walls of mud, made as a defence against the banditti, who are very numerous, and are called Carayonas. This name is given them because they are the sons of Indian mothers by Tartar fathers, and you must know that when these Carayonas wish to make a plundering incursion, they have certain devilish enchantments whereby they do bring darkness over the face of day, insomuch that you can scarcely discern your comrade riding beside you, and this darkness they will cause to extend over a space of seven days' journey. They know the country thoroughly, and ride abreast, keeping near one another, 
sometimes to the number of ten thousand at others more or fewer in this way they extend across the whole plain that they are going to harry and catch every living thing that is found outside of the towns and villages man woman or beast nothing can escape them the old men whom they take in this way they butcher the young men and the women they sell for slaves in other countries thus the whole land is ruined and has become well nigh a desert the king of these scoundrels is called nogodar this nogodar has gone to the court of chagatai who was own brother to the great khan with some ten thousand horsemen of his and abode with him for chagatai was his uncle and whilst there this nogodar devised a most audacious enterprise and i will tell you what it was he left his uncle who was then in greater armenia and fled with a great body of horsemen cruel unscrupulous fellows first through badashan and then through another province called Pashidir, and then through another called ariora keshemur there he lost a great number of his people and of his horses for the roads were very narrow and perilous and when he had conquered all those provinces he entered india at the extremity of a province called dalivar he established himself in that city and government which he took from the king of the country asadin soldan by name a man of great power and wealth and there abideth nogodar with his army afraid of nobody and waging war with all the tartars in his neighborhood now that i have told you of those scoundrels and their history i must add the fact that Meta Marco himself was all but caught by their bands in such a darkness as that i have told you of but as it pleased god he got off and threw himself into a village that was hard by called conal salmi howbeit he lost his whole company except seven persons who escaped along with him the rest were caught and some of them sold some put to death end of section 22twenty three of the book of sir marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the book of sir marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book First, Chapters 19 to 22, of the Descent to the City of Hormos, of the wearisome and desert road that has now to be travelled, concerning the city of Cabinan and the things that are made there, of a certain desert that continues for eight days' journey. Chapter 19, of the Descent to the City of Hormos. The plain of which we have spoken extends in a southerly direction for five days journey and then you come to another descent some twenty miles in length where the road is very bad and full of peril for there are many robbers and bad characters about when you have got to the foot of this descent you find another beautiful plain called the plain of formosa this extends for two days journey and you find in it fine streams of water with plenty of date palms and other fruit trees there are so many beautiful birds francolins popping jays and other kinds such as we have none of in our country when you have ridden these two days you come to the ocean sea and on the shore you find a city with a harbour which is called hormos merchants come thither from india with ships loaded with spicery and precious stones pearls cloths of silk and gold elephants teeth and many other wares which they sell to the merchants of hormos and which these in turn carry all over the world to dispose of again in fact tis a city of immense trade there are plenty of towns and villages under it but it is the capital the king is called ruamadam ahomet it is a very sickly place and the heat of the sun is tremendous if any foreign merchant dies there the king takes all his property 
in this country they make a wine of dates mixed with spices which is very good when any one not used to it first drinks this wine it causes repeated and violent purging but afterwards he is all the better for it and gets fat upon it the people never eat meat and wheat and bread except when they are ill and if they take such food when they are in health it makes them ill their food when in health consists of dates and salt fish tunny to wit with onions and this kind of diet they maintain in order to preserve their health their ships are wretched affairs and many of them get lost for they have no iron fastenings and are only stitched together with twine made from the husk of the indian nut they beat this husk until it becomes like horsehair and from that they spin twine and with this stitch the planks of the ships together it keeps well and is not corroded by the sea water but it will not stand well in a storm the ships are not pitched but are rubbed with fish oil they have but one mast one sail and one rudder and have no deck but only a cover spread over the cargo when loaded this cover consists of hides and on the top of these hides they put the horses which they take to india for sale they have no iron to make nails of and for this reason they use only wooden tree nails in their shipbuilding and then stitch the planks with twine as i have told you hence tis a perilous business to go a voyage in one of those ships and many of them are lost for in that sea of india the storms are often terrible the people are black and are worshippers of Mohammed. the residents avoid living in the cities for the heat in summer is so great that it will kill them hence they go out to sleep at their gardens in the country where there are streams and plenty of water for all that they would not escape but for one thing that i will mention the fact is you see that in summer a wind often blows across the sands which encompass the plain so intolerably hot that it would kill everybody were it not that when they perceive that wind coming they plunge into water up to their neck and so abide until the wind have ceased and to prove the great heat of this wind messer mark related a case that befell when he was there the lord of hormus not having paid his tribute to the king of kerman the latter resolved to claim it at the time when the people of hormus were residing away from the city so he caused a force of sixteen hundred horse and five thousand foot to be got ready and sent them by the route of rio bales to take the others by surprise now it appeared one day that through the fault of their guide they were not able to reach the place appointed for their night's halt and were obliged to bivouac in a wilderness not far from hormos in the morning as they were starting on their march they were caught by that wind and every man of them was suffocated so that not one survived to carry the tidings to their lord when the people of hormos heard of this they went forth to bury the bodies lest they should breed a pestilence but when they laid hold of them by the arms to drag them to the pits the bodies proved to be so baked as it were by that tremendous heat that the arms parted from the trunks and in the end the people had to dig graves hard by each where it lay and so cast them in the people sow their wheat and barley and other corn in the month of november and reap it in the month of march the dates are not gathered till may but otherwise there is no grass nor any other green thing for the excessive heat dries up everything when any one dies they make a great business of the mourning for women mourn their husbands four years during that time they mourn at least once a day gathering together their kinsfolk and friends and neighbors for the purpose and making a great weeping and wailing and they have women who are mourners by trade and do it for hire now we will quit this country I shall not however now go on to tell you about india but when time and place shall suit we shall come round from the north and tell you about it for the present let us return by another road to the aforesaid city of kerman for we cannot get at those countries that i wish to tell you about except through that city i should tell you first however that king ruomadam ahomet of hermos which we are leaving is a liegeman of the king of kerman on the road by which we return from hormos to kerman you meet with some very fine plains and you also find many natural hot baths you find plenty of partridges on the road 
and there are towns where victual is cheap and abundant with quantities of dates and other fruits the wheaten bread however is so bitter owing to the bitterness of the water that no one can eat it who is not used to it the baths that i mentioned have excellent virtues they cure the itch and several other diseases now then i am going to tell you about the countries towards the north of which you shall hear in regular order let us begin chapter twenty of the wearisome and desert road that has now to be travelled on departing from the city of kerman you find the road for seven days most wearisome and i will tell you how this is the first three days you meet with no water or next to none and what little you do meet with is bitter green stuff so salt that no one can drink it and in fact if you drink a drop of it it will set you purging ten times at least by the way it is the same with the salt which is made from those streams no one dares to make use of it because of the excessive purging which it occasions hence it is necessary to carry water for the people to last these three days as for the cattle they must needs drink of the bad water i have mentioned as there is no help for it and the great thirst makes them do so but it scours them to such a degree that sometimes they die of it in all those three days you meet with no human habitation it is all desert and the extremity of drought even of wild beasts there are none for there is nothing for them to eat after those three days of desert you arrive at a stream of fresh water running underground but along which there are holes broken in here and there perhaps undermined by the stream at which you can get sight of it it has an abundant supply and travellers worn with the hardships of the desert here rest and refresh themselves and their beasts you then enter another desert which extends for four days it is very much like the former except that you do see some wild asses at the termination of these four days of desert the kingdom of kerman comes to an end and you find another city which is called cobainan chapter twenty one concerning the city of cobainan and the things that are made there cobainan is a large town the people worship mahomet there is much iron and steel and ondanique and they make steel mirrors of great size and beauty they also prepare both tutia a thing very good for the eyes and spodium and i will tell you the process they have a vein of a certain earth which has the required quality and this they put into a great flaming furnace whilst over the furnace there is an iron grating the smoke and moisture expelled from the earth of which i speak adhere to the iron grating and thus form tutia whilst the slag that is left after burning is the spodium chapter twenty two of a certain desert that continues for eight days journey when you depart from this city of cobainan you find yourself again in a desert of surpassing aridity which lasts for some eight days here are neither fruits nor trees to be seen and what water there is is bitter and bad so that you have to carry both food and water the cattle must needs drink the bad water will they nil they because of their great thirst at the end of those eight days you arrive at a province which is called tonocane it has a good many towns and villages and forms the extremity of persia towards the north it also contains an immense plain on which is found the arbre sol which we christians call the arbre sec and i will tell you what it is like it is a tall and thick tree having the bark on one side green and the other white and it produces a rough husk like that of a chestnut but without anything in it the wood is yellow like box and very strong and there are no other trees near it nor within a hundred miles of it except on one side where you find trees within about ten miles distance and there the people of the country tell you was fought the battle between alexander and king darius the towns and villages have great abundance of everything good for the climate is extremely temperate being neither very hot nor very cold the natives all worship mahomet and are a very fine looking people especially the women who are surpassingly beautiful end of section 23
Section 24 of the Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Stephen Gibbons. The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Section 24, Book 1st, Chapters 23 to 25. Concerning the Old Man of the Mountain, How the Old Man Used to Train His Assassins, How the Old Man Came by His End. Chapter 23, Concerning the Old Man of the Mountain. Mulehet is a country in which the Old Man of the Mountain dwelt in former days, and the name means Place of the Aram. I will tell you his whole history as related by Messer Marco Polo, who heard it from several natives of that region. The old man was called in their language Aloadin. He had caused a certain valley between two mountains to be enclosed, and had turned it into a garden, the largest and most beautiful that ever was seen, filled with every variety of fruit. In it were erected pavilions and palaces, the most elegant that can be imagined, all covered with gilding and exquisite painting. And there were runnels, too, flowing freely with wine and milk and honey and water, and numbers of ladies and of the most beautiful damsels in the world, who could play on all manner of instruments and sung most sweetly and danced in a manner that it was charming to behold. For the old man desired to make his people believe that this was actually paradise. So he had fashioned it after the description that Muhammad gave of his paradise, to wit, that it should be a beautiful garden running with conduits of wine and milk and honey and water, and full of lovely women for the delectation of all its inmates. And sure enough, the Saracens of those parts believed that it was paradise. Now, no man was allowed to enter the garden, save those whom he intended to be his Ashashin. There was a fortress at the entrance to the garden, strong enough to resist all the world, and there was no other way to get in. He kept at his court a number of the youths of the country from twelve to twenty years of age, such as had a taste for soldiering, and to these he used to tell tales about paradise, just as Mohammed had been wont to do, and they believed in him, just as the Saracens believed in Mohammed. Then he would introduce them into his garden, some four or six or ten at a time, having first made them drink a certain potion which cast them into a deep sleep, and then causing them to be lifted and carried in. So when they awoke, they found themselves in the garden. Chapter 24 How the Old Man Used to Train His Assassins when therefore they awoke and found themselves in a place so charming, they deemed that it was paradise in very truth. And the ladies and damsels dallied with them to their heart's content, so that they had what young men would have. And with their own good will, they never would have quitted the place. Now this prince, whom we call the Old One, kept his court in grand and noble style, and made those simple hill folks about him believe firmly that he was a great prophet. And when he wanted one of his Ashashin to send on any mission, he would cause that potion, whereof I spoke, to be given to one of the youths in the garden, and then had him carried into his palace. So when the young man awoke, he found himself in the castle, and no longer in that paradise, whereat he was not over well pleased. He was then conducted to the old man's presence and bowed before him with great veneration, as believing himself to be in the presence of a true prophet. The prince would then ask whence he came, and he would reply that he came from paradise, and that it was exactly such as Mohammed had described it in the law. This, of course, gave the others who stood by, and who had not been admitted, the greatest desire to enter therein. So when the old man would have any prince slain, he would say to such a youth, Go thou, and slay so-and-so, and when thou returnest, my angels shall bear thee into paradise. And shouldst thou die, nevertheless, even so, will I send my angels to carry thee back into paradise. So he caused them to believe, and thus there was no order of his that they would not affront any peril to execute. 
for the great desire they had to get back into that paradise of his. And in this manner the old one got his people to murder anyone whom he desired to get rid of. Thus, too, the great dread that he inspired all princes withal made them become his tributaries in order that he might abide at peace and amity with them. I should also tell you that the old man had certain others under him who copied his proceedings and acted exactly in the same manner. One of these was sent into the territory of Damascus, and the other into Kurdistan. Chapter 25 How the Old Man Came by His End Now it came to pass, in the year of Christ's incarnation, 1252, that Alaou, lord of the Tartars of the Levant, heard tell of these great crimes of the old man, and resolved to make an end of him. So he took and sent one of his barons with a great army to that castle, and they besieged it for three years, but they could not take it, so strong was it. And indeed, if they had had food within, it never would have been taken. But after being besieged those three years, they ran short of victual, and were taken. The old man was put to death with all his men, and the castle, with its garden of paradise, was leveled with the ground. And since that time, he has had no successor, and there was an end to all of his villainies. Now, let us get back to our journey. End of section 24Section 25 of the Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Stephen Gibbons The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1 By Rusticello de Pisa Translated by Henry Yule. Section 25, Book 1st, Chapters 26 to 29, Concerning the City of Suburgan, of the City of Balk, of Tycon, and the Mountains of Salt, also of the Province of Kassam, of the Province of Badashan. Chapter 26, Concerning the City of Suburgan. On leaving the castle, you ride over fine plains and beautiful valleys and pretty hillsides producing excellent grass pasture, and abundance of fruits and all other products. Armies are glad to take up their quarters here on account of the plenty that exists. This kind of country extends for six days' journey with a goodly number of towns and villages in which the people are worshippers of Mohammed. Sometimes also you meet with a tract of desert extending for fifty or sixty miles, or somewhat less, and in these deserts you find no water, but have to carry it along with you. The beasts do without drink until you have got across the desert tract and come to watering places. So after traveling for six days, as I have told you, you come to a city called Suburgan. It has great plenty of everything, but especially of the very best melons in the world. They preserve them by paring them round and round into strips and drying them in the sun. When dry, they are sweeter than honey and are carried off for sale all over the country. There is also abundance of game here, both birds and beasts. Chapter 27 Of the City of Balk Balk is a noble city, though it was much greater in former days. But the Tartars and other nations have greatly ravaged and destroyed it. There were formerly many fine palaces and buildings of marble, and the ruins of them still remain. The people of the city tell that it was here that Alexander took to wife the daughter of Darius. Here, you should be told, is the end of the empire of the Tartar lord of the Levant. And this city is also the limit of Persia in the direction between east and northeast. Now, let us quit this city, and I will tell you of another country called Dogana. When you have quitted the city of which I have been speaking, you ride some twelve days between northeast and east, without finding any human habitation, for the people have all taken refuge in fastness among the mountains on account of the banditti and armies that harass them. There is plenty of water on the road, and abundance of game. There are lions, too. You can get no provisions on the road, 
and must carry with you all that you require for these twelve days. Chapter 28 of Taikan and the Mountains of Salt, also of the province of Kasim. After those twelve days' journey, you come to a fortified place called Taikan, where there is a great corn market. It is a fine place, and the mountains that you see towards the south are all composed of salt. People from all the countries round, to some thirty days' journey, come to fetch this salt, which is the best in the world, and is so hard that it can only be broken with iron picks. Tis in such abundance that it would supply the whole world to the end of time. Other mountains there grow almonds and pistachios, which are exceedingly cheap. When you leave this town and ride three days further between northeast and east, you meet with many fine tracts full of vines and other fruits, and with a goodly number of habitations, and everything to be had very cheap. The people are worshippers of Mohammed, and are an evil and a murderous generation, whose great delight is in the wine shop, for they have good wine, albeit boiled, and are great topers. In truth, they are constantly getting drunk. They wear nothing on the head but a cord some ten palms long twisted around it. They are excellent huntsmen, and take a great deal of game. In fact, they wear nothing but the skins of the beasts they have taken in the chase, for they make of them both coats and shoes. Indeed, all of them are acquainted with the art of dressing skins for these purposes. When you have ridden those three days, you find a town called Kasim, which is subject to a count. His other towns and villages are on the hills, but through this town there flows a river of some size. There are a great many porcupines hereabouts, and very large ones too. When hunted with dogs, several of them will get together and huddle close, shooting their quills at the dogs, which get many a serious wound thereby. This town of Kasim is at the head of a very great province, which is also called Kasim. The people have a peculiar language. The peasants who keep cattle abide in the mountains, and have their dwellings in caves, which form fine and spacious houses for them, and are made with ease, as the hills are composed of earth. After leaving the town of Kasim, you ride for three days without finding a single habitation, or anything to eat or drink, so that you have to carry with you everything that you require. At the end of those three days you reach a province called Badashan, about which we shall now tell you. Chapter 29 of the Province of Badashan Badashan is a province inhabited by people who worship Muhammad and have a peculiar language. It forms a very great kingdom, and the royalty is hereditary. All those of the royal blood are descended from King Alexander, and the daughter of King Darius, who was lord of the vast empire of Persia. And all these kings call themselves in the Saracen tongue Zulkanayen, which is as much as to say Alexander, and this out of regard for Alexander the Great. It is in this province that those fine and valuable gems, the Balas rubies, are found. They are got in certain rocks among the mountains, and in the search for them the people dig great caves underground, just as is done by miners for silver. There is but one special mountain that produces them, and it is called the Sijinin. The stones are dug on the king's account, but no one else dares dig in that mountain on pain of forfeiture of life as well as goods, nor may anyone carry the stones out of the kingdom. But the king amasses them all and sends them to other kings when he has tribute to render, or when he desires to offer a friendly present, and such only as he pleases he causes to be sold. Thus he acts in order to keep the balas at a high value, for if he were to allow everybody to dig, they would extract so many that the world would be glutted, and they would cease to bear any value. Hence it is that he allows so few to be taken out, and is so strict in the matter. There is also in the same country another mountain, in which azure is found. Tis the finest in the world, and is gotten of vein like silver. There are also other mountains which contain a great amount of silver ore so that the country is a very rich one, but it is also, it must be said, a very cold one. It produces numbers of excellent horses, remarkable for their speed. They are not shod at all, although constantly used in mountainous country, and on very bad roads. They go at a great pace, even down steep descents, where other horses neither would nor could do the like. 
and Messer Marco was told that not long ago they possessed in that province a breed of horses from the strain of Alexander's horse, Bucephalus, all of which had from their birth a particular mark on the forehead. This breed was entirely in the hands of an uncle of the king's, and in consequence of his refusing to let the king have any of them, the latter put him to death. The widow, in despite, destroyed the whole breed, and it is now extinct. The mountains of this country also supply saker falcons of excellent flight, and plenty of lanners likewise. Beasts and birds for the chase there are in great abundance. Good wheat is grown, and also barely without husk. They have no olive oil, but make oil from sesame and also from walnuts. In the mountains there are vast numbers of sheep, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred in a single flock, and all of them wild, and though many of them are taken, they never seem to get aught the scarcer. Those mountains are so lofty that tis a hard day's work from morning till evening to get to the top of them. On getting up, you find an extensive plain with great abundance of grass and trees and copious springs of pure water running down through rocks and ravines. In those brooks are found trout and many other fish of dainty kinds, and the air in those regions is so pure and residents there are so healthful that when the men who dwell below in the towns and in the valleys and plains find themselves attacked by any kind of fever or other ailment that may hap, they lose no time in going to the hills, and after abiding there two or three days they quite recover their health through the excellence of that air. And Messer Marco said he had proved this by experience, for when in those parts he had been ill for about a year, but as soon as he was advised to visit that mountain he did so, and got well at once. In this kingdom there are many straight and perilous passes, so difficult to force that the people have no fear of invasion. Their towns and villages also are on lofty hills, and in very strong positions. They are excellent archers, and much given to the chase. Indeed, most of them are dependent for clothing on the skins of beasts, for stuffs are very dear among them. The great ladies, however, are arrayed in stuffs, and I will tell you the style of their dress. They all wear drawers made of cotton cloth, and to the making of these some will put sixty, eighty, or even one hundred ells of stuff. This they do to make themselves look large in the hips, for the men of those parts think that to be a great beauty in a woman. End of section 25《Section 26 of the Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Gibbons. — The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Section 26, Book 1st, Chapters 30 to 32. Of the Province of Pashai, of the Province of Kashmir, of the Great River of Badashan, and Plain of Pamir. Chapter 30, Of the Province of Pashai. You must know the ten days' journey to the south of Badashan there is a province called Pashai the people of which have a peculiar language, and are idolaters of a brown complexion. They are great adepts in sorceries and the diabolic arts. The men wear earrings and brooches of gold and silver set with stones and pearls. They are a pestilent people and crafty, and they live upon flesh and rice. Their country is very hot. Now let us proceed and speak of another country which is seven days' journey from this one towards the southeast, and the name of which is Kashmir. Chapter 31 of the Province of Kashmir Kashmir also is a province inhabited by a people who are idolaters and have a language of their own. They have an astonishing acquaintance with the devilries of enchantment, insomuch that they make their idols to speak. They can also, by their sorceries, bring on changes of weather and produce darkness, and do a number of things so extraordinary that no one without seeing them would believe them. 
Indeed, this country is the very original source from which idolatry has spread abroad. In this direction you can proceed further until you come to the Sea of India. The men are brown and lean, but the women, taking them as brunettes, are very beautiful. The food of the people is flesh and milk and rice. The clime is finely tempered, being neither very hot nor very cold. There are numbers of towns and villages in the country, but also forests and desert tracts and strong passes so that the people have no fear of anybody, and keep their independence with a king of their own to rule and do justice. There are in this country Aramites, after the fashion of those parts, who dwell in seclusion and practice great abstinence in eating and drinking. They observe strict chastity and keep from all sins forbidden in their law, so that they are regarded by their own folk as very holy persons. They live to a very great age. There are also a number of idolatrous abbeys and monasteries. The people of the province do not kill animals nor spill blood, so if they want to eat meat, they get the Saracens who dwell among them to play the butcher. The coral, which is carried from our parts of the world, has a better sale there than in any other country. Now we will quit this country, and not go any further in the same direction, for if we did so, we should enter India, and that I do not wish to do at present. For on our return journey, I mean to tell you about India, all in regular order. Let us go back, therefore, to Badashan, for we cannot otherwise proceed on our journey. Chapter 32 of the Great River of Badashan In leaving Badashan, you ride twelve days between east and northeast, ascending a river that runs through land belonging to a brother of the Prince of Badashan, and containing a good many towns and villages and scattered habitations. The people are Mohammedans, and valiant in war. At the end of those twelve days you come to a province of no great size, extending indeed no more than three days' journey in any direction, and this is called Vokan. The people worship Muhammad, and they have a peculiar language. They are gallant soldiers, and they have a chief whom they call Nong, which is as much as to say, Count, and they are liegemen to the Prince of Badashan. There are numbers of wild beasts of all sorts in this region. And when you leave this little country and ride three days northeast, always among mountains, you get to such a height to said to be the highest place in the world. And when you've got to this height, you find a great lake between two mountains, and out of it a fine river running through a plain clothed with the finest pasture in the world, insomuch that a lean beast there will fatten to your heart's content in ten days. There are great numbers of all kinds of wild beasts, among others wild sheep of great size, whose horns are good six palms in length. From these horns the shepherds make great bowls to eat from, and they use the horns also to enclose folds for their cattle at night. Messer Marco was told also that the wolves were numerous and killed many of those wild sheep. Hence quantities of their horns and bones were found, and these were made into great heaps by the wayside in order to guide travelers when snow was on the ground. The plain is called Pamier, and you ride across it for twelve days together, finding nothing but a desert without habitations or any green thing, so that travelers are obliged to carry with them whatever they have need of. The region is so lofty and cold that you do not even see birds flying, and I must notice also that because of this great cold, fire does not burn so brightly, nor give out so much heat as usual, nor does it cook food so effectually. Now, if we go on with our journey towards the east-northeast, we travel a good forty days, continually passing over mountains and hills, or through valleys, and crossing many rivers and tracts of wilderness. And in all this way you find neither habitation of man nor any green thing, but must carry with you whatever you require. The country is called Bolor. The people dwell high up in the mountains and are savage idolaters, living only by the chase, and clothing themselves in the skins of beasts. They are in truth an evil race. End of section 26
seven of the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by rusticello da pisa translated by henry yule book first chapter thirty three of the kingdom of kaskar kaskar is a region lying between northeast and east and constituted a kingdom in former days but now it is subject to the great khan the people worship mohammed there are a good number of towns and villages but the greatest and finest is kaskar itself the inhabitants live by trade and handicrafts they have beautiful gardens and vineyards and fine estates and grow a great deal of cotton from this country many merchants go forth about the world on trading journeys the natives are a wretched niggardly set of people they eat and drink in miserable fashion there are in the country many nestorian christians who have churches of their own the people of the country have a peculiar language and the territory extends for five days journey chapter thirty four of the great city of samarkand samarkand is a great and noble city towards the northwest inhabited by both christians and saracens who are subject to the great khan's nephew kaidu by name he is however at bitter enmity with the khan i will tell you of a great marvel that happened at this city it is not a great while ago that sigate own brother to the great khan who was lord of this country and of many and one besides became a christian the Christians rejoiced greatly at this, and they built a great church in the city in honour of John the Baptist, and by his name the church was called. And they took a very fine stone which belonged to the Saracens, and placed it as the pedestal of a column in the middle of the church, supporting the roof. It came to pass, however, that Sigate died. Now the Saracens were full of rancour about that stone which had been theirs, and which had been set up in the church of the Christians, and when they saw that the prince was dead, they said one to another that now was the time to get back their stone, by fair means or by foul. And that they might well do, for they were ten times as many as the Christians. So they got together and went to the church and said that the stone they must and would have. The Christians acknowledged that it was theirs indeed, but offered to pay a large sum of money and so be quit. Howbeit the others replied that they never would give up the stone for anything in the world. And words ran so high that the prince heard thereof, and ordered the Christians either to arrange to satisfy the Saracens, if it might be, with money, or to give up the stone. And he allowed them three days to do either one thing or the other. What shall I tell you? Well, the Saracens would on no account agree to leave the stone where it was, and this out of pure despite to the Christians, for they knew well enough that if the stone were stirred, the church would come down by the run. So the Christians were in great trouble and wist not what to do. But they did the best thing possible. They besought Jesus Christ that he would consider their case, so that the holy church should not come to destruction, nor the name of its patron saint, John the Baptist, be tarnished by its ruin. And so, when the day fixed by the prince came round, they went to the church betimes in the morning, and lo, they found the stone removed from under the column. The foot of the column was without support, and yet it bore the load as stoutly as before. Between the foot of the column and the ground there was a space of three palms. So the Saracens had away their stone, 
and mighty little joy withal and it was a glorious miracle nay it is so for the column still so standeth and will stand as long as god pleaseth now let us quit this and continue our journey chapter thirty five of the province of yarkan yarkan is a province five days journey in extent the people follow the law of Mahomet, but there are also Nestorian and Jacobite Christians. They are subject to the same prince as I mentioned, the great Khan's nephew. They have plenty of everything, particularly cotton. The inhabitants are also great craftsmen, but a large proportion of them have swollen legs and great crops at the throat, which arises from some quality in the drinking water. As there is nothing else worth telling, we may pass on. Chapter 36 Of a province called Khotan Khotan is a province lying between northeast and east, and is eight days' journey in length. The people are subject to the great Khan, and are all worshippers of Mohammed. There are numerous towns and villages in the country, but Khotan, the capital, is the most noble of all, and it gives its name to the kingdom. Everything is to be had there in plenty, including abundance of cotton, with flax, hemp, wheat, wine, and the like. The people have vineyards and gardens and estates. They live by commerce and manufactures, and are no soldiers. Chapter 37 Of the Province of Pain Pain is a province five days in length, lying between east and northeast. The people are worshippers of Mohammed and subjects of the great Khan. There are a good number of towns and villages, but the most noble is Pain, the capital of the kingdom. There are rivers in this country in which quantities of jasper and chalcedony are found. The people have plenty of all products including cotton. They live by manufactures and trade. But they have a custom that I must relate. If the husband of any woman go away upon a journey and remain away for more than twenty days, as soon as that term is passed, the woman may marry another man, and the husband also may then marry whom he pleases. I should tell you that all the provinces that I have been speaking of, from Kaskar forward, and those I am going to mention, as far as the city of Lop, belong to Great Turkey. Chapter 38 Of the Province of Karchan Karchan is a province of Great Turkey, lying between northeast and east. The people worship Mohammed. There are numerous towns and villages, and the chief city of the kingdom bears its name, Karchan. The province contains rivers which bring down Jasper and Chalcedony, and these are carried for sale into Cathay, where they fetch great prices. The whole of the province is sandy, and so is the road all the way from Pain, and much of the water that you find is bitter and bad. However, at some places you do find fresh and sweet water. When an army passes through the land, the people escape with their wives, children and cattle a distance of two or three days' journey into the sandy waste, and knowing the spots where water is to be had, they are able to live there and to keep their cattle alive whilst it is impossible to discover them, for the wind immediately blows the sand over their track. Quitting Karchan, you ride some five days through the sands, finding none but bad and bitter water, and then you come to a place where the water is sweet. And now I will tell you of a province called Lop, in which there is a great city, also called Lop, which you come to at the end of those five days. It is at the entrance of the great desert, and it is here that travellers repose before entering on the desert. 
Chapter Thirty Nine of the City of Lop and the Great Desert. Lop is a large town at the edge of the desert, which is called the Desert of Lop, and is situated between east and northeast. It belongs to the Great Khan, and the people worship Mohammed. Now, such persons as propose to cross the desert take a week's rest in this town to refresh themselves and their cattle, and then they make ready for the journey, taking with them a month's supply for man and beast. On quitting this city they enter the desert. The length of this desert is so great that tis said it would take a year and more to ride from one end of it to the other, and here where its breadth is least it takes a month to cross it. Tis all composed of hills and valleys of sand, and not a thing to eat is to be found on it. But after riding for a day and a night, you find fresh water, enough mayhap for some fifty or a hundred persons with their beasts, but not for more. And all across the desert you will find water in like manner, that is to say, in some twenty-eight places altogether you will find good water, but no great quantity, and in four places also you find brackish water. Beasts there are none, for there is naught for them to eat. But there is a marvellous thing related of this desert, which is that when travellers are on the move by night, and one of them chances to lag behind, or to fall asleep, or the like, when he tries to gain his company again, he will hear spirits talking, and will suppose them to be his comrades. Sometimes the spirits will call him by name, and thus shall a traveller oft times be led astray so that he never finds his party. And in this way many have perished. Sometimes the stray travellers will hear as it were the tramp and hum of a great cavalcade of people away from the real line of road and taking this to be their own company they will follow the sound and when day breaks they find that a cheat has been put on them and that they are in an ill plight even in the daytime one hears those spirits talking and sometimes you shall hear the sound of a variety of music instruments and still more commonly the sound of drums Hence, in making this journey, it is customary for travellers to keep close together. All the animals, too, have bells at their necks, so that they cannot easily get astray. And at sleeping time a signal is put up to show the direction of the next march. So thus it is that the desert is crossed. End of section 27 Reading by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. And twenty eight of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Section 28, Book 1st, Chapters 40 to 44. Concerning the great province of Tangut, of the province of Camu, of the province of Chingintalas, of the province of Sukchur, of the city of Campichu. Chapter 40. Concerning the great province of Tangut. After you have travelled thirty days through the desert, as I have described, you come to a city called Satyu, lying between northeast and east. It belongs to the Great Khan, and is in a province called Tangut. The people are for the most parts idolaters, but there are also some Nestorian Christians and some Saracens. 
the idolaters have a peculiar language and are no traders but live by their agriculture they have a great many abbeys and minsters full of idols of sundry fashions to which they pay great honour and reverence worshipping them and sacrificing to them with much ado for example such as have children will feed up a sheep in honour of the idol and at the new year or on the day of the idol's feast they will take their children and the sheep along with them into the presence of the idol with great ceremony then they will have the sheep slaughtered and cooked and again present it before the idol with like reverence and leave it there before him whilst they are reciting the offices of their worship and their prayers for the idol's blessing on their children and if you will believe them the idol feeds on the meat that is set before it after these ceremonies they take up the flesh and carry it home and call together all their kindred to eat it with them in great festivity the idol priests receiving for their portion the head feet entrails and skin with some part of the meat after they have eaten they collect the bones that are left and store them carefully in a hutch and you must know that all the idolaters in the world burn their dead and when they are going to carry a body to the burning the kinsfolk build a wooden house on the way to the spot and drape it with cloths of silk and gold when the body is going past this building they call a halt and set before it wine and meat and other eatables and this they do with the assurance that the defunct will be received with the like attentions in the other world all the minstrelsy in the town goes playing before the body and when it reaches the burning place the kinsfolk are prepared with figures cut out of parchment and paper in the shape of men and horses and camels and also with round pieces of paper like gold coins and all these they burn along with a corpse for they say that in the other world the defunct will be provided with slaves and cattle and money just in proportion to the amount of such pieces of paper that has been burnt along with him but they never burn their dead until they have sent for the astrologers and told them the year the day and the hour of the deceased person's birth and when the astrologers have ascertained under what constellation planet and sign he was born they declare the day on which by the rules of their art he ought to be burnt until that day arrive they keep the body so that it is sometimes a matter of six months more or less before it comes to be burnt now the way they keep the body in the house is this they make a coffin first of a good span in thickness very carefully joined and daintily painted this they fill up with camphor and spices to keep off corruption stopping the joints with pitch and lime and then they cover it with a fine cloth every day as long as the body is kept they set a table before the dead covered with food and they will have it that the soul comes and eats and drinks wherefore they leave the food there as long as would be necessary in order that one should partake thus they do daily and worse still sometimes those soothsayers shall tell them that tis not good luck to carry out the corpse by the door so they have to break a hole in the wall and to draw it out that way when it is taken to the burning and these i assure you are the practices of all the idolaters of those countries however we will quit this subject and i will tell you of another city which lies towards the northwest at the extremity of the desert book first chapter forty one of the province of kamul kamul is a province which in former days was a kingdom it contains numerous towns and villages but the chief city bears the name of Kamul. The province lies between the two deserts, for on the one side is the great desert of Lop, and on the other side is a small desert of three days' journey in extent. The people are all idolaters and have a peculiar language. They live by the fruits of the earth, which they have in plenty, and dispose of to travellers. They are a people who take things very easily. For they mind nothing but playing and singing and dancing and enjoying themselves and it is the truth that if a foreigner comes to the house of one of these people to lodge the host is delighted and desires his wife to put herself entirely at the guest's disposal 
whilst he himself gets out of the way and comes back no more until the stranger shall have taken his departure the guest may stay and enjoy the wife's society as long as he lists while the husband has no shame in the matter but indeed considers it an honour and all the men of this province are made whittles of by their wives in this way the women themselves are fair and wanton now it came to pass during the reign of mangu khan that as lord of this province he came to hear of this custom and he sent forth an order commanding them under grievous penalties to do so no more but to provide public hostelries for travellers and when they heard this order they were much vexed thereat for about three years space they carried it out but then they found that their lands were no longer fruitful and that many mishaps befell them so they collected together and prepared a grand present which they sent to their lord praying him graciously to let them retain the custom which they had inherited from their ancestors for it was by reason of this usage that their gods bestowed upon them all the good things that they possessed and without it they saw not how they could continue to exist when the prince had heard their petition his reply was since ye must needs keep your shame keep it then and so he left them at liberty to maintain their naughty custom and they always have kept it up and do so still now let us quit Kamul, and i will tell you of another province which lies between northwest and north and belongs to the great khan book first chapter forty two of the province of chingintalus chingintalus is also a province on the verge of the desert and lying between northwest and north it has an extent of sixteen days journey and belongs to the great khan and contains numerous towns and villages there are three different races of people in it idolaters saracens and some nestorian christians at the northern extremity of this province there is a mountain in which are excellent veins of steel and ondanique and you must know that in the same mountain there is a vein of the substance from which salamander is made for the real truth is that the salamander is no beast as they allege in our part of the world but is a substance found in the earth and i will tell you about it everybody must be aware that it can be no animal's nature to live in fire seeing that every animal is composed of all the four elements now i marco polo had a turkish acquaintance of the name of zulfikar and he was a very clever fellow and this turk related to messer marco polo how he had lived three years in that region on behalf of the great khan in order to procure those salamanders for him he said that the way they got them was by digging in that mountain till they found a certain vein the substance of this vein was then taken and crushed and when so treated it divides as if it were into fibres of wool which they set forth to dry when dry these fibres were pounded in a great copper mortar and then washed so as to remove all the earth and to leave only the fibres like fibres of wool these were then spun and made into napkins when first made these napkins are not very white but by putting them into the fire for a while they come out as white as snow and so again whenever they become dirty they are bleached by putting them in the fire now this and naught else is the truth about the salamander and the people of the country all say the same any other account is the matter of fabulous nonsense and i may add that they have at rome a napkin of this stuff which the grand khan sent to the pope to make a wrapper for the holy sudarium of jesus christ we will now quit this subject and i will proceed with my account of the countries lying in the direction between northeast and east book first chapter forty three of the province of Sukchu. on leaving the province of which i spoke before you ride ten days between northeast and east and in all that way you find no human dwelling or next to none so that there is nothing for our book to speak of at the end of those ten days you come to another province called Sukchu in which there are numerous towns and villages the chief city is called Sukchu. 
the people are partly christians and partly idolaters and are all subject to the great khan the great general province to which all these three provinces belong is called tangut over all the mountains of this province rhubarb is found in great abundance and thither merchants come to buy it and carry it thence all over the world travellers however dare not visit those mountains with any cattle but those of the country for a certain plant grows there which is so poisonous that cattle which eat it lose their hoofs the cattle of the country know it and eschew it the people live by agriculture and have not much trade they are of a brown complexion the whole of the province is healthy book first chapter forty four of the city of campichu campichu is also a city of tangut and a very great and noble one indeed it is the capital and place of government of the whole province of tangut the people are idolaters saracens and christians and the latter have three very fine churches in the city whilst the idolaters have many minsters and abbeys after their fashion in these they have an enormous number of idols both small and great certain of the latter being a good ten paces in stature some of them being of wood others of clay and others yet of stone they are all highly polished and then covered with gold the great idols of which i speak lie at length and round about them there are other figures of considerable size as if adoring and paying homage before them now as i have not yet given you particulars about the customs of these idolaters i will proceed to tell you about them you must know that there are among them certain religious recluses who lead a more virtuous life than the rest these abstain from all lechery though they do not indeed regard it as a deadly sin howbeit if any one sin against nature they condemn him to death they have an ecclesiastical calendar as we have and there are five days in the month that they observe particularly and on these five days they would on no account either slaughter any animal or eat flesh meat on those days moreover they observe much greater abstinence altogether than on other days among these people a man may take thirty wives more or less if he can but afford to do so each having wives in proportion to his wealth and means but the first wife is always held in highest consideration the men endow their wives with cattle slaves and money according to their ability and if a man dislikes any one of his wives he just turns her off and takes another they take to wife their cousins and their father's widows always excepting the man's own mother holding to be no sin many things that we think grievous sins and in short they live like beasts messer maffeo and messer marco polo dwelt a whole year in this city when on a mission now we will leave this and tell you about other provinces towards the north for we are going to take you a sixty days journey in that direction End of section 28section 29 of the book of ser marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of ser marco polo the venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book 1st. Chapter 45 of the City of Etzina. When you leave the city of Campichu, you ride for twelve days and then reach a city called Etzina which is towards the north on the verge of the sand desert. It belongs to the province of Tangut. The people are idolaters and possess plenty of camels and cattle and the country produces a number of good falcons, both sackers and laners. 
the inhabitants live by their cultivation and their cattle for they have no trade at this city you must needs lay in victuals for forty days because when you quit at zena you enter on a desert which extends for forty days journey to the north and on which you meet no habitation nor baiting place in the summer time indeed you will fall in with people but in the winter the cold is too great you also meet with wild beasts for there are some small wood pines here and there and with numbers of wild asses when you have travelled these forty days across the desert you come to a certain province lying to the north its name you shall hear presently chapter forty six of the city of karakoran karakoran is a city some three miles in compass it is surrounded by a strong earthen rampart for stone is scarce there and beside it there is a great citadel wherein is a fine palace in which the governor resides tis the first city that the tartars possessed after they issued from their own country and now i will tell you all about how they first acquired dominion and spread over the world originally the tartars dwelt in the north on the borders of korcha their country was one of great plains there were no towns or villages in it but excellent pasture lands with great rivers and many sheets of water in fact it was a very fine and extensive region but there was no sovereign in the land they did however pay tax and tribute to a great prince who was called in their tongue unk khan the same that we call prester john him in fact about whose great dominion all the world talks the tribute he had of them was one beast out of every ten and also a tithe of all their other gear now it came to pass that the tartars multiplied exceedingly and when prester john saw how great a people they had become he began to fear that he should have trouble from them so he made a scheme to distribute them over sundry countries and sent one of his barons to carry this out when the tartars became aware of this they took it much amiss and with one consent they left their country and went off across a desert to a distant region towards the north where prester john could not get at them to annoy them thus they revolted from his authority and paid him tribute no longer and so things continued for a time chapter forty seven of chinggis and how he became the first khan of the tartars now it came to pass in the year of christ's incarnation eleven eighty seven that the tartars made them a king whose name was chinggis khan he was a man of great worth and of great ability eloquence and valour and as soon as the news that he had been chosen king was spread abroad through those countries all the tartars in the world came to him and owned him for their lord and right well did he maintain the sovereignty they had given him what shall i say the tartars gathered to him in astonishing multitude and when he saw such numbers he made a great furniture of spears and arrows and such other arms as they used and set upon the conquest of all those regions till he had conquered eight provinces when he conquered a province he did no harm to the people or their property but merely established some of his own men in the country along with a proportion of theirs whilst he led the remainder to the conquest of other provinces and when those whom he had conquered became aware how well and safely he protected them against all others and how they suffered no ill at his hands and saw what a noble prince he was then they joined him heart and soul and became his devoted followers and when he had thus gathered such a multitude that they seemed to cover the earth he began to think of conquering a great part of the world 
now in the year of christ twelve hundred he sent an embassy to prester john and desired to have his daughter to wife but when prester john heard that chinggis khan demanded his daughter in marriage he waxed very wroth and said to the envoys what impudence is this to ask my daughter to wife wist he not well that he was my liegeman and serf get ye back to him and tell him that i had liever set my daughter in the fire than give her in marriage to him and that he deserves death at my hand rebel and traitor that he is so he bade the envoys be gone at once and never come into his presence again the envoys on receiving this reply departed straightway and made haste to their master and related all that prester john had ordered them to say keeping nothing back chapter forty eight how chinggis mustered his people to march against prester john when chinggis khan heard the brutal message that prester john had sent him such a rage seized him that his heart came nigh to bursting within him for he was a man of a very lofty spirit at last he spoke and that so loud that all who were present could hear him never more might he be prince if he took not revenge for the brutal message of prester john and such revenge that insult never in this world was so dearly paid for and before long prester john should know whether he was his serf or no so then he mustered all his forces and levied such a host as never before was seen or heard of sending word to prester john to be on his defence and when prester john had sure tidings that chinggis was really coming against him with such a multitude he still professed to treat it as a jest and a trifle for quoth he these be no soldiers natheless he marshalled his forces and mustered his people and made great preparations in order that if chinggis did come he might take him and put him to death in fact he marshalled such a host of many different nations that it was a world's wonder both sides get them ready to battle and why should i make a long story of it chinggis khan with all his host arrived at a vast and beautiful plain which was called tanduk belonging to prester john and there he pitched his camp and so great was the multitude of his people that it was impossible to number them and when he got tidings that prester john was coming he rejoiced greatly for the place afforded a fine and ample battle-ground so he was right glad to tarry for him there and greatly longed for his arrival but now leave we chinggis and his host and let us return to prester john and his people chapter forty nine how prester john marched to meet chinggis now the story goes that when prester john became aware that chinggis with his host was marching against him he went forth to meet him with all his forces and advanced until he reached the same plain of tanduk and pitched his camp over against that of chinggis khan at a distance of twenty miles and then both armies remained at rest for two days that they might be fresher and heartier for battle so when the two great hosts were pitched on the plains of tanduk as you have heard chinggis khan one day summoned before him his astrologers both christian and saracen and desired them to let him know which of the two hosts would gain the battle his own or prester john's the saracens tried to ascertain but were unable to give a true answer the christians however did give a true answer and showed manifestly beforehand how the event should be for they got a cane and split it lengthwise and laid one half on this side and one half on that allowing no one to touch the pieces and one of the pieces of cane they called chinggis khan and the other piece they called prester john and then they said to chinggis 
Now mark, and you will see the event of the battle, and who shall have the best of it. For whose cain soever shall be above the other, to him shall victory be. He replied that he would fain see it, and bade them begin. Then the Christian astrologers read a psalm out of the Psalter, and went through other incantations. And lo, whilst all were beholding, the cane that bore the name of Chinggis Khan, without being touched by anybody, advanced to the other that bore the name of Prester John, and got on top of it. When the prince saw that, he was greatly delighted, and seeing how this matter had found the Christians to tell the truth, he always treated them with great respect, and held them for men of truth for ever after. Chapter 50 The Battle Between Chinggis Khan and Prester John And after both sides had rested well those two days, they armed for the fight and engaged in desperate combat, and it was the greatest battle that was ever seen. The numbers that were slain on both sides were very great, but in the end Chinggis Khan obtained the victory, and in the battle Prester John was slain. And from that time forward, day by day, his kingdom passed into the hands of Chinggis Khan till the whole was conquered. I may tell you that Chinggis Khan reigned six years after this battle, engaged continually in conquest and in taking many a province and city and stronghold. But at the end of those six years he went against a certain castle that was called Kaju, and there he was shot with an arrow in the knee so that he died of his wound. A great pity it was, for he was a valiant man and a wise. I will now tell you who reigned after Chinggis, and then about the manners and customs of the Tartars. Chapter 51 Of those who did reign after Chinggis Khan, and of the customs of the Tartars. Now the next that reigned after Chinggis Khan, their first lord, was Q Khan, and the third prince was Batu Khan, and the fourth was Alaku Khan, and the fifth Mongu Khan, and the sixth Kubla Khan, who is the sovereign now reigning, and is more potent than any of the five who went before him. In fact, if you were to take all those five together, they would not be so powerful as he is. Nay, I will say yet more, for if you were to put together all the Christians in the world, with their emperors and their kings, the whole of these Christians, I, and throw in the Saracens to boot, would not have such power or be able to do so much as this Kubla, who is the lord of all the Tartars in the world, those of the Levant and of the Ponent included, for these are all liegemen and subjects. I mean to show you all about this great power of his in this book of ours. You should be told also that all the great Khans and all the descendants of Chinggis, their first lord, are carried to a mountain that is called Altay to be interred. Wheresoever the sovereign may die, he is carried to his burial in that mountain with his predecessors. No matter that the place of his death were a hundred days' journey distance, thither must he be carried to his burial. Let me tell you a strange thing too. When they are carrying the body of any emperor to be buried with the others, the convoy that goes with the body doth put to the sword all whom they fall in with on the road, saying, Go and wait upon your lord in the other world. For they do in sooth believe that all such as they slay in this manner do go to serve their lord in the other world. They do the same too with horses, for when the emperor dies they kill all his best horses in order that he may have the use of them in the other world as they believe. And I tell you as a certain truth that when Mongu Khan died more than twenty thousand persons who chanced to meet the body on its way, were slain in the manner that I have told. End of section 29 Reading by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England
30 of The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Book First, Chapters 52 to 54. Chapter 52 Concerning the Customs of the Tartars. Now that we have begun to speak of the Tartars, I have plenty to tell you on that subject. The Tartar custom is to spend the winter in warm plains where they find good pasture for their cattle, whilst in summer they betake themselves to a cool climate among the mountains and valleys where water is to be found, as well as woods and pastures. Their houses are circular, and are made of wands covered with felts. These are carried along with them whithersoever they go, for the wands are so strongly bound together, and likewise so well combined, that the frame can be made very light. Whenever they erect these huts, the door is always to the south. They also have wagons covered with black felt so efficaciously that no rain can get in. These are drawn by oxen and camels, and the women and children travel in them. The women do the buying and selling, and whatever is necessary to provide for the husband and household, for the men all lead the life of gentlemen, troubling themselves about nothing but hunting and hawking, and looking after the goshawks and falcons, unless it be the practice of warlike exercises. They live on the milk and meat which their herds supply, and on the produce of the chase, and they eat all kinds of flesh, including that of horses and dogs, and pharaoh's rats, of which last there are great numbers in burrows on those plains. Their drink is mass milk. They are very careful not to meddle with each other's wives, and will not do so on any account, holding that to be an evil and abominable thing. The women, too, are very good and loyal to their husbands, and notable housewives withal. Ten or twenty of them will dwell together in charming peace and unity, nor shall you ever hear an ill word among them. The marriage customs of Tartars are as follows. Any man may take a hundred wives, and he so please, and if he be able to keep them. But the first wife is ever held most in honour, and as the most legitimate and the same applies to the sons whom she may bear. The husband gives a marriage payment to his wife's mother, and the wife brings nothing to her husband. They have more children than other people because they have so many wives. They may marry their cousins, and if a father dies, his son may take any of the wives, his own mother always excepted. That is to say, the eldest son may do this, but no other. A man may also take the wife of his own brother, after the latter's death. Their weddings are celebrated with great ado. Chapter 53 Concerning the God of the Tartars This is the fashion of their religion. They say there is a most high God of heaven, whom they worship daily with thurible and incense, but they pray to him only for health of mind and body. But they have also a certain other god of theirs called Natigai, and they say he is the god of the earth, who watches over their children, cattle and crops. They show him great worship and honour, and every man hath a figure of him in his house, made of felt and cloth, and they also make in the same manner images of his wife and children. The wife they put on the left hand and the children in front. And when they eat, they take the fat of the meat and grease the god's mouth with all as well as the mouths of his wife and children. Then they take off the broth and sprinkle it before the door of the house, and that done, they deem that their god and his family have had their share of the dinner. Their drink is mare's milk, prepared in such a way that you would take it for white wine, and a right good drink it is, called by them camise. The clothes of the wealthy Tartars are for the most part of gold and silk stuffs, lined with costly furs, such as sable and ermine, vair and fox-skin, in the richest fashion. 
Chapter 54 Concerning the Tartar Customs of War All their harness of war is excellent and costly. Their arms are bows and arrows, sword and mace, but above all the bow, for they are capital archers, indeed the best that are known. On their backs they wear armour of curbuli, prepared from buffalo and other hides, which is very strong. They are excellent soldiers, and passing valiant in battle. They are also more capable of hardships than other nations, for many a time, if need be, they will go for a month without any supply of food, living only on the milk of their mares and on such game as their bows may win them. Their horses also will subsist entirely on the grass of the plains, so that there is no need to carry store of barley or straw or oats, and they are very docile to their riders. These, in case of need, will abide on horseback the livelong night, armed at all points, while the horse will be continually grazing. Of all troops in the world, these are they which endure the greatest hardship and fatigue, and which cost the least, and they are the best of all for making wide conquests of country. And this you will perceive from what you have heard and shall hear in this book, and, as a fact, there can be no manner of doubt that now they are the masters of the biggest half of the world. Their troops are admirably ordered in the manner that I shall now relate. You see, when a Tartar prince goes forth to war, he takes with him, say, one hundred thousand horse. Well, he appoints an officer to every ten man, one to every hundred, one to every thousand, and one to every ten thousand, so that his own orders have to be given to ten persons only, and each of these ten persons has to pass the orders only to other ten, and so on no one having to give orders to more than ten. And every one in turn is responsible only to the officer immediately over him, and the discipline and order that comes of this method is marvellous, for they are a people very obedient to their chiefs. Further, they call the corps of one hundred thousand men a tuck, that of ten thousand they call a toman, the thousand they call blank, the hundred Guz, the ten, blank. And when the army is on the march, they have always two hundred horsemen, very well mounted, who are sent a distance of two marches in advance to reconnoitre, and these always keep ahead. They have a similar party detached in the rear, and on either flank, so that there is a good lookout kept on all sides against the surprise. When they are going on a distant expedition, they take no gear with them except two leather bottles for milk a little earthenware pot to cook their meat in, and a little tent to shelter them from rain. And in case of great urgency, they will ride ten days on end without lighting a fire or taking a meal. On such an occasion they will sustain themselves on the blood of their horses, opening a vein and letting the blood just into their mouths, drinking till they have had enough, and then staunching it. They also have milk dried into a kind of paste to carry with them, and when they need food they put this in water, and beat it up till it dissolves, and then drink it. It is prepared in this way. They boil the milk, and when the rich part floats on the top, they skim it into another vessel, and of that they make butter, for the milk will not become solid till this is removed. Then they put the milk in the sun to dry, and when they go on an expedition, every man takes some ten pounds of this dried milk with him and of a morning he will take a half pound of it and put it in his leather bottle, with as much water as he pleases. So as he rides along, the milk paste and the water in the bottle get well churned together into a kind of pap, and that makes his dinner. When they come to an engagement with the enemy, they will gain the victory in this fashion. They never let themselves get into a regular medley, but keep perpetually riding round and shooting into the enemy and as they do not count it any shame to run away in battle, they will sometimes pretend to do so, and in running away they turn in the saddle and shoot hard and strong at the foe, and in this way make great havoc. Their horses are trained so perfectly that they will double hither and thither just like a dog, in a way that is quite astonishing. Thus they fight to as good purpose in running away as if they stood and faced the enemy because of the vast volleys of arrows that they shoot in this way, 
turning round upon their pursuers, who are fancying that they have won the battle. But when the Tartars see that they have killed and wounded a good many horses and men, they wheel round bodily, and return to the charge in perfect order and with loud cries, and in a very short time the enemy are routed. In truth they are stout and valiant soldiers, and inured to war. And you perceive that it is just when the enemy sees them run, and imagines that he has gained the battle, that he has in reality lost it. For the Tartars wheel round in a moment when they judge the right time has come. And after this fashion they have won many a fight. All this that I have been telling you is true of the manners and customs of the genuine Tartars. But I must add also that in these days they are greatly degenerated, for those who are settled in Cathay have taken up the practices of the idolaters of the country, and have abandoned their own institutions, whilst those who have settled in the Levant have adopted the customs of the Saracens. End of section 30— Of the Book of Ser Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Book of Ser Marco Polo, The Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. By Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule, section thirty one, book first, chapters fifty five to fifty eight, concerning the administering of justice among the Tartars, sundry particulars on the plain beyond Karakoran, of the kingdom of Urguil, and province of Sinju, of the kingdom of Egrigaya, book first, chapter fifty five. Concerning the administering of justice among the Tartars. The way they administer justice is this. When anyone has committed a petty theft, they give him, under the orders of authority, seven blows of a stick, or seventeen, or twenty-seven, or thirty-seven, or forty-seven, and so forth, always increasing by tens in proportion to the injury done, and running up to one hundred and seven. Of these beatings, sometimes they die. But if the offence be horse-stealing, or some other great matter, they cut the thief in two with a sword. Howbeit, if he be able to ransom himself by paying nine times the value of the thing stolen, he is let off. Every lord or other person who possesses beasts has them marked with his peculiar brand, be they horses, mares, camels, oxen, cows, or other great cattle and then they are sent abroad to graze over the plains without any keeper they get all mixed together but eventually every beast is recovered by means of its owner's brand which is known for their sheep and goats they have shepherds all their cattle are remarkably fine big and in good condition they have another notable custom which is this if any man have a daughter who dies before marriage and another man have had a son also die before marriage. The parents of the two arrange a grand wedding between the dead lad and lass. And marry them they do, making a regular contract. And when the contract papers are made out, they put them in the fire, in order, as they will have it, that the parties in the other world may know the fact, and so look on each other as man and wife. And the parents thenceforward consider themselves sib to each other, just as if their children had lived and married. Whatever may be agreed on between the parties as dowry, those who have to pay it cause to be painted on pieces of paper, and then put these in the fire, saying that in that way the dead person will get all the real articles in the other world. Now I have told you all about the manners and customs of the Tartars, but you have heard nothing yet of the great state of the Grand Khan, who is the lord of all the Tartars, and of the supreme imperial court all that i will tell you in this book in proper time and place but meanwhile i must return to my story which i left off in that great plain when we began to speak of the tartars book first chapter fifty six 
sundry particulars of the plain beyond Caracaron. And when you leave Caracaron and the Alte, in which they bury the bodies of the Tartar sovereigns, as I told you, you go north for forty days till you reach a country called the Plain of Bargu. The people there are called Mescrit. They are a very wild race, and live by their cattle, the most of which are stags, and these stags, I assure you, they used to ride upon. Their customs are like those of the Tartars, and they are subject to the great Khan. They have neither corn nor wine. They get birds for food, for the country is full of lakes and pools and marshes, which are much frequented by the birds when they are moulting, and when they have quite cast their feathers and can't fly, those people catch them. They also live partly on fish. And when you have travelled forty days over this great plain, you come to the ocean, at the place where the mountains are, in which the peregrine falcons have their nests. And in those mountains it is so cold, that you find neither man or woman, nor beast nor bird, except one kind of bird, called Barguelac, on which the falcons feed. They are as big as partridges, and have feet like those of parrots, and a tail like a swallow's and are very strong in flight, and when the grand calm wants peregrines from the nest, he sends thither to procure them. It is also on islands in that sea that the gerfalcons are bred. You must know that the place is so far to the north that you leave the north star somewhat behind you towards the south. The gerfalcons are so abundant there that the emperor can have as many as he likes to send for. And you must not suppose that those gerfalcons, which the Christians carry into the Tartar dominions, go to the great Khan. They are carried only to the Prince of the Levant. Now I have told you all about the provinces northward, as far as the ocean sea, beyond which there is no more land at all. So I shall proceed to tell you of the other provinces on the way to the Grand Khan. Let us then return to that province of which I spoke before called Campichu. Book First, Chapter 57 Of the Kingdom of Erguil and Province of Sinju On leaving Campichu, then, you travel five days across a tract in which many spirits are heard speaking in the night season, and at the end of those five marches towards the east you come to a kingdom called Erguil, belonging to the great Khan. It is one of the several kingdoms which make up the great province of Tangut. The people consist of Nestorian Christians, idolaters, and worshippers of Mahomet. There are plenty of cities in this kingdom, but the capital is called Erguil. You can travel in a southeasterly direction from this place into the province of Cathay. Should you follow that road to the southeast, you come to a city called Sinju, belonging also to Tangut, and subject to the great Khan which has under it many towns and villages. The population is composed of idolaters and worshippers of Mohammed, but there are some Christians also. There are wild cattle in that country, almost as big as elephants, splendid creatures, covered everywhere but on the back with shaggy hair, a good four palms long. They are partly black, partly white, and really wonderfully fine creatures, and the hair or wool is extremely fine and white, finer and whiter than silk. Messer Marco brought some to Venice as a great curiosity, and so it was reckoned by those who saw it. There are plenty of them tame, which have been caught young. They also cross these with the common cow, and the cattle from this cross are wonderful beasts, and better for work than other animals. These the people use commonly for burden and general work, and in the plough as well and at the latter they will do full twice as much work as any other cattle, being such very strong beasts. In this country, too, is found the best musk in the world, and I will tell you how tis produced. There exists in that region a kind of wild animal like a gazelle. It has feet and tail like the gazelles, and stag's hair of a very coarse kind, but no horns. It has four tusks, two below and two above, about three inches long and slender in form one pair growing upwards and the other downwards it is a very pretty creature 
the musk is found in this way when the creature has been taken they find at the navel between the flesh and the skin something like an imposthume full of blood which they cut out and remove with all the skin attached to it and the blood inside this imposthume is the musk that produces that powerful perfume there is an immense number of these beasts in the country we are speaking of the flesh is very good to eat Messer Marco brought the dried head and feet of one of these animals to Venice with him The people are traders and artisans and also grow abundance of corn the province has an extent of 26 days journey Pheasants are found there twice as big as ours indeed nearly as big as a peacock and having tails of seven to ten palms in length and besides them other pheasants in aspect like our own and birds of many other kinds and of beautiful variegated plumage the people who are idolaters are fat folks with little noses and black hair and no beard except a few hairs on the upper lip the women too have very smooth and white skins and in every respect are pretty creatures the men are very sensual and marry many wives which is not forbidden by their religion no matter how base a woman's descent may be if she have beauty she may find a husband among the greatest men in the land the man paying the girl's father and mother a great sum of money according to the bargain that may be made book first chapter fifty eight of the kingdom of egregia starting again from egwil you ride eastward for eight days and then come to a province called egregia containing numerous cities and villages and belonging to tangut the capital city is called Kalachan. The people are chiefly idolaters, but there are fine churches belonging to the Nestorian Christians. They are all subjects of the great Khan. They make in this city great quantities of camlets of camel's wool, the finest in the world, and some of the camlets that they make are white, for they have white camels, and these are the best of all. Merchants purchase these stuffs here and carry them all over the world for sale. We shall now proceed eastward from this place and enter the territory that was formerly Prester John's. End of section 31thirty two of the Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Roberts. The Book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Book First. Chapters 59 to 61. Chapter 59 Concerning the Province of Tinduk and the Descendants of Prester John. Tinduk is a province which lies towards the east and contains numerous towns and villages, among which is the chief city also called Tinduk. The king of the province is of the lineage of Prester John, George by name, and he holds the land under the great Khan. Not that he holds anything like the whole of what Prester John possessed. It is a custom, I may tell you, that these kings of the lineage of Prester John always obtain to wife either daughters of the great Khan or other princesses of his family. In this province is found the stone from which azure is made. It is obtained from a kind of vein in the earth and is of very fine quality. There is also a great manufacture of fine camlets of different colors from camel's hair. The people get their living by their cattle and tillage as well as by trade and handicraft. The rule of the province is in the hands of the Christians, as I have told you, but there are also plenty of idolaters and worshippers of Mahomet. And there is also here a class of people called Argons, which is as much as to say in French Guasmul, or in other words, sprung from two different races, to wit, of the race of the idolaters of Tenduk, and of that of the worshippers of Mahomet. They are handsomer men than the other natives of the country, and having more ability, they come to have authority, and they are also capital merchants. You must know that it was in this same capital city of Tenduk that Prester John had the seat of his government when he ruled over the Tartars, and his heirs still abide there, for, as I have told you, this King George is of his line, 
In fact, he is the sixth in descent from Prester John. Here also is what we call the country of Gog and Magog. They, however, call it Ong and Mungal, after the names of two races of people that existed in that province before the migration of the Tartars. Ong was the title of the people of the country, and Mongol a name sometimes applied to the Tartars. And when you have ridden seven days eastward through this province, you can get near the provinces of Cathay. You find throughout those seven days' journey plenty of towns and villages, the inhabitants of which are Mohammedans, but with a mixture also of idolaters and Nestorian Christians. They get their living by trade and manufactures, weaving those fine cloths of gold which are called nasich and nukes, besides silk stuffs of many other kinds. For just as we have cloths of wool in our country, manufactured in a great variety of kinds, so in those regions they have stuffs of silk and gold in like variety. All this region is subject to the great Khan. There is a city you come to called Sindachu where they carry on a great many crafts such as provide for the equipment of the emperor's troops. In a mountain of the province there is a very good silver mine, from which much silver is got. The place is called Idifu. The country is well stocked with game, both beast and bird. Now we will quit that province and go three days' journey forward. Chapter 60 Concerning the Khan's Palace of Chaganor At the end of those three days, you find a city called Chagan Nor, which is as much as to say White Pool, at which there is a great palace of the Grand Khans, and he likes much to reside there on account of the lakes and rivers in the neighborhood, which are the haunt of swans and of a great variety of other birds. The adjoining plains, too, abound with cranes, partridges, pheasants, and other game birds, so that the emperor takes all the more delight in staying there in order to go a-hawking with his jerfalcons and other falcons, a sport of which he is very fond. There are five different kinds of cranes found in those tracks, as I shall tell you. First, there is one which is very big, and all over as black as a crow. The second kind, again, is all white, and is the biggest of all. Its wings are really beautiful, for they are adorned with round eyes like those of a peacock, but of a resplendent golden color, whilst the head is red and black on a white ground. The third kind is the same as ours. The fourth is a small kind, having at the ears beautiful long pendant feathers of red and black. The fifth kind is gray all over, and of great size, with a handsome head red and black. Near this city there is a valley in which the emperor has had several little houses erected, in which he keeps in mew a large number of cators, which are what we call the great partridge. You would be astonished to see what a quantity there are, with men to take charge of them. So whenever the Khan visits the place, he is furnished with as many as he wants. Chapter 61 Of the City of Chandu and the Khan's Palace There And when you have ridden three days from the city last mentioned, between northeast and north, you come to a city called Chandu, which was built by the Khan now reigning. There is, at this place, a very fine marble palace, the rooms of which are all gilt and painted with figures of men and beasts and birds, and with a variety of trees and flowers, all executed with such exquisite art that you regard them with delight and astonishment. Round this palace a wall is built, enclosing a compass of sixteen miles, and inside the park there are fountains and rivers and brooks and beautiful meadows with all kinds of wild animals, excluding such as are of ferocious nature which the emperor has procured and placed there to supply food for his jerfalcons and hawks, which he keeps there in mew. Of these there are more than two hundred jerfalcons alone, without reckoning the other hawks. The Khan himself goes every week to see his bird sitting in mew, and sometimes he rides through the park with a leopard behind him on his horse's croup, and then if he sees any animal that takes his fancy, he slips his leopard at it, and the game, when taken, is made over to feed the hawks and mew. This he does for diversion. Moreover, at a spot in the park where there is a charming wood, he has another palace built of cane, of which I must give you a description. It is gilt all over, and most elaborately finished inside. It is stayed on gilt and lacquered columns, on each of which is a dragon all gilt, the tail of which is attached to the column, whilst the head supports the architrave, and the claws likewise are stretched out right and left to support the architrave. 
The roof, like the rest, is formed of canes, covered with a varnish so strong and excellent that no amount of rain will rot them. These canes are a good three palms in girth, and from ten to fifteen paces in length. They are cut across at each knot, and then the pieces are split so as to form from each two hollow tiles, and with these the house is roofed. Only every such tile of cane has to be nailed down to prevent the wind from lifting it. In short, the whole palace is built of these canes, which, I may mention, serve also for a great variety of other useful purposes. The construction of the palace is so devised that it can be taken down and put up again with great celerity, and it can all be taken to pieces and removed whithersoever the emperor may command. When erected, it is braced, against mishaps from the wind, by more than two hundred cords of silk. The Lord abides at this park of his, dwelling sometimes in the marble palace, and sometimes in the cane palace, for three months of the year, to wit June, July, and August, preferring this residence because it is by no means hot. In fact, it is a very cool place. When the twenty-eighth day of the moon of August arrives, he takes his departure, and the cane palace is taken to pieces. But I must tell you what happens when he goes away from this palace every year on the twenty-eighth of the August moon. You must know that the Khan keeps an immense stud of white horses and mares, in fact more than ten thousand of them, and all pure white without a speck. The milk of these mares is drunk by himself and his family, and by none else, except by those of one great tribe that have also the privilege of drinking it. This privilege was granted them by Chinggis Khan, on account of a certain victory that they helped him to win long ago. The name of the tribe is Horiad. Now when these mares are passing across the country, and any one falls in with them, be he the greatest lord in the land, he must not presume to pass until the mares have gone by. He must either tarry where he is, or go a half day's journey round if need so be, so as not to come nigh them, for they are to be treated with the greatest respect. Well, when the Lord sets out from the park on the 28th of August, as I told you, the milk of all those mares is taken and sprinkled on the ground, and this is done on the injunction of the idolaters and idol priests, who say that it is an excellent thing to sprinkle that milk on the ground every 28th of August, so that the earth and the air and the false gods shall have their share of it, and the spirits likewise that inhabit the air and the earth. And thus those beings will protect and bless the Khan, and his children, and his wives, and his folk, and his gear, and his cattle, and his horses, his corn, and all that is his. After this is done, the emperor is off and away. But I must now tell you a strange thing that hitherto I have forgotten to mention. During the three months of every year that the Lord resides at that place, if it should happen to be bad weather, there are certain crafty enchanters and astrologers in his train, who are such adepts in necromancy and the diabolic arts, that they are able to prevent any cloud or storm from passing over the spot on which the emperor's palace stands. The sorcerers who do this are called Tebet and Kesimur, which are the names of two nations of idolaters. Whatever they do in this way is by the help of the devil, but they make those people believe that it is compassed by dint of their own sanctity and the help of God. They always go in a state of dirt and uncleanness, devoid of respect for themselves, or for those who see them, unwashed, unkempt, and sordidly attired. These people also have a custom which I must tell you. If a man is condemned to death and executed by the lawful authority, they take his body and cook and eat it. But if any one die a natural death, then they will not eat the body. There is another marvel performed by those Baxi, of whom I have been speaking as knowing so many enchantments. For when the great Khan is at his capital, and in his great palace, seated at his table, which stands on a platform some eight cubits above the ground, his cups are set before him, on a great buffet, in the middle of the hall pavement, at a distance of some ten paces from his table, and filled with wine or other good spiced liquor such as they use. Now when the Lord desires to drink, those enchanters, by the power of their enchantments, cause the cups to move from their place without being touched by anybody, and to present themselves to the emperor. This every one present may witness, and there are oft times more than ten thousand persons thus present. Tis a truth and no lie, and so will tell you the sages of our own country who understand necromancy, for they also can perform it. And when the idol festivals come round, these Baxi go to the prince and say, Sire, the feast of such a god is come, naming him. 
my lord you know the enchanter will say that this god when he gets no offerings always sends bad weather and spoils our seasons so we pray you to give us such and such a number of black-faced sheep naming whatever number they please and we beg also good my lord that we may have such a quantity of incense and such a quantity of lignalos and so much of this so much of that and so much of the other according to their fancy that we may perform a solemn service and a great sacrifice to our idols and that so they may be induced to protect us and all that is ours the baxi say these things to the barons entrusted with the stewardship who stand round the great khan and these repeat them to the khan and he then orders the barons to give everything that the baxi have asked for and when they have got the articles they go and make a great feast in honor of their god and hold great ceremonies of worship with grand illuminations and quantities of incense of a variety of odors which they make up from different aromatic spices and then they cook the meat and set it before the idols and sprinkle the broth hither and thither saying that in this way the idols get their belly full thus it is that they keep their festivals you must know that each of the idols has a name of his own and a feast day just as our saints have their anniversaries they also have immense minsters and abbeys some of them as big as a small town with more than two thousand monks that is after their fashion in a single abbey these monks dress more decently than the rest of the people and have the head and beard shaven there are some among these baxi who are allowed by their rule to take wives and who have plenty of children then there is another kind of devotees called sensin who are men of extraordinary abstinence after their fashion and lead a life of such hardship as i will describe all their life long they eat nothing but bran which they take mixed with hot water that is their food bran and nothing but bran and water for their drink tis a lifelong fast so that i may well say their life is one of extraordinary asceticism they have great idols and plenty of them but they sometimes also worship fire the other idolaters who are not of this sect call these people heretics petarius as we would say because they do not worship their idols in their own fashion those of whom i am speaking would not take a wife on any consideration they wear dresses of hempen stuff black and blue and sleep upon mats in fact their asceticism is something astonishing their idols are all feminine that is to say they have women's names now let us have done with this subject and let me tell you of the great state and wonderful magnificence of the great lord of lords i mean that great prince who is the sovereign of the tartars kublai by name the most noble and puissant lord end of section 32three of the book of San Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The book of San Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book Second, Part One. Chapters 1 to 4. Part 1. The Khan, His Court and Capital. Chapter 1. Of Kublai Khan, the great Khan now reigning, and of his great puissance. Now am I come to that part of our book, in which I shall tell you of the great and wonderful magnificence of the great Khan now reigning, by name Kublai Khan, Khan being a title which signifieth the great Lord of Lords, or Emperor, and of a surety he hath good right to such a title, for all men know for a certain truth that he is the most potent man, as regards forces and lands and treasure, that existeth in the world, or ever hath existed, from the time of our first father Adam until this day. All this I will make clear to you for truth in this book of ours, so that every one shall be fain to acknowledge that he is the greatest lord that is now in the world, or ever hath been and now you shall hear how and wherefore. Chapter 2 Concerning the Revolt of Nayan, who was uncle to the great Khan Kublai. Now this Kublai Khan is of the right imperial lineage, being descended from Dingis Khan, the first sovereign of all the Tartars, and he is the sixth lord in that succession, as I have already told you in this book. He came to the throne in the year of Christ, 1256, 
and the empire fell to him because of his ability and valour and great worth, as was right and reason. His brothers, indeed, and other kinsmen disputed his claim, but his it remained, both because maintained by his great valour, and because it was in law and right his as being directly sprung of the imperial line. Up to the year of Christ now running, to wit 1298, he hath reigned two and forty years, and his age is about eighty-five, so that he must have been about forty-three years of age when he first came to the throne. Before that time he had often been to the wars, and had shown himself a gallant soldier and an excellent captain. But after coming to the throne he never went to the wars in person save once. This befell in the year of Christ 1286, and I will tell you why he went. There was a great Tartar chief, whose name was Nayan, a young man of thirty, lord over many lands and many provinces, and he was uncle to the emperor Kublai Khan of whom we are speaking. And when he found himself in authority, this Nayan waxed proud in the insolence of his youth and his great power, for indeed he could bring into the field three hundred thousand horsemen, though all the time he was liegeman to his nephew, the great Khan Kublai, as was right and reason. Seeing then what great power he had, he took it into his head that he would be the great Khan's vassal no longer, nay more, he would fain wrest his empire from him if he could. So this Nayan sent envoys to another Tartar prince called Kaidu, also a great and potent lord, who was a kinsman of his, and who was a nephew of the great Khan, and his lawful liegeman also, though he was in rebellion and at bitter enmity with his sovereign lord and uncle. Now the message that Nayan sent was this, that he himself was making ready to march against the great Khan with all his forces, which were great, and he begged Kaidu to do likewise from his side, so that by attacking Kublai on two sides at once, with such great forces, they would be able to wrest his dominion from him. And when Kaidu heard the message of Nayan, he was right glad thereat, and thought the time was come at last to gain his object. So he sent back answer that he would do as requested and got ready his host, which mustered a good hundred thousand horsemen. Now let us go back to the great Khan, who had news of all this plot. CHAPTER Three: HOW THE GREAT Khan MARCHED AGAINST Nayan. When the great Khan heard what was afoot, he made his preparations in right good heart, like one who feared not the issue of an attempt so contrary to justice. Confident in his own conduct and prowess, he was in no degree disturbed, but vowed that he would never wear a crown again if he brought not those two traitorous and disloyal Tartar chiefs to an ill end. So swiftly and secretly were his preparations made that no one knew of them but his privy council, and all were completed within ten or twelve days. In that time he had assembled good 360,000 horsemen and 100,000 footmen, but a small force indeed for him, and consisting only of those that were in the vicinity. For the rest of his vast and innumerable forces were too far off to answer so hasty a summons, being engaged under orders from him on distant expeditions to conquer diverse countries and provinces. If he had waited to summon all his troops, the multitude assembled would have been beyond all belief, a multitude such as never was heard of or told of, past all counting. In fact, those three hundred and sixty thousand horsemen that he got together consisted merely of the falconers and whippers in that were about the court. And when he had got ready this handful, as it were, of his troops, he ordered his astrologers to declare whether he should gain the battle and get the better of his enemies. After they had made their observations, they told him to go on boldly, for he would conquer and gain a glorious victory, whereat he greatly rejoiced. So he marched with his army and after advancing for twenty days they arrived at the great plain where Nayan lay with all his host, amounting to some four hundred thousand horse. Now the great Khan's forces arrived so fast and so suddenly that the others knew nothing of the matter, for the Khan had caused such strict watch to be made in every direction for scouts that every one that appeared was instantly captured. Thus Nayan had no warning of his coming and was completely taken by surprise insomuch that when the great Khan's army came up, he was asleep in the arms of a wife of his, of whom he was extravagantly fond. So thus you see why it was that the Emperor equipped his force with such speed and secrecy. CHAPTER Four, Of the battle that the great Khan fought with Nayan. What shall I say about it? 
when day had well broken there was the khan with all his host upon a hill overlooking the plain where nayan lay in his tent in all security without the slightest thought of any one coming thither to do him hurt in fact this confidence of his was such that he kept no vedettes whether in front or in rear for he knew nothing of the coming of the great khan owing to all the approaches having been completely occupied as i told you moreover the place was in a remote wilderness more than thirty marches from the court though the khan had made the distance in twenty so eager was he to come to battle with nayan and what shall i tell you next the khan was there on the hill mounted on a great wooden bartizan which was borne by four well-trained elephants and over him was hoisted his standard so high aloft that it could be seen from all sides his troops were ordered in battles of thirty thousand men apiece and a great part of the horsemen had each a foot-soldier armed with a lance set on the crupper behind him for it was thus that the footmen were disposed of and the whole plain seemed to be covered with his forces so it was thus that the great khan's army was arrayed for battle when nayan and his people saw what had happened they were sorely confounded and rushed in haste to arms nevertheless they made them ready in good style and formed their troops in an orderly manner and when all were in battle array on both sides as i have told you and nothing remained but to fall to blows then might you have heard a sound arise of many instruments of various music and of the voices of the whole of the two hosts loudly singing for this is a custom of the tartars that before they join battle they all unite in singing and playing on a certain two-stringed instrument of theirs a thing right pleasant to hear and so they continue in their array of battle singing and playing in this pleasing manner until the great nakar of the prince is heard to sound as soon as that begins to sound the fight also begins on both sides and in no case before the princess nakara sounds dare any commence fighting so then as they were thus singing and playing though ordered and ready for battle the great nakara of the great khan began to sound and that of nayan also began to sound and thenceforward the din of battle began to be heard loudly from this side and from that and they rushed to work so doubtedly with their bows and their maces with their lances and swords and with the arblasts of the footmen that it was a wondrous sight to see now might you behold such flights of arrows from this side and from that that the whole heaven was canopied with them and they fell like rain now might you see on this side and on that full many a cavalier and man-at-arms fall slain insomuch that the whole field seemed covered with them from this side and from that such cries arose from the crowds of the wounded and dying that had god thundered you would not have heard him for fierce and furious was the battle and quarter there was none given but why should i make a long story of it you must know that it was the most parlous and fierce and fearful battle that ever has been fought in our day nor have there ever been such forces in the field in actual fight especially of horsemen as were then engaged for taking both sides there were not fewer than seven hundred and sixty thousand horsemen a mighty force and that without reckoning the footmen who were also very numerous the battle endured with various fortune on this side and on that from morning till noon but at last by god's pleasure and the right that was on his side the great khan had the victory and nayan lost the battle and was utterly routed for the army of the great khan performed such feats of arms that nayan and his host could stand against them no longer so they turned and fled but this availed nothing for nayan for he and all the barons with him were taken prisoners and had to surrender to the khan with all their arms now you must know that nayan was a baptized christian and bore the cross on his banner but this naught availed him seeing how grievously he had done amiss in rebelling against his lord for he was the great khan's liegeman and was bound to hold his lands of him like all his ancestors before him end of section 33thirty four of the book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East volume one this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org recording by Anna Simon the book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East volume one 
by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book Second, Part One, Chapters Five to Seven. Chapter Five: How the Great Khan Caused Nayan to Be Put to Death. And when the Great Khan learned that Nayan was taken, right glad was he, and commanded that he should be put to death straightway and in secret lest endeavours should be made to obtain pity and pardon for him, because he was of the Khan's own flesh and blood. And this was the way in which he was put to death. He was wrapped in a carpet, and tossed to and fro so mercilessly that he died. And the Khan caused him to be put to death in this way, because he would not have the blood of his line imperial spilled upon the ground, or exposed in the eye of heaven and before the sun. And when the great Khan had gained this battle, as you have heard, all the barons and people of Nayan's provinces renewed their fealty to the Khan. Now these provinces that had been under the lordship of Nayan were four in number, to wit, the first called Horga, the second Kauli, the third Barskol, the fourth Sikatinju. Of all these four great provinces had Nayan been lord, it was a very great dominion. And after the great Khan had conquered Nayan, as you have heard, it came to pass that the different kinds of people who were present, Saracens and idolaters and Jews and many others that believed not in God, did jibe those that were Christians because of the cross that Nayan had borne on his standard, and that so grievously that there was no bearing it. Thus they would say to the Christians, See now what precious help this God's cross of yours hath rendered Nayan, who was a Christian and a worshipper thereof. And such a din arose about the matter that it reached the great Khan's own ears. When it did so, he sharply rebuked those who cast these jibes at the Christians, and he also bade the Christians be of good heart, for if the cross had rendered no help to Nayan, in that it had done right well, nor could that which was good as it was, have done otherwise, for Nayan was a disloyal and traitorous rebel against his lord, and well deserved that which had befallen him. Wherefore the cross of your God did well in that it gave him no help against the right. And this he said so loud that everybody heard him. The Christians then replied to the great Khan, Great King, you say the truth indeed, for our cross can render no one help in wrongdoing, and therefore it was that it aided not Nayan, who was guilty of crime and disloyalty, for it would take no part in his evil deeds. And so thenceforward no more was heard of the floutings of the unbelievers against the Christians, for they heard very well what the sovereign said to the latter about the cross on Nayan's banner, and its giving him no help. Chapter 6 How the Great Khan Went Back to the City of Kambaluk and after the great Khan had defeated Nayan in the way you have heard, he went back to his capital city of Kambaluk and abode there, taking his ease and making facility. And the other Tartar lord, called Kaidu, was greatly troubled when he heard of the defeat and death of Nayan, and held himself in readiness for war. But he stood greatly in fear of being handled as Nayan had been. I told you that the great Khan never went on a campaign but once, and it was on this occasion. In all other cases of need, he sent his sons or his barons into the field. But this time he would have none go in command but himself, for he regarded the presumptuous rebellion of Nayan as far too serious and perilous an affair to be otherwise dealt with. Chapter 7 How the Khan Rewarded the Valor of His Captains so we will have done with this matter of Nayan, and go on with our account of the great state of the great Khan. We have already told you of his lineage and of his age, but now I must tell you what he did after his return, in regard to those barons who had behaved well in the battle. Him who was before captain of one hundred, he made captain of one thousand, and him who was captain of one thousand men, he made to be captain of ten thousand advancing every man according to his deserts and to his previous rank. Besides that, he also made them presents of fine silver plate and other rich appointments, gave them tablets of authority of a higher degree than they held before, 
and bestowed upon them fine jewels of gold and silver, and pearls and precious stones, insomuch that the amount that fell to each of them was something astonishing. And yet t'was not so much as they had deserved, for never were men seen who did such feats of arms for the love and honour of their lord as these had done on that day of the battle. Now those tablets of authority of which I have spoken are ordered in this way. The officer who is a captain of one hundred had the tablet of silver. The captain of one thousand had the tablet of gold or silver gilt. The commander of ten thousand had the tablet of gold with the lion's head on it. And I will tell you the weight of the different tablets and what they denote. The tablets of the captains of one hundred and one thousand weigh each of them one hundred and twenty sagi, and the tablet with the lion's head engraven on it, which is that of the commander of ten thousand, weighs two hundred and twenty sagi, and on each of the tablets is inscribed a device which runs, By the strength of the great God, and of the great grace which he hath accorded to our emperor, may the name of the Khan be blessed, and let all such as will not obey him be slain and be destroyed." And I will tell you, besides, that all who hold these tablets likewise receive warrants in writing, declaring all their powers and privileges. I should mention, too, that an officer who holds the chief command of one hundred thousand men, or who is general-in-chief of a great host, is entitled to a tablet that weighs three hundred sagi. It has an inscription thereon to the same purport that I have told you already, and below the inscription there is the figure of a lion and below the lion the sun and moon. They have warrants also of their high rank, command, and power. Every one, moreover, who holds a tablet of this exalted degree is entitled, whenever he goes abroad, to have a little golden canopy, such as is called an umbrella, carried on a spear over his head in token of his high command, and whenever he sits, he sits in a silver chair." To certain very great lords, also, there is given a tablet with gerfalcons on it. This is only to the very greatest of the Khan's barons, and it confers on them his own full power and authority, so that if one of those chiefs wishes to send a messenger any whither, he can seize the horses of any man, be he even a king, and any other chattels at his pleasure. End of section 34 Five of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume One, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book Second, Part One, Chapters Eight to Ten. Chapter 8. Concerning the Person of the Great Khan. The personal appearance of the Great Khan, Lord of Lords, whose name is Kublai, is such as I shall now tell you. He is of a good stature, neither tall nor short, but of a middle height. He has a becoming amount of flesh, and is very shapely in all his limbs. His complexion is white and red, the eyes black and fine, the nose well formed and well set on. He has four wives, whom he retains permanently as his legitimate consorts, and the eldest of his sons, by those four wives, ought by rights to be emperor, I mean, when his father dies. Those four ladies are called empresses, but each is distinguished also by her proper name, and each of them has a special court of her own, very grand and ample, no one of them having fewer than three hundred fair and charming damsels. They have also many pages and eunuchs, and a number of other attendants of both sexes, so that each of these ladies has not less than ten thousand persons attached to her court. When the emperor desires the society of one of these four consorts, he will sometimes send for the lady to his apartment, and sometimes visit her at her own. He has also a great number of concubines, and I will tell you how he obtains them. You must know that there is a tribe of Tartars called Angrat, who are noted for their beauty. Now, every year, a hundred of the most beautiful maidens of this tribe are sent to the great Khan, 
who commits them to the charge of certain elderly ladies dwelling in his palace. And these old ladies make the girls sleep with them, in order to ascertain if they have sweet breath, and do not snore, and are sound in all their limbs. Then such of them as are of approved beauty, and are good and sound in all respects, are appointed to attend on the emperor by turns. Thus six of these damsels take their turn for three days and nights, and wait on him when he is in his chamber, and when he is in his bed, to serve him in any way, and to be entirely at his orders. At the end of the three days and nights they are relieved by other six. And so throughout the year there are reliefs of maidens by six and six, changing every three days and nights. CHAPTER Nine. Concerning the Great Khan's Sons The Emperor hath, by those four wives of his, twenty-two male children, the eldest of whom was called Jinkin, for the love of the good Jinkis Khan, the first lord of the Tartars, and this Jinkin, as the eldest son of the Khan, was to have reigned after his father's death, but, as it came to pass, he died. He left a son behind him, however, whose name is Timur and he is to be the great Khan and Emperor after the death of his grandfather, as is but right, he being the child of the great Khan's eldest son. And this Timur is an able and brave man, as he hath already proven on many occasions. The great Khan hath also twenty-five other sons by his concubines, and these are good and valiant soldiers, and each of them is a great chief. I tell you, moreover, that of his children by his four lawful wives, there are seven who are kings of vast realms or provinces, and govern them well, being all able and gallant men, as might be expected. For the great Khan their sire is, I tell you, the wisest and most accomplished man, the greatest captain, the best to govern men and rule an empire, as well as the most valiant that ever has existed among all the tribes of Tartars. CHAPTER X CONCERNING THE PALACE OF THE GREAT Khan, You must know that for three months of the year, to wit December, January, and February, the Great Khan resides in the capital city of Katai, which is called Kambaluk, and which is at the northeastern extremity of the country. In that city stands his great palace, and now I will tell you what it is like. It is enclosed all round by a great wall forming a square, each side of which is a mile in length, that is to say, the whole compass thereof is four miles. This you may depend on. It is also very thick, and a good ten paces in height, whitewashed and loopholed all round. At each angle of the wall there is a very fine and rich palace, in which the war-harness of the emperor is kept, such as bows and quivers, saddles and bridles, and bowstrings, and everything needful for an army. Also, midway between every two of these corner palaces, there is another of the like, so that taking the whole compass of the enclosure, you find eight vast palaces stored with the great lord's harness of war. And you must understand that each palace is assigned to only one kind of article. Thus, one is stored with bows, a second with saddles, a third with bridles, and so on, in succession right round. The great wall has five gates on its southern face, the middle one being the great gate which is never opened on any occasion except when the great Khan himself goes forth or enters. Close on either side of this great gate is a smaller one by which all other people pass, and then towards each angle is another great gate, also open to people in general, so that on that side there are five gates in all. Inside of this wall there is a second, enclosing a space that is somewhat greater in length than in breadth. This enclosure also has eight palaces corresponding to those of the outer wall, and stored like them with the lord's harness of war. This wall also hath five gates on the southern face, corresponding to those in the outer wall, and hath one gate on each of the other faces, as the outer wall hath also. In the middle of the second enclosure is the lord's great palace and I will tell you what it is like. You must know that it is the greatest palace that ever was. Towards the north it is in contact with the outer wall, 
whilst towards the south there is a vacant space which the barons and the soldiers are constantly traversing. The palace itself hath no upper story, but is all on the ground floor. Only the basement is raised some ten palms above the surrounding soil, and this elevation is retained by a wall of marble raised to the level of the pavement, two paces in width and projecting beyond the base of the palace, so as to form a kind of terrace walk, by which people can pass round the building, and which is exposed to view, whilst on the outer edge of the wall there is a very fine pillared balustrade, and up to this the people are allowed to come. The roof is very lofty, and the walls of the palace are all covered with gold and silver. They are also adorned with representations of dragons, sculptured and gilt, beasts and birds, knights and idols, and sundry other subjects, and on the ceiling, too, you see nothing but gold and silver and painting. On each of the four sides there is a great marble staircase leading to the top of the marble wall, and forming the approach to the palace. The hall of the palace is so large that it could easily dine six thousand people, and it is quite a marvel to see how many rooms there are besides. The building is altogether so vast, so rich, and so beautiful, that no man on earth could design anything superior to it. The outside of the roof also is all coloured with vermilion and yellow and green and blue and other hues, which are fixed with a varnish so fine and exquisite that they shine like crystal and lend a resplendent lustre to the palace as seen for a great way around. This roof is made too with such strength and solidity that it is fit to last for ever. On the interior side of the palace are large buildings with halls and chambers, where the emperor's private property is placed, such as his treasures of gold, silver, gems, pearls, and gold plate, and in which reside the ladies and concubines. There he occupies himself at his own convenience, and no one else has access. Between the two walls of the enclosure which I have described, there are fine parks and beautiful trees bearing a variety of fruits. There are beasts also, sundry kinds, such as white stags and fallow deer, gazelles and roebucks, and fine squirrels of various sorts, with numbers also of the animal that gives the musk, and all manner of other beautiful creatures, insomuch that the whole place is full of them, and no spot remains void except where there is traffic of people going and coming. The parks are covered with abundant grass, and the roads through them being all paved and raised two cubits above the surface, they never become muddy, nor does the rain lodge on them, but flows off into the meadows, quickening the soil and producing that abundance of herbage. From that corner of the enclosure which is towards the northwest, there extends a fine lake, containing foison of fish of different kinds, which the emperor hath caused to be put in there so that whenever he desires any he can have them at his pleasure. A river enters this lake and issues from it, but there is a grating of iron or brass put up, so that the fish cannot escape in that way. Moreover, on the north side of the palace, about a bow-shot off, there is a hill which has been made by art, from the earth dug out of the lake. It is a good hundred paces in height and a mile in compass. This hill is entirely covered with trees that never lose their leaves but remain ever green. And I assure you that wherever a beautiful tree may exist, and the emperor gets news of it, he sends for it, and has it transported bodily with all its roots and the earth attached to them, and planted on that hill of his. No matter how big the tree may be, he gets it carried by his elephants, and in this way he has got together the most beautiful collection of trees in all the world and he has also caused the whole hill to be covered with the ore of azure, which is very green. And thus not only are the trees all green, but the hill itself is all green likewise, and there is nothing to be seen on it that is not green, and hence it is called the Green Mount, and in good sooth it is named well. On the top of the hill again there is a fine big palace which is all green inside and out, and thus the hill and the trees and the palace form together a charming spectacle, and it is marvellous to see their uniformity of colour. Everybody who sees them is delighted, and the great Khan had caused this beautiful prospect to be formed for the comfort and solace and delectation of his heart. 
you must know that beside the palace that we have been describing, that is, the great palace, the emperor has caused another to be built just like his own in every respect, and this he hath done for his son, when he shall reign and be emperor after him. Hence it is made just in the same fashion and of the same size, so that everything can be carried on in the same manner after his own death. It stands on the other side of the lake from the great Khan's palace, and there is a bridge crossing the water from one to the other. The prince in question holds now a seal of empire, but not with such complete authority as the great Khan, who remains supreme as long as he lives. Now I am going to tell you of the chief city of Katai, in which these palaces stand, and why it was built, and how. End of section 35six of the book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East Volume one This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Ser Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East Volume one by Rusticello da Pisa translated by Henry Yule Book the second part one chapters eleven to fourteen Chapter 11. Concerning the City of Cambaluc Now there was on that spot in old times a great and noble city called Cambaluc, which is as much as to say in our tongue, the city of the emperor. But the great Khan was informed by his astrologers that this city would prove rebellious and raise great disorders against his imperial authority. So he caused the present city to be built close beside the old one, with only a river between them and he caused the people of the old city to be removed to the new town that he had founded, and this is called Taidu. However, he allowed a portion of the people, which he did not suspect, to remain in the old city, because the new one could not hold the whole of them, big as it is. As regards the size of this new city, you must know that it has a compass of twenty-four miles, for each side of it had the length of six miles, and it is four square and it is all walled around with walls of earth which have a thickness of full ten paces at the bottom and a height of more than ten paces. But they are not so thick at the top, for they diminish in thickness as they rise, so that at top they are only about three paces thick, and they are provided throughout with loopholed battlements which are all whitewashed. There are twelve gates, and over each gate there is a great and handsome palace, so that there are on each side of the square three gates, and five palaces. For, I ought to mention, there is at each angle also a great and handsome palace. In those palaces are vast halls in which are kept the arms of the city garrison. The streets are so straight and wide that you can see right along them, from end to end, and from one gate to the other. And up and down the city there are beautiful palaces, and many great and fine hostelries, and fine houses in great numbers. All the plots of ground on which the houses of the city are built are four square, and laid out with straight lines, all the plots being occupied by great and spacious palaces, with courts and gardens of proportionate size. All these plots were assigned to different heads of families. Each square plot is encompassed by handsome streets for traffic, and thus the whole city is arranged in squares just like a chessboard, and disposed in a manner so perfect and masterly that it is impossible to give a description that should do it justice. Moreover, in the middle of the city there is a great clock, that is to say, a bell, which has struck at night, and after it has struck three times, no one must go out in the city, unless it be for the needs of a woman in labour, or of the sick, and those who go about on such errands are bound to carry lanterns with them. Moreover, the established guard at each gate of the city is one thousand armed men, not that you are to imagine this guard is kept up for fear of any attack, but only as a guard of honour for the sovereign, who resides there, and to prevent thieves from doing mischief in the town. Chapter 12. How the Great Khan Maintains a Guard of Twelve Thousand Horse, which are called Kashikan. You must know that the Great Khan, to maintain a state, had a guard of twelve thousand horsemen, who are styled Kashikan which is as much as to say, knights devoted to their lord. 
not that he keeps these for fear of any man whatever, but merely because of his own exalted dignity. These twelve thousand men have four captains, each of whom is in command of three thousand, and each body of three thousand takes a turn of three days and nights to guard the palace, where they also take their meals. After the expiration of three days and nights, they are relieved by another three thousand, who mount guard for the same space of time, and then another body takes its turn, so that there are always three thousand on guard. Thus it goes until the whole twelve thousand, who are styled, as I said, Kashikhan, have been on duty, and then the tour begins again, and so runs on from year's end to year's end. Chapter 13 The Fashion of the Great Khan's Table at His High Feasts and when the great Khan sits at table on any great court occasion, it is in this fashion. His table is elevated a good deal above the others, and he sits at the north end of the hall, looking towards the south, with his chief wife beside him on the left. On his right sit his sons and his nephews, and other kinsmen of the blood imperial, but lower, so that their heads are on a level with the emperor's feet. And then the other barons sit at other tables, lower still, so also with the women, for all the wives of the Lord's sons and of his nephews and other kinsmen sit at the lower table to his right, and below them again the ladies of the other barons and knights, each in the place assigned by the Lord's orders. The tables are so disposed that the Emperor can see the whole of them from end to end, many as they are. Further, you are not to suppose that everybody sits at table. On the contrary, the greater part of the soldiers and their officers sit at their meal in the hall on the carpets. Outside the hall will be found more than forty thousand people, for there is a great concourse of folk bringing presents to the Lord, or come from foreign countries with curiosities. In a certain part of the hall, near where the great Khan holds his table, there is set a large and very beautiful piece of workmanship in the form of a square coffer or buffet, about three paces each way, exquisitely wrought with figures of animals, finely carved and gilt. The middle is hollow, and in it stands a great vessel of pure gold, holding as much as an ordinary butt, and at each corner of the great vessel is one of smaller size, of the capacity of a firkin, and from the former the wine or beverage flavoured with fine and costly spices is drawn off into the latter. And on the buffet aforesaid are set all the Lord's drinking vessels, among which are certain pitchers of the finest gold, which are called verniques, and are big enough to hold drink for eight or ten persons. And one of these is put between every two persons, besides a couple of golden cups with handles, so that every man helps himself from the pitcher that stands between him and his neighbour, and the ladies are supplied in the same way. The value of these pitchers and cups is something immense. In fact, the great Khan has such a quantity of this kind of plate, and of gold and silver in other shapes, as no one ever before saw or heard tell of, or could believe. There are certain barons specially deputed to see that foreigners, who do not know the customs of the court, are provided with places suited to their rank, and these barons are continually moving to and fro in the hall, looking to the wants of the guests at table, and causing the servants to supply them promptly with wine, milk, meat, or whatever they lack. At every door of the hall, or indeed wherever the emperor may be, there stand a couple of big men like giants, one on each side, armed with staves. Their business is to see that no one steps upon the threshold in entering, and if this does happen, they strip the offender of his clothes, and he must pay a forfeit to have them back again. Or in lieu of taking his clothes, they give him a certain number of blows. If they are foreigners ignorant of the order, then there are barons appointed to introduce them and explain it to them. They think, in fact, that it brings bad luck if any one touches the threshold. Howbeit, they are not expected to stick at this in going forth again, for at that time some are like to be the worse for liquor and incapable of looking to their steps. And you must know that those who wait upon the great Khan with his dishes and his drink are some of the great barons. They have the mouth and nose muffled with fine napkins of silk and gold, so that no breath nor odour from their persons should taint the dish or the goblet presented to the Lord, and when the Emperor is going to drink, all the musical instruments, of which he has vast store of every kind, begin to play, 
and when he takes the cup all the barons and the rest of the company drop on their knees and make the deepest obeisance before him and then the emperor doth drink but each time that he does so the whole ceremony is repeated i will say naught about the dishes as you may easily conceive that there is a great plenty of every possible kind but you should know that in every case where a baron or knight dines at those tables their wives also dine there with the other ladies and when all have dined and the tables have been removed then come in a great number of players and jugglers adepts at all sorts of wonderful feats and perform before the emperor and the rest of the company creating great diversion and mirth so that everybody is full of laughter and enjoyment and when the performance is over the company breaks up and every one goes to his quarters chapter fourteen concerning the great feast held by the grand khan every year on his birthday you must know that the tartars keep high festival yearly on their birthdays and the great khan was born on the twenty-eighth day of the september moon so on that day is held the greatest feast of the year at the khan's court always excepting that which he holds on new year's day of which i shall tell you afterwards now on his birthday the great khan dresses in the best of his robes all wrought with beaten gold and full twelve thousand barons and knights on that day come forth dressed in robes of the same colour and precisely like those of the great khan except that they are not so costly but still they are all of the same colour as his and are also of silk and gold every man so clothed has also a girdle of gold and this as well as the dress is given him by the sovereign and i will aver that there are some of these suits decked with so many pearls and precious stones that a single suit shall be worth full ten thousand golden bazans and of such raiment there are several sets for you must know that the great khan thirteen times in the year presents to his barons and knights such suits of raiment as i am speaking of and on each occasion they wear the same colour that he does a different colour being assigned to each festival. Hence you may see what a huge business it is, and that there is no prince in the world but he alone who could keep up such customs as these. On his birthday also all the Tartars in the world, and all the countries and governments that owe allegiance to the Khan, offer him great presents according to their several ability, and as prescription or orders have fixed the amount and many other persons also come with great presents to the khan in order to beg for some employment from him and the great khan has chosen twelve barons on whom is laid the charge of assigning to each of these supplicants a suitable answer on this day likewise all the idolaters all the saracens and all the christians and other descriptions of people make great and solemn devotions with much chanting and lighting of lamps and burning of incense each to the god whom he doth worship, praying that he would save the emperor, and grant him long life and health and happiness. And thus, as I have related, is celebrated the joyous feast of the Khan's birthday. Now I will tell you of another festival, which the Khan holds at the New Year, and which is called the White Feast. End of section 36《Of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello de Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Book 2nd, Part 1. Chapters 15 to 18. Chapter 15. Of the Great Festival Which the Khan Holds on New Year's Day. The beginning of their new year is the month of February, and on that occasion the Great Khan and all his subjects made such a feast as I now shall describe. It is the custom that on this occasion the Khan and all his subjects should be clothed entirely in white. So, that day, everybody is in white men and women, great and small. And this is done in order that they may thrive all through the year, for they deem that white clothing is lucky. 
On that day also all the people of all the provinces and governments and kingdoms and countries that own allegiance to the Khan bring him great presents of gold and silver, and pearls and gems, and rich textures of diverse kinds. And this they do that the emperor throughout the year may have abundance of treasure and enjoyment without care. And the people also make presents to each other of white things, and embrace and kiss and make merry, and wish each other happiness and good luck for the coming year. On that day, I can assure you, among the customary presents there shall be offered to the Khan from various quarters more than one hundred thousand white horses, beautiful animals, and richly caparisoned. And you must know this their custom in offering presents to the great Khan, at least when the province making the present is able to do so, to present nine times nine articles. For instance, if a province sends horses, it sends nine times nine, or eighty-one horses. Of gold, nine times nine pieces of gold, and so with stuffs or whatever else the present may consist of. On that day also, the whole of the Khan's elephants, amounting fully to five thousand in number, are exhibited, all covered with rich and gay housings of inlaid cloth representing beasts and birds, whilst each of them carries on his back two splendid coffers, all of these being filled with the emperor's plate and other costly furniture required for the court on the occasion of the white feast. And these are followed by a vast number of camels, which are likewise covered with rich housings and laden with things needful for the feast. All these are paraded before the emperor, and it makes the finest sight in the world. Moreover, on the morning of the feast, before the tables are set, all the kings and all the dukes, marquises, counts, barons, knights, and astrologers, and philosophers, and leeches, and falconers, and other officials of sundry kinds, from all the places round about, present themselves in the great hall before the emperor, whilst those who can find no room to enter stand outside in such a position that the emperor can see them all well. And the whole company is marshalled in this wise. First are the Khan's sons and his nephews, and the other princes of the blood imperial. Next to them all kings, then dukes, and then all others in succession according to the degree of each. And when they are all seated, each in his proper place, then a great prelate rises and says with a loud voice, Bow and adore. And as soon as he has said this, the company bow down until their foreheads touched the earth in adoration towards the emperor as if he were a god. And this adoration they repeat four times, and then go to a highly decorated altar, on which is a vermilion tablet with the name of the Grand Khan inscribed thereon, and a beautiful censer of gold. So they incense the tablet and the altar with great reverence, and then return each man to his seat. When all have performed this, then the presents are offered, of which I have spoken as being so rich and costly, and after all have been offered and been seen by the emperor, the tables are set, and all take their places at them with perfect order, as I have already told you. And after dinner the jugglers come in, and amuse the court, as you have heard before. And when that is over, every man goes to his quarters. CHAPTER Sixteen, Concerning the twelve thousand barons who receive robes of cloth of gold from the emperor on the great festivals, thirteen changes apiece. Now you must know that the great Khan hath set apart twelve thousand of his men, who are distinguished by the name of Keshikhan, as I have told you before, and on each of these twelve thousand barons he bestows thirteen changes of raiment, which are all different from one another. I mean that in one set the twelve thousand are all of one colour, the next twelve thousand of another colour, and so on, so that they are of thirteen different colours. These robes are garnished with gems and pearls and other precious things in a very rich and costly manner, and along with each of these changes of raiment, that is, thirteen times in the year, he bestows on each of those twelve thousand barons a fine golden girdle of great richness and value, and likewise a pair of boots of kamut, that is to say, of borgal, curiously wrought with silvered thread insomuch that when they are clothed in these dresses, every man of them looks like a king. And there is an established order as to which dress is to be worn at each of those thirteen feasts. 
The emperor himself also has his thirteen suits corresponding to those of his barons, in color, I mean, though his are grander, richer, and costlier, so that he is always arrayed in the same color as his barons, who are, as it were, his comrades. And you may see that all this costs an amount which it is scarcely possible to calculate. Now I have told you of the thirteen changes of raiment received from the prince by those twelve thousand barons, amounting in all to one hundred and fifty-six thousand suits of so great cost and value, to say nothing of the girdles and the boots which are also worth a great sum of money. All this the great lord hath ordered, that he may attach the more of grandeur and dignity to his festivals. And now I must mention another thing that I had forgotten, but which you will be astonished to learn from this book. You must know that on the feast day a great lion is led to the emperor's presence, and as soon as it sees him it lies down before him with every sign of the greatest veneration, as if it acknowledged him for its lord, and it remains there lying before him, and entirely unchained. Truly this must seem a strange story to those who have not seen the thing. CHAPTER Seventeen: HOW THE GREAT Khan ENJOINETH HIS PEOPLE TO SUPPLY HIM WITH GAME. The three months of December, January, and February, during which the Emperor resides at his capital city, are assigned for hunting and fowling to the extent of some forty days' journey around the city, and it is ordained that the larger game taken be sent to the court. To be more particular, of all the larger beasts of the chase, such as boars, roebucks, bucks, stags, lions, bears, etc., the greater part of what is taken has to be sent, and feathered game likewise. The animals are gutted and dispatched to the court on carts. This is done by all the people within twenty or thirty days' journey, and the quantity so dispatched is immense. Those at a greater distance cannot send the game, but they have to send the skins after tanning them, and these are employed in the making of equipments for the Emperor's army. CHAPTER eighteen. Of the lions and leopards and wolves that the Khan keeps for the chase. The Emperor hath numbers of leopards trained to the chase, and hath also a great many lynxes taught in like manner to catch game, and which afford excellent sport. He hath also several great lions, bigger than those of Babylonia, beasts whose skins are coloured in the most beautiful way, being striped all along the sides with black, red, and white. These are trained to catch boars and wild cattle, bears, wild asses, stags, and other great or fierce beasts. And it is a rare sight, I can tell you, to see those lions giving chase to such beasts as I have mentioned. When they are to be so employed, the lions are taken out in a covered cart, and every lion has a little doggy with him. They are obliged to approach the game against the wind, otherwise the animals would send the approach of the lion and be off. There are also a great number of eagles, all broken to catch wolves, foxes, deer, and wild goats, and they do catch them in great numbers. But those especially that are trained to wolf-catching are very large and powerful birds, and no wolf is able to get away from them. End of section 37《Book of Sir Marco Polo de Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of Sir Marco Polo de Venetian Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rosicello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Book 2nd, Part 1, Chapters 19 to 22. Chapter 19 Concerning the two brothers who have charge of the Khan's hounds. The Emperor hath two barons who are own brothers, one called Bayan and the other Mingan, and these are styled Shinushi, or Kunishi, which is as much as to say, the keepers of the Mastiff dogs. Each of these brothers hath ten thousand men under his orders, each body of ten thousand being dressed alike, the one in red, and the other in blue, and whenever they accompany the lord to the chase, they wear this livery in order to be recognized. 
Out of each body of ten thousand there are two thousand men who are each in charge of one or more great mastiffs, so that the whole number of these is very large. And when the prince goes a-hunting, one of those barons, with his ten thousand men and something like five thousand dogs, goes towards the right, whilst the other goes towards the left with his party in like manner. They move along, all abreast of one another, so that the whole line extends over a full day's journey, and no animal can escape them. Truly, it is a glorious sight to see the working of the dogs and the huntsmen on such an occasion. And as the Lord rides a-fowling across the plains, you will see these big hounds come tearing up, one pack after a bear, another pack after a stag, or some other beast, as it may hap, and running the game down, now on this side, and now on that, so that it is really a most delightful sport and spectacle. The two brothers I have mentioned are bound by the tenure of their office to supply the Khan's court from October to the end of March with one thousand head of game daily, whether of beasts or birds, and not counting quails, and also with fish to the best of their ability, allowing fish enough for three persons to reckon as equal to one head of game. Now I have told you of the masters of the hounds and all about them, and next will I tell you how the Lord goes off on an expedition for the space of three months. CHAPTER Twenty, HOW THE EMPEROR GOES ON A HUNTING EXPEDITION After he has stopped at his capital city those three months that I mentioned, to wit December, January, February, he starts off on the first day of March and travels southward towards the ocean sea, a journey of two days. He takes with him full ten thousand falconers and some five hundred garfalcons, besides peregrines, sakers, and other hawks in great numbers, and goshawks also to fly at the waterfowl. But do not suppose that he keeps all these together by him. They are distributed about, hither and thither, one hundred together, or two hundred at the utmost, as he thinks proper. But they are always fowling as they advance, and the most part of the quarry taken is carried to the emperor. And let me tell you, when he goes thus a-fowling with his garfalcons and other hawks, he is attended by full ten thousand men, who are disposed in couples, and these are called Toscal, which is as much as to say watchers, and the name describes their business. They are posted from spot to spot, always in couples, and thus they cover a great deal of ground. Every man of them is provided with a whistle and hood, so as to be able to call in a hawk and hold it in hand and when the emperor makes a cast, there is no need that he follow it up, for those men I speak of keep so good a lookout that they never lose sight of the birds, and if these have need of help, they are ready to render it. All the emperor's hawks, and those of the barons as well, have a little label attached to the leg to mark them, on which is written the names of the owner and the keeper of the bird, and in this way the hawk, when caught, is at once identified and handed over to its owner, but if not, the bird is carried to a certain baron who is styled the Bular Gucci, which is as much as to say the keeper of lost property. And I tell you that whatever may be found without a known owner, whether it be a horse or a sword or a hawk or what not, it is carried to that baron straightway and he takes charge of it. And if the finder neglects to carry his trover to the baron, the latter punishes him. Likewise the loser of any article goes to the baron and if the thing be in his hands, it is immediately given up to the owner. Moreover, the said baron always pitches on the highest spot of the camp, with his banner displayed, in order that those who have lost or found anything may have no difficulty in finding their way to him. Thus, nothing can be lost, but it shall be incontinently found and restored. And so the emperor follows this road that I have mentioned, leading along in the vicinity of the ocean sea, which is within two days' journey of his capital city, Cambaluc, and as he goes there is many a fine sight to be seen, and plenty of the very best entertainment in hawking. In fact, there is no sport in the world to equal it. The emperor himself is carried upon four elephants in a fine chamber made of timber, lined inside with plates of beaten gold, and outside with lion's skins, for he always travels in this way on his fowling expeditions because he is troubled with gout. He always keeps beside him a dozen of his choicest garfalcons, and is attended by several of his barons, who ride on horseback alongside. And sometimes, as they may be going along, and the emperor from his chamber is holding discourse with the barons, one of the latter shall exclaim, 
Sire, look out for cranes. Then the emperor instantly has the top of his chamber thrown open, and having marked the cranes, he casts one of his garefalcons, whichever he pleases, and often the quarry is struck within his view, so that he has the most exquisite sport and diversion, there as he sits in his chamber or lies on his bed, and all the barons with him get the enjoyment of it likewise. So it is not without reason, I tell you, that I do not believe there ever existed in the world, or ever will exist, a man with such sport and enjoyment as he has, or with such rare opportunities. And when he has travelled till he reaches a place called Kashamodun, there he finds his tents pitched with the tents of his sons and his barons, and those of his ladies and theirs, so that there shall be full ten thousand tents in all, and all fine and rich ones. And I will tell you how his own quarters are disposed. The tent in which he holds his courts is large enough to give cover easily to a thousand souls. It is pitched with its door to the south, and the barons and knights remain in waiting in it, whilst the lord abides in another close to it on the west side. When he wishes to speak with any one, he causes the person to be summoned to that other tent. Immediately behind the great tent there is a fine large chamber where the lord sleeps, and there are also many other tents and chambers, but they are not in contact with the great tent as these are. The two audience tents and the sleeping chamber are constructed in this way. Each of the audience tents has three poles which are of spice wood, and are most artfully covered with lion skins, striped with black and white and red, so that they do not suffer from any weather. All three apartments are also covered outside with similar skins of striped lions, a substance that lasts for ever. And inside they are all lined with ermine and sable, these two being the finest and most costly furs in existence. For a robe of sable, large enough to line a mantle, is worth two thousand bazants of gold, or one thousand at least, and this kind of skin is called by the Tartars the king of furs. The beast itself is about the size of a marten. These two furs of which I speak are applied and inlaid so exquisitely that it is really something worth seeing. All the tent ropes are of silk, and in short I may say that those tents, to wit the two audience halls and the sleeping chamber, are so costly that it is not every king could pay for them. Round about these tents are others, also fine ones and beautifully pitched, in which are the emperor's ladies and the ladies of the other princes and officers. And then there are the tents for the hawks and their keepers, so that altogether the number of tents there on the plain is something wonderful. To see the many people that are thronging to and fro on every side and every day there, you would take the camp for a good big city, for you must reckon the leeches and the astrologers and the falconers and all the other attendants on so great a company, and add that everybody there has his whole family with him, for such is their custom. The Lord remains encamped there until the spring, and all that time he does nothing but go hawking round about among the cane brakes along the lakes and rivers that abound in that region, and across fine plains on which are plenty of cranes and swans, and all sorts of other fowl. The other gentry of the camp also are never done with hunting and hawking, and every day they bring home great store of venison and feathered game of all sorts. Indeed, without having witnessed it, you would never believe what quantities of game are taken and what marvellous sport and diversion they all have whilst they are encamped there. There is another thing I should mention, to wit that for twenty days' journey round the spot nobody is allowed, be he who he may, to keep hawks or hounds, though anywhere else whosoever list may keep them. And furthermore, throughout all the Emperor's territories, nobody, however audacious, dares to hunt any of these four animals, to wit, hare, stag, buck, and roe, from the month of March to the month of October. Anybody who should do so would rue it bitterly. But those people are so obedient to their lord's command that even if a man were to find one of those animals asleep by the roadside, he would not touch it for the world. And thus the game multiplies at such a rate that the whole country swarms with it, and the emperor gets as much as he could desire. Beyond the term I have mentioned, however, to wit that from March to October, everybody may take these animals as he list. 
after the emperor has tarried in that place enjoying his sport as i have related from march to the middle of may he moves with all his people and returns straight to his capital city of cambaluc which is also the capital of cathay as you have been told but all the while continuing to take his diversion in hunting and hawking as he goes along chapter twenty one rehearsal of the way the year of the great khan is distributed on arriving at his capital of cambaluc he stays in his palace there three days and no more during which time he has great court entertainments and rejoicings and makes merry with his wives he then quits his palace at cambaluc and proceeds to that city which he has built as i told you before and which is called chandu where he has that grand park and palace of cain and where he keeps his girl falcons in mew there he spends the summer to escape the heat for the situation is a very cool one after stopping there from the beginning of may to the twenty eighth of august he takes his departure that is the time when they sprinkle the white mare's milk as i told you and returns to his capital cambaluc there he stops as i have told you also the month of september to keep his birthday feast and also throughout october november december january and february in which last month he keeps the grand feast of the new year which they call the white feast as you have heard already with all particulars he then sets out on his march towards the ocean sea hunting and hawking and continues out from the beginning of march to the middle of may and then comes back for three days only to the capital during which he makes merry with his wives and holds a great court and grand entertainments in truth this is something astonishing the magnificence displayed by the emperor in those three days and then he starts off again as you know thus his whole year is distributed in the following manner six months at his chief palace in the royal city of cambaluc to wit september october november december january february then on the great hunting expedition towards the sea march april may then back to his palace cambaluc for three days then off to the city of shandu which he has built and where the cane palace is where he stays june july august then back again to his capital city of cambaluc so thus the whole year is spent six months at the capital three months in hunting and three months at the cane palace to avoid the heat and in this way he passes his time with the greatest enjoyment not to mention occasional journeys in this or that direction at his own pleasure chapter twenty two concerning the city of cambaluc and its great traffic and population you must know that the city of cambaluc hath such a multitude of houses and such a vast population inside the walls and outside that it seems quite past all possibility there is a suburb outside each of the gates which are twelve in number and these suburbs are so great that they contain more people than the city itself for the suburb of one gate spreads in width till it meets the suburb of the next whilst they extend in length some three or four miles in those suburbs lodge the foreign merchants and travellers of whom there are always great numbers who have come to bring presents to the emperor or to sell articles at court or because the city affords so good a mart to attract traders there are in each of the suburbs to a distance of a mile from the city numerous fine hostelries for the lodgment of merchants from different parts of the world and a special hostelry is assigned to each description of people as if we should say there is one for the lombards another for the germans and a third for the frenchmen and thus there are as many good houses outside of the city as inside without counting those that belong to the great lords and barons which are very numerous you must know that it is forbidden to bury any dead body inside the city if the body be that of an idolater it is carried out beyond the city and suburbs to a remote place assigned to the purpose to be burned and if it be of one belonging to a religion the custom of which is to bury such as the christian the saracen or what not it is also carried out beyond the suburbs to a distant place assigned for the purpose and thus the city is preserved in a better and more healthy state moreover no public woman resides inside the city but all such abide outside in the suburbs and it is wonderful what a vast number of these there are for the foreigners it is a certain fact that there are more than twenty thousand of them living by prostitution 
and that so many can live in this way will show you how vast is the population. Guards patrol the city every night in parties of thirty or forty, looking out for any persons who may be abroad at unseasonable hours, that is, after the great bell hath stricken thrice. If they find any such person, he is immediately taken to prison, and examined next morning by the proper officers. If these find him guilty of any misdemeanour, they order him a proportionate beating with a stick. Under this punishment people sometimes die, but they adopt it in order to skew bloodshed, for their buxies say that it is an evil thing to shed man's blood. To this city also are brought articles of greater cost and rarity, and in greater abundance of all kinds than to any other city in the world. For people of every description and from every region bring things, including all the costly wares of India, as well as the fine and precious goods of Cathay itself with its provinces, some for the sovereign, some for the court, some for the city which is so great, some for the crowds of barons and knights, some for the great hosts of the emperor which are quartered round about, and thus between court and city the quantity brought in is endless. As a sample, I tell you, no day in the year passes that there do not enter the city one thousand cartloads of silk alone, from which are made quantities of cloth of silk and gold and of other goods. And this is not to be wondered at, for in all the countries round about there is no flax, so that everything has to be made of silk. It is true, indeed, that in some parts of the country there is cotton and hemp, but not sufficient for their wants. This, however, is not of much consequence because silk is so abundant and cheap, and is a more valuable substance than either flax or cotton. Round about this great city of Kambaluk there are some two hundred other cities at various distances, from which traders come to sell their goods and buy others for their lords, and all find means to make their sales and purchases, so that the traffic of the city is passing great. End of section 38《Of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian. Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule. Book Second, Part 1, Chapter 23, Concerning the Oppressions of Akmath the Bailo, and the Plot that was formed against him. You will hear further on how that there are twelve persons appointed who have authority to dispose of lands, offices, and everything else at their discretion. Now one of these was a certain Saracen named Akmath, a shrewd and able man who had more power and influence with the Grand Khan than any of the others, and the Khan held him in such regard that he could do what he pleased. The fact was, as came out after his death, that Akmath had so wrought upon the Khan with his sorcery that the latter had the greatest faith and reliance on everything he said, and in this way did everything that Akmath wished him to do. This person disposed of all governments and offices, and passed sentence on all malefactors. And whenever he desired to have any one whom he hated put to death, whether with justice or without it, he would go to the Emperor and say, such an one deserves death, for he hath done this or that against your imperial dignity. Then the Lord would say, Do as you think right, and so he would have the man forthwith executed. Thus when people saw how unbounded were his powers, and how unbounded the reliance placed by the emperor on everything that he said, they did not venture to oppose him in anything. No one was so high in rank or power as to be free from the dread of him, if any one was accused by him to the emperor of a capital offence, and desired to defend himself, he was unable to bring proofs in his own exculpation, for no one would stand by him, and no one dared to oppose Akmath. 
and thus the latter caused many to perish unjustly moreover there was no beautiful woman whom he might desire but he got hold of her and if she were unmarried forcing her to be his wife if otherwise compelling her to consent to his desires whenever he knew of any one who had a pretty daughter certain ruffians of his would go to the father and say what say you here is this pretty daughter of yours give her in marriage to the bylo akmath for they called him the bylo or as we should say the vice-regent and we will arrange for his giving you such a government or such an office for three years and so the man would surrender his daughter and akmath would go to the emperor and say such a government is vacant or will be vacant on such a day so and so is a proper man for the post and the emperor would reply do as you think best and the father of the girl was immediately appointed to the government thus either through the ambition of the parents or through fear of the minister all the beautiful women were at his beck either as wives or mistresses also he had some five-and-twenty sons who held offices of importance and some of these under the protection of their father's name committed scandals like his own and many other abominable iniquities this akmath also had amassed great treasure for everybody who wanted office sent him a heavy bribe in such authority did this man continue for two and twenty years at last the people of the country to wit the Cathayans, utterly wearied with the endless outrages and abominable iniquities which he perpetrated against them whether as regarded their wives or their own persons conspired to slay him and revolt against the government amongst the rest there was a certain Cathayan named chenchu a commander of a thousand whose mother daughter and wife had all been dishonored by akmath now this man full of bitter resentment entered into parley regarding the destruction of the minister with another Cathayan, whose name was vanchu who was a commander of ten thousand they came to the conclusion that the time to do the business would be during the great khan's absence from kambaluk for after stopping there three months he used to go to chandu and stop there three months and at the same time his son chinkin used to go away to his usual haunts and this akmath remained in charge of the city sending to obtain the khan's orders from chandu when any emergency arose so vanchu and chenchu having come to this conclusion proceeded to communicate it to the chief people among the Cathayans, and then by common consent sent word to their friends in many other cities that they had determined on such a day at the signal given by a beacon to massacre all the men with beards and that the other cities should stand ready to do the like on seeing the signal fires the reason why they spoke of massacring the bearded men was that the Cathayans naturally have no beard whilst beards are worn by the tartars saracens and christians and you should know that all the Cathayans detested the grand khan's rule because he set over them governors who were tartars or still more frequently saracens and these they could not endure for they were treated by them just like slaves you see the great khan had not succeeded to the dominion of cathay by hereditary right but held it by conquest and thus having no confidence in the natives he put all authority into the hands of tartars saracens or christians who were attached to his household and devoted to his service and were foreigners in cathay wherefore on the day appointed the aforesaid vanchu and chenchu having entered the palace at night vanchu sat down and caused a number of lights to be kindled before him and then sent a messenger to akmath the bailo who lived in the old city as if to summon him to the presence of chinkin the great khan's son who it was pretended had arrived unexpectedly when akmath heard this he was much surprised but made haste to go for he feared the prince greatly when he arrived at the gate he met a tartar called kogatai who was captain of the twelve thousand that formed the standing garrison of the city and the latter asked him whither he was bound so late to chinkin who has just arrived quoth kogatai how can that be how could he come so privily that i know naught of it 
so he followed the minister with a certain number of his soldiers now the notion of the Cathayans was that if they could make an end of Achmath, they would have naught else to be afraid of so as soon as Achmath got inside the palace and saw all that illumination he bowed down before vanchu supposing him to be chinkin and chenchu who was standing ready with a sword straightway cut his head off as soon as cogatai who had halted at the entrance beheld this he shouted treason and instantly discharged an arrow at vanchu and shot him dead as he sat at the same time he called his people to seize chenchu and sent a proclamation through the city that any one found in the streets would be instantly put to death the cathayans saw that the tartars had discovered the plot and that they had no longer any leader since vanchu was killed and chenchu was taken so they kept still in their houses and were unable to pass the signal for the rising of the other cities as had been settled Cogatai immediately dispatched messengers to the great Khan giving an orderly report of the whole affair and the Khan sent back orders for him to make a careful investigation and to punish the guilty as their misdeeds deserved in the morning Cogatai examined all the Cathayans and put to death a number whom he found to be ringleaders in the plot the same thing was done in the other cities when it was found that the plot extended to them also after the great Khan had returned to Kambaluk, he was very anxious to discover what had led to this affair, and he then learned all about the endless iniquities of that accursed Achmath and his sons. It was proved that he and seven of his sons, for they were not all bad, had forced no end of women to be their wives, besides those whom they had ravished. The great Khan then ordered all the treasure that Achmath had accumulated in the old city, to be transferred to his own treasury in the new city and it was found to be of enormous amount he also ordered the body of Achmath to be dug up and cast into the streets for the dogs to tear and commanded those of his sons that had followed the father's evil example to be flayed alive these circumstances called the khan's attention to the accursed doctrines of the sect of the saracens which excuse every crime yea even murder itself when committed on such as are not of their religion and Seeing that this doctrine had led the accursed Achmath and his sons to act as they did without any sense of guilt The Khan was led to entertain the greatest disgust and abomination for it So he summoned the Saracens and prohibited their doing many things which their religion enjoined thus he ordered them to regulate their marriages by the Tartar law and prohibited their cutting the throats of animals killed for food ordering them to rip the stomach in the tartar way now when all this happened messer marco was upon the spot chapter twenty four how the great khan causeth the bark of trees made into something like paper to pass for money over all his country now that i have told you in detail of the splendor of this city of the emperors I shall proceed to tell you of the mint which he hath in the same city in the which he hath his money coined and struck as I shall relate to you and in doing so I shall make manifest to you how it is that the great Lord may well be able to accomplish even much more than I have told you or am going to tell you in this book for tell it how I might you never would be satisfied that I was keeping within truth and reason the Emperor's mint then is in this same city of Cambaluc, and the way it is wrought is such that you might say he hath the secret of alchemy in perfection, and you would be right, for he makes his money after this fashion. He makes them take of the bark of a certain tree, in fact of the mulberry tree, the leaves of which are the food of the silkworms, these trees being so numerous that whole districts are full of them. What they take is a certain fine white bast or skin which lies between the wood of the tree and the thick outer bark and This they make into something resembling sheets of paper, but black When these sheets have been prepared they are cut up into pieces of different sizes The smallest of these sizes is worth a half tornasol the next a little larger one tornasol one a little larger still is worth half a silver groat in venice another a whole groat others yet two groats 
five groats and ten groats there is also a kind worth one bezant of gold and others of three bezants and so up to ten all these pieces of paper are issued with as much solemnity and authority as if they were of pure gold or silver and on every piece a variety of officials whose duty it is have to write their names and to put their seals and when all is prepared duly the chief officer deputed by the khan smears the seal entrusted to him with vermilion and impresses it on the paper so that the form of the seal remains printed upon it in red the money is then authentic anyone forging it will be punished with death and the khan causes every year to be made such a vast quantity of this money which costs him nothing that it must equal in amount all the treasure in the world with these pieces of paper made as i have described he causes all payments on his own account to be made and he makes them to pass current universally over all his kingdoms and provinces and territories and whithersoever his power and sovereignty extends and nobody however important he may think himself dares to refuse them on pain of death and indeed everybody takes them readily for wheresoever a person may go throughout the great khan's dominions he shall find these pieces of paper current and shall be made to transact all sales and purchases of goods by means of them just as well as if they were coins of pure gold and all the while they are so light that ten bezants worth does not weigh one golden bezant furthermore all merchants arriving from india or other countries and bringing with them gold or silver or gems and pearls are prohibited from selling to any one but the emperor he has twelve experts chosen for this business men of shrewdness and experience in such affairs these appraise the articles and the emperor then pays a liberal price for them in those pieces of paper the merchants accept his price readily for in the first place they would not get so good an one from anybody else and second they are paid without any delay and with this paper money they can buy what they like anywhere over the empire whilst it is also vastly lighter to carry about on their journeys and it is a truth that the merchants will several times in a year bring wares to the amount of four hundred thousand bezants and the grand sire pays for all in that paper so he buys such a quantity of those precious things every year that his treasure is endless whilst all the time the money he pays away costs him nothing at all moreover several times in the year proclamation is made through the city that any one who may have gold or silver or gems or pearls by taking them to the mint shall get a handsome price for them and the owners are glad to do this because they would find no other purchaser give so large a price thus the quantity they bring in is marvellous though these who do not choose to do so may let it alone still in this way nearly all the valuables in the country come into the khan's possession when any of those pieces of paper are spoilt not that they are so very flimsy neither the owner carries them to the mint and by paying three per cent on the value he gets new pieces in exchange and if any baron or any one else soever hath need of gold or silver or gems or pearls in order to make plate or girdles or the like he goes to the mint and buys as much as he list paying in this paper money now you have heard the ways and means whereby the great khan may have and in fact has more treasure than all the kings in the world and you would know all about it and the reason why and now i will tell you of the great dignitaries which act in this city on behalf of the emperor end of section 39《of the Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Roberts. — The Book of Sir Marco Polo, the Venetian, Concerning the Kingdoms and Marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rusticello da Pisa. Translated by Henry Yule. Book 2nd, Part 1. Chapter 25 concerning the twelve barons who are set over all the affairs of the great khan 
you must know that the great khan hath chosen twelve great barons to whom he hath committed all the necessary affairs of thirty-four great provinces and now i will tell you particulars about them and their establishments you must know that these twelve barons reside all together in a very rich and handsome palace which is inside the city of Cambaluc, and consists of a variety of edifices with many suites of apartments to every province is assigned a judge and several clerks and all reside in this palace where each has his separate quarters these judges and clerks administer all the affairs of the provinces to which they are attached under the direction of the twelve barons howbeit when an affair is of very great importance the twelve barons lay in before the emperor and he decides as he thinks best but the power of those twelve barons is so great that they choose the governors for all those thirty-four great provinces that i have mentioned and only after they have chosen do they inform the emperor of their choice this he confirms and grants to the person nominated a tablet of gold such as is appropriate to the rank of his government those twelve barons also have such authority that they can dispose of the movements of the forces and send them whither and in such strength as they please this is done indeed with the emperor's cognizance but still the orders are issued on their authority they are styled xieng which is as much as to say the supreme court and the palace where they abide is also called xieng this body forms the highest authority at the court of the great khan and indeed they can favor and advance whom they will i will not now name the thirty-four provinces to you because they will be spoken of in detail in the course of this book chapter twenty six how the khan's posts and runners are sped through many lands and provinces now you must know that from this city of Cambaluc proceed many roads and highways leading to a variety of provinces one to one province another to another and each road receives the name of the province to which it leads and it is a very sensible plan and the messengers of the emperor in traveling from Cambaluc, be the road whichsoever they will find at every twenty-five miles of the journey a station which they call yam or as we would say the horse post house and at each of these stations used by the messengers there is a large and handsome building for them to put up at in which they find all the rooms furnished with fine beds and all other necessary articles in rich silk and where they are provided with everything they can want if even a king were to arrive at one of these he would find himself well lodged at some of these stations moreover there shall be posted some four hundred horses standing ready for the use of the messengers at others there shall be two hundred according to the requirements and to what the emperor has established in each case at every twenty-five miles as i said or anyhow at every thirty miles you find one of these stations on all the principal highways leading to the different provincial governments and the same is the case throughout all the chief provinces subject to the great khan even when the messengers have to pass through a roadless tract where neither house nor hostel exists still there the station houses have been established just the same excepting that the intervals are somewhat greater and the day's journey is fixed at thirty-five to forty-five miles instead of twenty-five to thirty but they are provided with horses and all the other necessaries just like those we have described so that the emperor's messengers come they from what region they may find everything ready for them and in sooth this is a thing done on the greatest scale of magnificence that ever was seen never had emperor king or lord such wealth as this manifests for it is a fact that on all these posts taken together there are more than three hundred thousand horses kept up specially for the use of the messengers and the great buildings that i have mentioned are more than ten thousand in number all richly furnished as i told you the thing is on a scale so wonderful and costly that it is hard to bring oneself to describe it but now i will tell you another thing that i had forgotten but which ought to be told whilst i am on this subject you must know that by the great khan's orders there has been established between these post houses at every interval of three miles a little fort with some forty houses round about it in which dwell the people who act as the emperor's foot runners every one of those runners wears a great wide belt set all over with bells so that as they run the three miles from post to post their bells are heard jingling a long way off and thus on reaching the post the runner finds another man similarly equipped and all ready to take his place who instantly takes over whatsoever he has in charge and with it receives a slip of paper from the clerk who is always at hand for the purpose and so the new man sets off and runs his three miles at the next station he finds his relief ready in like manner 
and so the post proceeds, with a change at every three miles. And in this way the emperor, who has an immense number of these runners, receives dispatches with news from places ten days' journey off in one day and night, or, if need be, news from a hundred days off in ten days and nights, and that is no small matter. In fact, in the fruit season, many a time fruit shall be gathered one morning in Cambaluc, and the evening of the next day it shall reach the great Khan at Chandu, a distance of ten days' journey. The clerk at each of the posts notes the time of each courier's arrival and departure, and there are often other officers whose business it is to make monthly visitations of all the posts and to punish those runners who have been slack in their work. The emperor exempts these men from all tribute and pays them besides. Moreover, there are also at those stations other men equipped similarly with girdles hung with bells, who are employed for expresses when there is a call for great haste in sending dispatches to any governor of a province, or to give news when any baron has revolted, or in other such emergencies, and these men travel a good two hundred or two hundred and fifty miles in the day, and as much in the night. I'll tell you how it stands. They take a horse from those at the station which are standing ready saddled, all fresh and in wind, and mount and go at full speed, as hard as they can ride, in fact. And when those at the next post hear the bells, they get ready another horse and a man equipped in the same way, and he takes over the letter, or whatever it be, and is off full speed to the third station, where again a fresh horse is found already, and so the dispatch speeds along from post to post, always at full gallop with regular change of horses. And the speed at which they go is marvelous. By night, however, they cannot go so fast as by day, because they have to be accompanied by footmen with torches who could not keep up with them at full speed. Those men are highly prized, and they could never do it did they not bind hard the stomach, chest, and head with strong bands. And each of them carries with him a gerfalcon tablet, in sign that he is bound on an urgent express, so that if, perchance, his horse break down, or he meet with other mishap, whomsoever he may fall in with on the road, he is empowered to make him dismount and give up his horse. Nobody dares refuse in such a case, so that the courier hath always a good fresh nag to carry him. Now all these numbers of post-horses cost the emperor nothing at all, and I will tell you the how and the why. Every city or village or hamlet that stands near one of those post-stations has a fixed demand made on it for as many horses as it can supply, and these it must furnish to the post. And in this way are provided all the posts of the cities, as well as the towns and villages round about them, only in uninhabited tracts the horses are furnished at the expense of the emperor himself. Nor do the cities maintain the full number, say, of four hundred horses, always at their station, but month by month two hundred shall be kept at the station, and the other two hundred at grass, coming in their turn to relieve the first two hundred. And if there chance to be some river or lake to be passed by the runners and horse posts, the neighboring cities are bound to keep three or four boats in constant readiness for the purpose. And now I will tell you of the great bounty exercised by the emperor towards his people twice a year. Chapter 27. How the emperor bestows help on his people when they are afflicted with death or moraine. Now you must know that the emperor sends his messengers over all his lands and kingdoms and provinces to ascertain from his officers if the people are afflicted by any dearth through unfavorable seasons or storms or locusts or other light calamity, and from those who have suffered in this way no taxes are exacted for that year, nay more he causes them to be supplied with corn of his own for food and seed. Now this is undoubtedly a great bounty on his part and when winter comes he causes inquiry to be made as to those who have lost their cattle, whether by moraine or other mishap, and such persons not only go scot-free, but get presents of cattle. And thus, as I tell you, the Lord every year helps and fosters the people subject to him. There is another trait of the great Khan I should tell you, and that is, that if a chance shot from his bow strike any herd or flock, whether belonging to one person or to many, and however big the flock may be, he takes no tithe thereof for three years. In like manner, if the arrow strike a boat full of goods, that boatload pays no duty, for it is thought unlucky that an arrow strike any one's property, and the great Khan says it would be an abomination before God, were such property, that has been struck by the divine wrath, to enter into his treasury. Chapter 28. How the great Khan causes trees to be planted by the highways. The emperor, moreover, hath taken order that all the highways travelled by his messengers, and the people, 
generally should be planted with rows of great trees a few paces apart, and thus these trees are visible a long way off, and no one can miss the way by day or night. Even the roads through uninhabited tracts are thus planted, and it is the greatest possible solace to travelers, and this is done on all the ways where it can be of service. The great Khan plants these trees all the more readily because his astrologers and diviners tell him that he who plants trees lives long. But where the ground is so sandy and desert that trees will not grow, he causes other landmarks, pillars, or stones to be set up to show the way. End of section 40one of the book of san marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by anna simon the book of san marco polo the venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the east volume one by rusticello da pisa translated by henry yule book second Part 1, Chapters 29 to 34. Chapter 29 Concerning the rice wine drunk by the people of Cathay. Most of the people of Cathay drink wine of the kind that I shall now describe. It is a liquor which they brew of rice with a quantity of excellent spice, in such fashion that it makes better drink than any other kind of wine. It is not only good, but clear and pleasing to the eye and being very hot stuff, it makes one drunk sooner than any other wine. Chapter 30 Concerning the black stones that are dug in Katai and are burned for fuel. It is a fact that all over the country of Katai there is a kind of black stones existing in beds in the mountains, which they dig out and burn like firewood. If you supply the fire with them at night, and see that they are well kindled, you will find them still alight in the morning, and they make such capital fuel that no other is used throughout the country. It is true that they have plenty of wood also, but they do not burn it, because those stones burn better and cost less. Moreover, with that vast number of people and the number of hot baths that they maintain, for everyone has such a bath at least three times a week, and in winter if possible every day, whilst every nobleman and man of wealth has a private bath for his own use. The wood would not suffice for the purpose. Chapter 31 How the Great Khan causes stores of corn to be made, to help his people withal in time of dearth. You must know that when the emperor sees that corn is cheap and abundant, he buys up large quantities, and has it stored in all his provinces in great granaries, where it is so well looked after that it will keep for three or four years. And this applies, let me tell you, to all kinds of corn, whether wheat, barley, millet, rice, panic, or what not, and when there is any scarcity of a particular kind of corn, he causes that to be issued. And if the price of corn is at one bazant the measure, he lets them have it at a bazant for four measures, or at whatever price will produce general cheapness, and everyone can have food in this way and by this providence of the emperors, his people can never suffer from dearth. He does the same over his whole empire, causing these supplies to be stored everywhere, according to calculation of the wants and necessities of the people. Chapter 32 Of the Charity of the Emperor to the Poor I have told you how the great Khan provides for the distribution of necessaries to his people in time of dearth by making store in time of cheapness. Now I will tell you of his alms and great charity to the poor of his city of Kambaluk. You see, he causes a selection to be made of a number of families in the city, which are in a state of indigence, and of such families some may consist of six in the house, some of eight, some of ten, more or fewer in each as it may hap, but the whole number being very great. And each family he causes annually to be supplied with wheat and other corn sufficient for the whole year and this he never fails to do every year. Moreover, all those who choose to go to the daily dole at the court receive a great loaf apiece, hot from the baking, and nobody is denied. For so the Lord hath ordered. And so some thirty thousand people go for it every day from year's end to year's end. 
Now, this is a great goodness in the emperor to take pity of his poor people thus, and they benefit so much by it that they worship him as he were God. He also provides the poor with clothes, for he lays a tithe upon all wool, silk, hemp, and the like from which clothing can be made, and he has these woven and laid up in a building set apart for the purpose, and as all artisans are bound to give a day's labour weekly, in this way the Khan has these stuffs made into clothing for those poor families, suitable for summer or winter, according to the time of year. He also provides the clothing for his troops, and has woollens woven for them in every city, the material for which is furnished by the tithe aforesaid. You should know that the Tartars, before they were converted to the religion of the idolaters, never practised almsgiving. Indeed, when any poor man begged of them, they would tell him, Go with God's curse, for if he loved you as he loves me, he would have provided for you. But the sages of the idolaters, and especially the Baxis, mentioned before, told the great Khan that it was a good work to provide for the poor, and that his idols would be greatly pleased if he did so. And since then he has taken to do for the poor so much as you have heard. Chapter 33 Concerning the Astrologers in the City of Kambaluk there are in the city of Kambaluk, what with Christians, Saracens, and Cathayans, some five thousand astrologers and soothsayers, whom the great Khan provides with annual maintenance and clothing, just as he provides the poor of whom we have spoken, and they are in the constant exercise of their art in this city. They have a kind of astrolabe on which are inscribed the planetary signs, the hours, and critical points of the whole year. And every year these Christian, Saracen, and Cathayan astrologers, each sect apart, investigate by means of this astrolabe the cause and character of the whole year, according to the indications of each of its moons, in order to discover, by the natural cause and disposition of the planets, and the other circumstances of the heavens, what shall be the nature of the weather, and what peculiarities shall be produced by each moon of the year. As, for example, under which moon there shall be thunderstorms and tempests, under which there shall be disease, moraine, wars, disorders, and treasons, and so on, according to the indications of each, but always adding that it lies with God to do less or more according to his pleasure. And they write down the results of their examination in certain little pamphlets for the year, which are called taquin, and these are sold for growth to all who desire to know what is coming. Those of the astrologers, of course, whose predictions are found to be most exact, are held to be the greatest adepts in their art, and get the greater fame. And if any one having some great matter in hand, or proposing to make a long journey for traffic or other business, desires to know what will be the upshot, he goes to one of these astrologers and says, Turn up your books and see what is the present aspect of the heavens, for I am going away on such and such a business. Then the astrologer will reply that the applicant must also tell the year, month, and hour of his birth, and when he has got that information he will see how the horoscope of his nativity combines with the indications of the time when the question is put, and then he predicts the result, good or bad, according to the aspect of the heavens. You must know, too, that the Tartars reckon their years by twelves, the sign of the first year being the lion, of the second the ox, of the third the dragon, of the fourth the dog, and so forth up to the twelfth, so that when one is asked the year of his birth, he answers that it was in the year of the lion, let us say, on such a day or night, at such an hour, and such a moment. And the father of a child always takes care to write these particulars down in a book. When the twelve yearly symbols have been gone through, then they come back to the first, and go through with them again in the same succession. Chapter 34. Concerning the religion of the Cathayans, their views as to the soul, and their customs. As we have said before, these people are idolaters, and as regards their gods, each has a tablet fixed high up on the wall of his chamber, on which is inscribed a name which represents the most high and heavenly god, and before this they pay daily worship, offering incense from a thurible, raising their hands aloft, and gnashing their teeth three times praying him to grant them health of mind and body. But of him they ask naught else. And below on the ground there is a figure which they call Natigai, which is the god of things terrestrial. To him they give a wife and children, and they worship him in the same manner, 
with incense and gnashing of teeth and lifting up of hands, and of him they ask seasonable weather and the fruits of the earth, children and so forth. Their view of the immortality of the soul is after this fashion. They believe that as soon as a man dies, his soul enters into another body, going from a good to a better, or from a bad to a worse, according as he hath conducted himself well or ill. That is to say, a poor man, if he pass through life good and sober, shall be born again of a gentlewoman, and shall be a gentleman, and on a second occasion shall be born of a princess, and shall be a prince, and so on, always rising, till he be absorbed into the deity. But if he have borne himself ill, he who was the son of a gentleman shall be reborn as the son of a boor, and from a boor shall become a dog, always going down lower and lower. The people have an ornate style of speech. They salute each other with a cheerful countenance, and with great politeness. They behave like gentlemen, and eat with great propriety. They show great respect to their parents, and should there be any son who offends his parents, or fails to minister to their necessities, there is a public office which has no other charge but that of punishing unnatural children, who are proved to have acted with ingratitude towards their parents. Criminals of sundry kinds who have been imprisoned are released at a time fixed by the Great Khan, which occurs every three years, but on leaving prison they are branded on one cheek that they may be recognized. The Great Khan hath prohibited all gambling and sharping, things more prevalent there than in any other part of the world. In doing this, he said, I have conquered you by force of arms, and all that you have is mine. If, therefore, you gamble away your property, it is in fact my property that you are gambling away. Not that he took anything from them, however. I must not omit to tell you of the orderly way in which the Khan's barons and others conduct themselves in coming to his presence. In the first place, within a half mile of the place where he is, out of reference for his exalted majesty, everybody preserves a mien of the greatest meekness and quiet, so that no noise of shrill voices or loud talk shall be heard. And every one of the chiefs and nobles carries always with him a handsome little vessel to spit in whilst he remain in the hall of audience, for no one dares spit on the floor of the hall. And when he has spitten, he covers it up and puts it aside. So also they all have certain handsome buskins of white leather, which they carry with them, and, when summoned by the sovereign, on arriving at the entrance to the hall, they put on these white buskins, and give their others in charge to the servants, in order that they may not foul the fine carpets of silk and gold and diverse colours. End of section 41 End of the book of Sir Marco Polo the Venetian concerning the kingdoms and marvels of the East, Volume 1, by Rosicello da Pisa, translated by Henry Yule.